Fuck off, Keith Dilbert, you old so-and-so. You can ask him. You can ask him, but I'll ask him. Fuck it, I don't care. Hello, JoJo Deacons. Ah, oh, you got the blue badge. You got the blue badge. Nice. I'm changing all the badges this weekend if I can, though. Uncle Fuzznuts, you can talk to John. You know what? We're not even doing the interview yet, but that's how much I don't stick to the script. John is here. I think John can hear us. If he wants to jump in before we actually start, he he wants to know how can he have a question for John. John, can you I hear just, it? Yeah, you know how he has a question for me is by just Ask asking it. it. All right, go ahead, Fuzznuts. You've got John total full attention because we're not starting for like three minutes. What would you like to ask John? You get the first question of the day. I can't hear him. He, oh, he's not on. He's on text. Okay. Yeah. Somebody says, ask him about his rooftop. Recently, a tree broke your window. Oh, dude. That's a good story. What happened? Um, so, dude, we had this... Because, you know, well, global warming isn't a thing, but... Right, sure. Windstorms in Bend have just been going crazy. And this year, I have uh, these really, really old trees on my property, including like a 2,000-year-old juniper tree that's not very oh. big so i never worried about it right because right. it's not as high i've got a two-story a-frame house and the tree is like uh even with the roof so i was like okay i'm not worried about it it's an old tree but i'm not worried about it dude one day like in the middle of the afternoon i've got these, these huge skylights in my media room so i'm never in there during the day i only i'm in there watching movies on the big screen at night right i heard the whole house shook and i heard this thunder and what happened was the branch literally because the wind snapped it it flipped around like a catapult oh, with the force fuck. of like 15 times if it had just fallen right and smashed my my one of my and these are huge skylights they're like you know four feet by eight feet are you and in your was, media room watching a movie and this no, thing happens we would have i would have i i'll show you some pictures later if you didn't see the video uh there was literally 20 pounds of glass where me and my son would have been sitting and oh, it's like a, and it's shards. It's not like a tempered glass. Like if you smash a windshield, these are really super tiny shards of glass. It would have just eviscerated us had we been sitting there. So it's fucking oh freaky. Oh my what God. It was. Okay. Listen, but real quick. So if you're watching the stream, we have not actually started yet. So if you're like, what the fuck is this? This is usually where we <laughs> load people in, but I get the sense John is cut from at least a little bit of the same cloth. So we're just talking for a minute. We're going to start officially in a second. Um, sure. Uh, I, listen to me. Have you ever heard of uh, quantum immortality? Yes. That's that's what happened. I was driving in the car. I'm serious, I was driving in the car with my son about a year ago, and his back window, I'm driving down the freeway, just shatters. And what? it just blew up. And he was fine. It was safety glass, but we were dead. We had, there have been like three parts in my life. One was at E3 when a car almost hit me and my driver coming to the Col Coliseum for a press event. And I'm like, there's no way we escaped that. We had to have died. But suddenly it's almost like we jumped the narrative track and now we're okay. The fact yeah. that you weren't there, that I'm telling you, I very much believe in quantum immortality. I really do. Yeah. I think that's a real fucking thing. Um, well, had it been night, we would have been there. That's the thing. Right. I mean, that's But insane. it was in the middle of the day, so no, nope, we were good. Insane. Insane. Yeah. All right. So we're about to get started. Let me um, let me give you a little heads up. So 
John, just so you don't think I'm rude, I have three screens going. I've got the chat over here. I've got uh, OBS over here. I've got Discord over here. And then you're right here. Uh, you're all good, dude. I just, I'm going to be looking around. I'm not not paying attention. I've been in interviews where I'm like, what the fuck, dude? I'm talking to you. And you're like, what? You know, it's just because I'm trying to track everything. I don't have a producer. So, But you're, you're my full focus. Uh, I just want to let you know that. The super chats that have come in so far... I will get to them right now, and then I'm obviously going to store these up. If you want to talk to John live, he is going to be taking calls. Uh, I'll, I'll bring those in as we go. We might have some screeners, so if you're like, who the fuck is this? It might be Bukaki, It might be Rob. That's what's going on. But Wrath the Emperor and Brap, thank you guys very, very much for kicking us off with some very, very generous super chats. I'm about to bring on the man, the myth, the legend. Um, he of the Connecticut Garvins. I think that is uh, where you actually, you guys are originally... I think from uh, the Holy Land, but you moved to Connecticut and then found yourself in Bend, Oregon. I just made all of that up. That is how creative I am. What the fuck was Sony thinking not to greenlight my next game? This, fellas, is uh, good, sir. Boom, Johnny Garvin. All right, can you guys see John? Is everybody ready to go? Okay, can I turn off the notifications of the donations? There's no sound, so you shouldn't hear it. Um, all right. I would love a go. Okay. I'll get, I'll get to the chat in a minute. John. Hello. How are you, sir? Doing good, Dave. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. We've met once you said at dice. Is that right? Yes. Do you really want me to tell this story? Yeah, because I, it's a great David Jaffe oh, story. Then please. Cause I don't remember it, which is probably <laughs> a problem for me, but go ahead. I'd love to hear no, it. It was the, uh, it, it was at dice. It was at the year that you won big for God of War. Okay. And, uh, and we had never met, but, you know, we were there. I can't, God, how long ago was that? That's a long oh, time. 15, 14 years ago, something like that. We were still working on Siphon at the time. I yeah, yeah. So Dark Mirror or something for yeah. PSP probably. That's right. I don't yeah. remember. But anyway, I came up and uh, shoved my hand into yours and said, hey, I'm John Garvin. And you gave me this look like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> so I said, oh, no, I did Siphon Filter. And he's, oh, I love that game. Yeah, I uh, do. I didn't I, but I didn't play any of the rest of them. <laughs> I played, I did, I played one and two and I played, uh, dark mirror is what I played, but there was like four of them. There was Omega well, strain the time and you had maybe, maybe oh, you felt guilty for saying that to my face. Never, at the time. never. I would but never, dude, it was just so matter of fact, I was like, okay, I've heard about Dave Jaffe. That's, that's who that Dave, Jaffe, I was Jaffe, all, I, I was also incredibly <laughs> drunk that night. I had never drank so much in my life to the point that <laughs> me and the, the, the God award team got in a, a big stretch limo with Phil Harrison, who was running nice. Sony at the time. And, you know, we were all drinking like crazy and I was 20 sheets to the wind and I start making fun of, you know, every, Phil's with us. Phil's one of the boys. And then I turn to Phil and I'm like, hello, Phil Harrison. How's your big <laughs> bull's head? You know, and he and he says to me, he, it, it, it's just he cut through all the drunkenness. He's like, watch it, mate. And I was like, oh, shit, he's not as drunk as he's playing. I'm really drunk, you know. Yeah. So, okay. Well, dude, I've ha I ha I've done that with Phil before as well. So, because Phil is not a big drinker, if you notice, he, I, he I, will sip his white wine and his spritzer, he's, and, that, he's, and that's it. He's, he's not a drunk. <laughs> he's working. He's on the clock. He's like, I'm, yeah, I'm he's, being, a, I'm being one of the boys, but he's super professional. I'm always way. fucking Phil. There used to be this thing at Sony, at least in on on uh, uh, California, and I don't know if this happened with you guys, where every time there was an E3 something would happen and someone would get fired. It was like, who's going to get fired at E3 this year? It was like <laughs> a lawyer would get shit faced. And then they're like, you did this terror. You pulled your pants down in the middle of a meeting, whatever. So, uh, but no, Phil, Phil was never in any danger uh, of that. At no. All. Uh -uh. <laughs> what did you, okay. So you were there, you started at Sony in 96 and we're going to get, if you're watching, obviously we're going to get to everything where of course we're going to get to Schreier's article. Hello. I'd say hello to Jason Schreier, but you know, I know he's not watching. He'll comment. Oh, he's watching. He's no, no, watching and no, taking notes. No, he's not watching because he didn't watch the other one, but he still oh. had an opinion about it. So go ahead, Jay, you know, but anybody let Jason know, just, you know, make some shit up because God knows he's not going to fact check it. Okay. So not to say he's not a good journalist because he is, but I'm talking specifically about the, the interview. It doesn't matter. So we're going to get to that. We're going to talk Sony. We're going to talk Days Gone. We're going to talk Siphon Filter. But you were, and we're not going to get into the, I'm not an interviewer. I'm not a journalist. So I'm not going to be like, oh, let's start with your career. But I don't give a fuck. I want to talk about what's fun and interesting. <laughs> but that said, though, you were at Sony from 96 until uh, 2019. Yeah. Okay. Long time. That's right. right. That's right. And, and I mean, I, I was there, um, I was there not as long, but almost as long. And I had a working relationship, them for, working relationship with them for as long. 
those guys, I loved working with them for a long time. And I, and I, there was never a time when I left even that I didn't, I mean, Scott Rohde was the guy who killed my project, but I was, yeah. it was like not, you know, I mean, I was like, Oh, that sucks. You killed our project, but it's still Scott Rohde. He's just such a good dude. Um, that I was just like, yeah, okay. It's business. I understand, but I still <clears throat> really value the guy, you know? Um, but you were there with like, what, who well, let me, dude. Let me tell you my Scott Rohde story before. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Won. If you don't know who Scott Rohde is, Scott Rohde runs PlayStation. Yeah, America. he's like the. Uh, I I believe he's the vice president. Maybe he's president. I, I don't remember to be honest. But he's if, if, but he's if, yeah. he's hot. He's he, it goes Shuhei and Scott and Connie and and then on down the line. Right, so right. He's he's he's, he's, up he's really high up there. Yeah, super good dude. So you know he was the producer who did Pain, way back in the day, he and that's how he got the game. Yeah, I believe he did. Yeah, I, I know think he, he was used to design, Diego, but that. I didn't know he was a producer. Okay. I well, maybe right, I'm using whatever. the word. I'm whatever. using the word loosely. But he worked. All on I know it. is he was the driving force behind that game. I okay. remember that because okay. I remember him pitching it. And this is long before he was uh, head of head of you know product development okay. in uh, in the U.S. Anyway, so back before he was head of product development, we were working on this PSP game. It was a it was a multiplayer game where you got to. Um, sort of flesh out your own combat quartz, right? You could make your own levels by moving stuff around. Okay. Did you ever play that? So Yes, I did. Wait, this was the, <laughs> yes, I did. Anyway, he, uh, so it was at one of those green light meetings that we used to have all the time where you get all yep. the devs together and everybody's showing their shit and stuff. And it was in the science fair. Scott was literally the only dev to come up to Chris and I and give us honest to God feedback. Yeah. You know, and it, you know, it wasn't entirely positive feedback either. It was like, well, it seems like really what you're looking at here is 12 different maps and that's it. So what's the, you know, what's the deal here? It's like, what's your plan for making this more interesting or whatever? It, it, I don't remember it, the details, but he, all I remember is that guy's going places because he had the people skills to be, you know, an executive. Right. But he also knew games and he was also willing to just cut through the shit and just talk to you as a developer. That's right. And, 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 as, a ga- and as a gamer, I mean, that's the thing is, and, and, oh, and totally. I, I know there's a guy named Ken Lobb who's a legend at Nintendo and now he's over at Xbox. Mike Yabarro and Mike Yabarro was at Xbox and now he's at Blizzard. One of, uh, one of the biggest gamers I know, but other than those two guys <laughs> and now Yabarro is gone I really think that's a key differentiator between Sony and Xbox right now is that a lot of the Sony executives, I can't speak for Jim Ryan, but certainly Shu and Scott, those motherfuckers are hardcore gamers. I mean, they can oh, dude, talk, and they are I mean, and they are willing to tell you to your face the yes. truth. Oh yes. Rody used to torture me uh, days gone uh, milestones. There was a very early milestone. I don't know how far you've gotten in the game. I heard you tell Jeff that you haven't finished it yet. No. Finish yeah. the fucking game, dude. Take uh, the time. Well, I am, but Get why is it, why is it so day. fucking long? Why is because it so it's, fucking it's, long? It's not long. It's epic. I love that it. Ties into my, that ties into my second Rody story. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, it used to be longer. So okay. we can get into this more detail yeah, later. Yeah, 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 the, yeah. Hardest, the hardest part about developing this game than any other game that we did was just kind of the gameplay loops are very different because they're open world. Yes. And even the Golden Path missions are very different. So, you know, I got, dude, I got reamed up the ass for what they called walk and talks and ride and talks. Oh, just, the golf cart. There were lots of ways I, fuck, I wanted to do. Fuck the golf cart. I, fuck the that's golf cart. That's my story. Oh my so God, that was, go, dude, go. Dude, that golf cart, I swear to God, that golf cart If you cart don't know what be... John is talking about, in Days Gone, which I am loving, I am playing, there's a part where you get to this old lady's camp. She's kind of like the antithesis to Cooper, who Tucker, run, yeah. Tucker, who runs. I thought it was Cooper. Who's the guy on the radio? Uh, Copeland. Oh, I, what all these fucking. So it's, the first two camps are Copeland's camp and Tucker's camp. So the hot springs. Okay, so the and, guy uh, who's doing peacefully. all the radio, Radio Free Oregon. That's Copeland, not Cooper. That's Copeland. Okay, that's not. It's not Cooper. all these fucking white supremacist characters that John writes. I get it. They all sound alike to me. I They're can't both have, white names. That's it's right. True. That's right. So, but there's a point where you go to Tucker's camp and she's like, um, Hey Deacon, who is, is the guy you play? Uh, let me, let me talk to you about, you know, what we would love for you to yeah. do for us. And they get in the golf cart and I'm like, okay, am I going to drive the, go- what the fuck? And it's literally, a, it's like what? Eight minutes of riding in a golf cart. Yeah. All right. So, dude, so here's the thing. So, and I love the game, by the way. But one of the one of the dangers of having the writer also be the director. And in case of the Golden Path missions, I was lead designer on all of those. So okay. I was the one who came up with the ideas 
and worked with the environment team to create the layout. I mean, we had this massive area in the world. We're like, we're going to put a camp here. And I know I had a bunch of story I wanted to tell. Right. And it was all about, so the stuff that got cut was Tucker's backstory. They were doing some banner about, you know, when she ran the prison and that's why she's this old hardened character right. because she has this, this out view of that people are, people are all basically shit and right. you can expect the worst and blah, blah, blah. As a writer, I thought, this is great. It's yeah. like, I've got the player's attention. He's locked in a golf cart. <laughs> right. And we're, and we're doing a scenic tour of the camp. It's your first time. We're showing you. Right. Your, and it's a great um, camp. It's paper, big. It's really big. On paper, in, in the early stages of development, I was like, you know, that dude, at one point, that was a 12-minute ride. And when, when Rody came and played it, he literally took his controller and set it down and did this. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. Sort of eyeballing me the whole time. This thing was going. And I was like, all right, I got to cut that down. <laughs> right. So and to be fair, dude, so this is the relationship between Jeff and I. So to be fair, Jeff and some of the other designers were like, dude, this is we got to cut this. So I managed to compromise it. Let's just make it two minutes. Come on. You can give me two minutes. It's a really interesting conundrum because, I mean, you know, you're, you know, the audience, especially for these kinds of games these days, when I talk to these guys online, there are, there are gamers who literally will tell you story is more important to them. Like that has become a thing that used to be like, a really fringe, bizarre thing to say. And now yeah. a lot, and they tend to be younger. The younger generation seems to be coming up because of maybe being conditioned by games like this and going, I, I, I love hearing stories through my video games. That's where I primarily like to get narrative. And then you've got gotta, gamers like me that are like, I, 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 I'm a little tired right now because I couldn't sleep because I watched a little bit of Falcon and uh, Winter Soldier last night. I get my stories through TV and stuff and I like stories yeah. in game but I don't want it to get in the way of the gameplay. So for you, well, let me, does the let me writer respond win? To that real quick, dude. Yeah. No, let me let me respond to that because I sort of agree, but I also sort of disagree. I don't think it's a generational thing. I think it's a, hey, dude, there's only so many ways you can dress up and interact. And it, by the time you're playing a game where literally the gameplay is, I'm going to go here, press a button, pick up a thing, take it here, drop right. the thing off. Dude, that's the loop for 90% of open world games. Yes. And yeah. you, what you what you do is you dress it up as best you can. Like in our game, we went with the motorcycle. Love and motorcycle. Interesting, yeah, interesting roads. I think the bike is one of the best things in the game. Yes. Turned out really well, but not just because of the mechanics of the vehicle, but because of the synergy between that and the, and the road. Mm -hmm. At one time, the open world, by the way, was not... And I'm going to take credit for this, too, because I take a blame. I take the blame for a lot of things. I'm going to okay. take the credit, goddammit. Oh, good. Um, I kind of came up with this idea. Let's turn it into the broken road. We had these long stretches of highway. Our early prototype oh. looked just like Sons of Anarchy. Okay. And I was like, it's boring. It Literally, at the end of the day, that's what we all kind of figured out. It's like, dude, driving down Highway 97, even at 60 miles an hour, not very fun. Right. It, you know, and I don't know if you've played other motorcycle games where they try to mix that up by having other choppers come in and you have bike wars and stuff. We didn't want to do anything like that. Right. So instead what we ended up doing was breaking up these highways, creating off-road trails, making those the critical path. And so it's just an interesting ride through the world. Yeah. That's what makes the bike so great. I, I love it. It's like a redneck and goes also to Tsushima. Also it with frame rate. Oh, I can. Oh, I imagine. I imagine. Yeah. I, I, and line of sight. <laughs> so it, it, I mean, again, we're going to jump around because that le it's, it's, it's something that listeners might be fascinated by. So the fact, I mean, everybody, you know, people talk a lot about crunch these days and they, 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 they really drive me batshit when they talk about, I mean, sometimes it's bad management, right? But a lot of times, like the very fact that you guys, what they would be saying with bad management is you, John, the director, the writer, one of the key guys at Bend, you should have known that that freeway was going to be boring, right? And hang on, yeah. hang on, hang on. And the fact that you had to iterate to get to a fun world map and you, you're you not good because you had to discover that, but a good team managed well, they would have just magically known that and then you wouldn't have had to have redone that. I mean, this is what people don't understand that complain about crunch. I agree crunch is shit, but th I'm assuming that's, you know, would you agree that a lot of times crunch comes because you don't know until you're in the thick of it what the fuck is working and what is not working? Unless we get better brains that are like, you, you know, like you can think 50 moves ahead. How would you know that? Yeah, and I think that I 100% agree. 
So I think that uh, definitely there are types of crunch that can be avoided with better management. There's no question. Sure. Um, but, you know, to Sony's credit, you know, we were just talking about, you know, Scott and Connie and those guys. Dude, they were willing to give us the time and the money to get it right. It's like, yeah. well, I can't tell you how many. It was a long development cycle. And part of it was things like Ben Studio has never done an open world game. Probably, the, you know, the smart money at Microsoft would have said, well, fuck that then. We're not green lighting a project with, right. you know, 50 guys and, yeah. you know, have them take a stab at it. They're, they just never would do it. Right. So the fact that Sony gave us a shot and, yeah, we yeah. had to sort of like stumble our way through. Dude, the biggest one for me was not, you know, rebooting the world because it was too big, which we ended up doing once. And, you know, redoing the way we think about how we're going to traverse the world, which we did. Right. It was the opening. And I know you've heard this before. The opening six to eight hours of the game is really oh. slow. And it just takes forever to get to the Lost Lake camp, which even in all of our focus tests at the end of the world, that's where or at the end of the game development, which is sort of the end of the world. Now right. I think about it. Um, they, uh, we were told that over and over again. But by the time we figured it out, like when Jeff and I first, Jeff and I were the first ones to play the game. We were you, shocked. You, you, mean to, I, you mean to play the game like as a complete whole? As a complete game, yeah. Okay. That was Jeff and I. Um, I think QA obviously have been playing it right. all along. So, you know, right. I, I don't want to discount their their contribution. They did a lot. Um, but, uh, but the first time I played the game, and it was, dude, that opening six to eight hours was 14 hours. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. okay. So, 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 but there was no way we, and that was, Dude, that was, you know, six months before beta. So right. there was just no, and the, and the, here's the thing. It's like, so the choice I was given at the time, and it was a choice I gave myself because I was in the driver's seat this whole time. And, you know, so that's why I say all the fuck ups are mine as well as credit for some of these things. Right. But there, it was too late to change it. It was like, I, my hands were tied. It's like, what was I going to do? It's like, if I cut the, because I felt there had to be some buildup between the sense of loss that you want Deacon to feel or the player to feel through Deacon about Sarah's not there anymore. Right. He's got his buddy Boozer. It's a it's a des it's a desolate world. Blah blah blah. And we had put all this work into the Cascade region, and the Belknap region, and these right. two camps, and all those quests, and the side quests, and all that open world content. It was our most polished content because it had been our vertical slice. Right. 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 For three years, so we had all this awesome content. I couldn't. I just didn't have the heart to cut it. It right. would have like. I think it would have crippled the game in ways and. Jeff alluded to this, so I'll cop to this too. It's a strength and a weakness in my writing that I write very, very beat to beat to beat. You can't cut out a middle beat and have the next beats make any sense. Well, it's, this it's, isn't this yeah. isn't like a sh a shotgun approach to storytelling where it doesn't matter what order things happen. And no, it's like I and I think one of the strengths of Days Gone that nobody talks about, which I which I'm pretty proud of, is that we did find a way to tell what amounts to a pretty linear epic story in an open world and giving the player a lot of agency while they're playing the game, because we allowed you to do all sorts of things to get to that beat. Right. But the bottom line is you guys talked a little about Lisa when Deacon rescues Lisa and takes her to the camp. So I'm going right. to do some spoilers here. So warnings for people right. like David who haven't finished the game. It's um, so long. I swear to God, <laughs> Rip Van Winkle didn't sleep as long as this fucking game. I couldn't game. cut Lisa. I couldn't cut her because right. it's the fact that, Deacon changes his mind when she runs away and gets captured by the Rippers and he has to go rescue her. He chooses at that moment not to take her back to Tucker, but to take her to the Lost Lake camp. And it's that moment when Deacon says, all right, that's a change in Deacon's character. When he's like, I'm not going to take this girl back there. I'm taking her over here. And that is what makes Iron Mike, the leader of the most important camp in the game, begin to trust Deacon again. Because he okay. showed this little moment of humanity uh, there was no way to cut that. I couldn't right. cut it. Well, and, and it ruins the whole rest of the story. And, arc and you're Deacon. in a tough position because as a writer and director, because usually writers will tell you, you know, that's why I never understand people who want to write video games versus novels or movies or television shows, because you... I've got an answer for that too, uh, motherfucker. Uh, I, I, okay, I want to hear it. <laughs> but, 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 but because usually the writer-director is not the same person. And ultimately the writing is the easiest thing to cut compared to like, if you're doing an open world game, you can't suddenly cut four hours and the bike magically is just powered up, right? You have to go through that. Uh, and I mean, unless you come up with a really weird dissolve, like four months later and suddenly the bike's awesome. Um, so yeah, why do you, you know, what is your well, answer you, to well, that? I'll, here, my answer is very simple because if you, 
take the time to play the game, even if it's easy you to act rip like, Van Beek you act, when you're done. What's funny is you act like I haven't played it. I am literally six hours into it. I'm playing it every night. I play it on stream. I, let me, let me Dude, give it's you... A 50, it's a 50-hour game, let and me, that's my answer. Let me, no, here's go the thing. Ahead, go here's ahead, the go thing. If you, so, so I know uh, Neil and Craig Mazin are working on The Last of Us Part 2 for HBO, right? And yeah. That's going to probably be a six-hour miniseries. Yeah. You will watch a movie or a TV. You'll watch a movie, except the you know for two hours, except for the current Marvel movies, which right. are like four fucking hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, you get like uh, The Last of Us. You're gonna spend you know six hours with those characters, maybe yeah. seven, maybe eight. You are gonna spend if you ever finish the game fifty hours. And what I've learned from all the streams I've watched and and you know playing it myself is that. There is an experience that a player has that you just don't get in any other medium, and that is the investment of time, and the so the immersion in that world and that character and these events, and you take ownership of it, of it in a way that you just don't in a comic book or a mm-hmm. television or a book, because you do have some agency. You're making some choices, and I would argue that the more choices you allow the player to make, the better and more immersive the experience is. So it gets to the point where that storytelling is different, is better, is more powerful, is okay, more. But you have to concede. Direct. You have to concede the fact, though, because you're talking about ninety percent. I, I don't disagree with you at a philosophical level, but at a practical level, where ninety percent of the game loop, like you're saying, is and I, I haven't gotten bored of, of Days Gone, so it hasn't hit me yet where the the game loop is feeling repetitive. But I'm really enjoying it. But if 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 your moment to moment starts to disengage you get less and less people that are willing to stay on that journey so i agree with you if you can make 50 hours of compelling content at the end of it you feel like you've got a family member but it's very rare for a video game to have that much uh engaging content where unless you're the hardest of the hardcore or you're going after platinum that you're going to want to stay with it yeah but that's not my problem it is your problem no it's it's not no because it I think it's true of uh, television as well. There, there are people that didn't. Where'd you go? They get through the first season. I talked to them. Wait, wait, wait. So you, you, you cut off. You cut off. People who didn't get through what? Wait, can you hear me now? I can. No, I can hear you great. There was just a, a, a buffer freeze. Yeah, there's something going on with. Oh, let's hope my PC doesn't screw up. Anyway, I think that uh, people don't get through television series. People don't get through long movies. People don't get through novels. People, people give up on stories all the time. But isn't that and the story? A, isn't that the story's fault? Could be the gameplay's fault, though. That's the thing. Well, that, inter- well that's what I mean. Isn't that the it's product? It's interactive medium, right? It's the product's fault, is what I'm saying. You can't blame the. You can't. You can't yeah, but blame you're the arguing. Audience. You're arguing that that it's the wrong medium. You're saying, oh, because some people aren't going to be engaged for 50 hours, you shouldn't do a 50 hour story. And I'm like, yeah, no, I disagree. I think you can do a because if you if you've only played six hours, you're not engaged in the story yet. And I don't blame you because most people weren't engaged until they got right. to the eight hour mark. Oh, well, let me let me. Okay, maybe maybe I feel I can speak to this a little bit differently because I. I don't know what it is. I was going to say this till later, but I'm going to just fucking ask you um, uh, now. So I don't know what it is about Days Gone, and and it and it, it and I don't know how much of this may or may not have to do with its success or you know quote lack of success, depending on what metrics you're using. Um, but there is something, even though it's set in this terrible apocalyptic world. Um, and obviously, I don't know the fate of Sarah yet. My understanding is no one does because there's a cliffhanger, but I don't know if that's true. But I don't know the fate of Sarah yet. Um, it's brighter than God of War. It's brighter than Last of Us. It's it's brighter in some ways even than Ghost of Tsushima. There is kind of, and, and I'm almost wondering, th- there's a very Americana um, bar band. Uh, it, it reminds me in some ways of how Twisted Metal was really connected with certain people. And then a lot of other people looked at Twisted Metal and were just like, oh, God, dude, that is just such that is such white, you know, white trash uh, uh, entertainment, you know. And, yeah. and and I wonder, I mean, but I as a guy from Alabama and a guy from America in any way, I love something more about the world of Days Gone, even though I adore Last of Us 2 and I love the new God of War. There's something that feels earthy and homey to me about this world. And I'm wondering, I mean, I'm sure you recognize that, but was that conscious or that's just you coming through in your writing? That's just who you are. Dude, that's just who I am. So again, I can't take credit for all that because we had a 
I had a lot of help. Jeff had a lot of help with right. open world teams and so on. But yeah, most of that stuff came from me. Like the overall map came from me and the right. overall story came from me and the overall characters and blah, blah, blah. So it's, you know, so in some ways, I guess it was a way to put sort of a personal stamp on it. And in my case, you know, to sort of address what, what I think you're responding to, um, it's all set in Oregon. I mean, I grew up here. I've lived here right. since I was two years old. So I've been here for five decades. And what appeals to me about Oregon is that kind of uh, the, the, the combination of outdoors, all the, the, the crazy outdoor stuff you have, and then, you know, mixing in the rustic, truck stops and yeah. the, you know the, and the, the, the big the, paul bunyan the with the, with the, like with crazy the Willy, stack of you know? in the stack of pancakes and crazy i loved all that all that stuff, stuff is all that stuff is real in fact when right. i sat down with uh in fact that you'll recognize this name when i sat down with don yatomi and uh he was the art director on uh, twisted metal so he was he was he was with the the uh, salt lake city guys and did work on twisted you don't you don't remember him maybe he was on twisted three and four uh, uh maybe that's what it was yeah yeah okay but anyway, well, I know, I was like, he had some anyway, he's a he was the art director. OK. And that's the first thing we did was we they were called weenies. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's a term. Yeah, it's a yep. term from a uh, theme park. So, yep. you know, you want hey, you want Cinderella's castle to be visible from everywhere. Right. You go. Anyway, so we had like the lumberjack dude and, you know, there's a bunch of these throughout the world and they're right. they're They're placed there very deliberately. But it's to it's to a to give the player. And again, I think this is the, the thing about merging storytelling and open world development and interactivity that does something you can't do in a movie is what difference does it fucking make where this thing is placed if if you're going to have five shots that use it in an open world you use this thing to navigate you can see it from a distance and more so even the, the, the important mountains in the game where you're looking at mount bachelor and you can see oh i'm gonna you know at some point in the game i'm gonna be on the other side of that thing right so there's a there's a relationship between you and your environment and the story that's being told there that you are you having trouble hearing me? Nope, I got that you. you. Can't, that you can't get in any other medium. So again, that's one of the things I love about it. But wait, back to so back to Oregon. It's yeah. like, yeah, dude, it's everything. So it's like Radio Free Oregon. Mm -hmm. I grew up with that. Okay. My mom, my mom was literally the secretary and one of the founding members of a, of a, to be honest, a white nationalist uh, Second Amendment crazy organization in Medford, Oregon. How many headlines National... just got written, John Garvin? How many headlines? I've, just... I've told the story. I have told the story oh, before. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is not news. Okay. But anyway, she was a founding member of this. So I don't, I'm, dude, I said white supremacists. They really weren't, but they were all white. You know, I grew up in Medford, Oregon, which was a sundown city. Right. Until like 19... 58 or something crazy what is, is a sundown city meaning they don't work on if sundays if you are a person of color you cannot be in the city after sundown like legally legally you must leave the town oh my or you god will get lynched uh, oh yeah. my god Oregon, dude oregon we had uh we had in medford we had uh this thing called the pear blossom parade which was the spring festival every year yeah um there are pictures look them up online of the kkk marching in that parade as late as the early 1960s Okay, I always, thought, I always thought Oregon was this, like, bastion of liberal progressive. No, 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 no. Oregon's one of the most racist states in the Union. Oh, my and God. And they had okay. all these fights because during the Civil War, they had all these fights about, is it Oregon territory when it comes in? Is it going to be a slave state or a free? I mean, dude, it's been okay. it's highly racist. Okay. And, it's, and, it's, and it's heavily Mormon, too, by the way. So I was brought up Mormon. Okay. And, you, you know, may or may not know that, you know, Mormons didn't even allow blacks to hold their priesthood until like 1976. Okay. That's, that's how, I mean, yeah. that's, that's how late this goes. So okay. anyway, uh, that was, you know, I deliberately chose not to put race in the game. I don't know if you noticed that racism is not a thing in the game, though. I think it would be in the real post apocalypse. Right. I think the, the, the most base human instincts come out. So you're going to find rapists and racists and all kinds of horrible people. Uh, I chose to leave all that out. Look, I'm curious I just, about that. I, didn't want, I just didn't want to deal with it. Right? Okay, like but I, do, I'm, I, I totally tangent, but that's very fascinating to me. So are you saying, uh, because I've always been, I've always been of the mind and it's, it, it's kind of tropey, but like when you see these videos of like, oh, you know, racism is learned. It's not inherent, you know, toddler, a white toddler and a black toddler are hugging and all that stuff. And it's only later in life. But you also have people saying, well, yeah, but there's also an evolutionary aspect where uh, not of racism, but of my tribe is different and I have to be with people like me to survive. It's like lizard brain shit, right? So yeah. I'm curious <clears throat> if you were to have written that, um, the basis part of humanity comes out in 
the direst of situations, most dire of situations. To me, I would assume, and maybe this is just simply naive, that you would have less racism because people just want to fucking survive. Are you thinking it would go the other way? I I think it would go the other way. So again, I don't know if um, if if you watch Sons of Anarchy, if you if I did you not, like that show I not. did not. Well, race played a pretty important part of that during the sort of middle three or four seasons. And I thought they did some interesting things with it, you know, and at the end of the day, they actually had the MC kind of turn around on that issue and they started letting, you know, some people of color into the club. Okay. So, you know, but I, but I definitely believe that just based on all the racism I'm seeing in the country today, yeah, yeah. without a post apocalypse, <laughs> um, I do think that racism would be a thing and that it would be horrible. What's I, I there's so, there's so much about this game. I mean, see when I oh, oh I could, I could just I just want to I want it to be like in the Matrix where he's like I know kung fu now. I just want to take all my questions <laughs> and just give them to you in your brain and give me the answers because I could go a million. Well, let me let me finish the Oregon one because I, okay. I find right, that go, a super go, go. interesting yeah, question. Yeah, so yeah. so Copeland is only a small part of that dude. It's like it's just everything about the locations. Yep. And you know, and they all and I think and again, dude, this is not just trying to write a homey you know, nostalgic story with settings and locations. It was literally about, and this is something else I hope we have time to get into. Yeah, yeah. It's the the struggle for a game developer to do something new, right? It's like, I we chose Oregon. It was not a hard pitch because I, you know, originally I thought, okay, this is my backyard. Is this going to be easy to pitch? But when, taught, when Chris and Jeff and the other directors- Just so and, people and know, got, Chris, Chris is the studio head. Is that right? Chris Reese, yeah. So yeah. Chris and I have worked together for 25 years. Okay. He was at Dynamics back in 97. Okay. Or, sorry, back in 90, 90, 91, 92, right. something like that. We were never on the same team, but he was right. like a programmer working on the on the flight sims while okay. I was doing pixel pushing for Cron graphic Dorn. adventures. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we've we've known each other for forever. Okay. Um, and super nice dude, super talented. Anyway, he was, you know, he's obviously one of the guys helping to pitch this thing because he's uh, he's on the tech side of it. And at the time right. I was doing all the creative, he was doing all the tech. And that was kind of our marriage for, you know, for a couple of decades. Anyway, he, uh, it was an easy pitch because it had never been done before. You know, this was just before, I think, uh, what was the last open world game that came out that ended up having a very similar setting? Um, open world? I, yeah, it was an open world game. Chat, Dude, do you guys know? Um it was oh. the one with all the rednecks and rage rage two. No. Fuck. Well, oh, far that. cry, far cry five. Yeah. Far cry. So, yeah. But that was way after we had been in development for a long time. So the rural sort of U S setting with these kinds of environments that hadn't been done before when right. we started. And so that was what was attractive to me. What, when you, when than... you say it's an easy pitch, was it an easy pitch to Rody and to uh, Sean at the time? Or, or you mean just yes. for you guys? Yes. Yes, because it's a it's a worldwide studio, right? Right. So so half the time, I mean, it, you know, I think at the time we were projecting half our sales would come from from Europe. So it was literally super appealing to that audience because it's exotic and you know to them they have you know they even now when I post stuff on Twitter like hey there's this herd of deer in my in my front right. yard I'll get messages from people like dude I'm in England we don't have anything like that because they keep all the deer locked up on royal estates right right there's just no. Uh, there's no way to interact with nature in a way right. that you can in Oregon. So it's it's an exotic environment. I heard that's how the queen lives so long as she drinks the deer blood every night. But I, that, yeah, right. it may be a rumor. I don't know. That I think, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so game development, it's about trying to find new things. Right. Right. So you're always struggling to find new locations, new things to do, new ways to dress up the interact so that when you're going to push the button and you go to this place, you do it, it's like... You know, you use story to dress that up. I think do the most. you do you like storytelling, writing more than game directing and mechanics? Like which one, if you had to choose one for your next project, would you if you could only do one? All right. So to be clear, I've never done mechanics I, ever. I'm just okay. not a controller guy. And if you, if you Jeff was being very diplomatic, but if you if you watch me play the game, even dude, I'm just you know, I always play on super easy, the easiest level there is. I'm okay. even on you know, on every game that I've ever played. So I'm not a mechanics dude. So that, you know, so Ron Allen was the guy who did all the control. You know, he's been, a, he's been there for a long time as well. Jeff was in charge of all of that stuff. So okay. the bike, the way the bike handles, the weapons, the controller, the move set, all that stuff is done by gameplay guys who are way better at it than I am. So how was the, how was the responsibility? Like, was there a final say? Was that you or Chris? Uh, 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 Depended on what it was. Right. Okay. Right? So, so 
So for gameplay and mechanics, that was always Jeff, and Jeff, okay. that's where Jeff and I would would butt heads sometimes. Okay. Because again, like the like the golf cart ride, and right. it turned out to be absolutely right about that. Right. It's right. like, dude, twelve minutes is too long. And, you know, there was a few other things, a lot of examples like that, where, you know, I relied on the gameplay guys to tell me what was fun. And if, I don't care how good the story is. If right. it's not fun, then fuck it. You cut it and you and you do something else. Right. I heard the game was going to be branching narrative for a while. Is, is that accurate? That is 100 percent accurate. What happened and what was it? How branching was it going to be? Like, how was it like uh, Detroit become human branching or it was not not that ambitious? No, we're ne we would never be as ambitious as David Cage, right? So right. That's just that's just crazy. And um, you can take that you can take that uh, modifier ambitious, and you can put a lot of things in there. And the sentence, yeah, the sentence ambitious. still works. It's weird <laughs> how that sentence works. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry, I'll take ambitious. Fair enough. Um, I I would agree with that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, dude, there was a couple of things we had. So it was literally mo it was always going to be about. Deacon and Boozer's relationship. Okay. And so what we wanted there to be was a sort of morale system where, not, you know, at some point we even had a meter, I believe, so that you would go back to the safe house and you'd be checking on Boozer and you'd be doing shit for him. Right. And if you didn't take his, if you didn't keep his morale high enough, then you didn't get the good ending of the game. So the good ending of the game would be Boozer lives and, you know, and you're, everybody lives happily ever after. The bad ending of the game would be, Boozer blows himself up and he's gone forever. You would have had, that would have been amazing. So wait, if you don't treat him well and he gets depressed, he kills himself. Basically. Yeah. That would, I mean, I don't want to trigger anybody. That's horrible. And real life is horrible. Don't fucking, I'm not joking around, but no, I know what a hell of a great thing. What Dude, a, I know when I, when I pitched this idea to my kids, cause they're, they're kind of always my first audience. So I right. pitch it to my kids first. Cause they're all huge gamers. They're all in right. their thirties and forties now. Yeah. And, uh, they, uh, I pitch it to them even before I'll pitch it to Jeff because, right. you know, if I'm going to be ridiculed, I want it to be in a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But anyway, they, you know, it's like uh, one of my sons said, dude, if I would do, I would move heaven and earth to save his life. I would play the game from scratch again if I found out that there was a better way to do it and do it again. Here's the problem. Yeah. It was a good idea. Again, on paper. But when we got to our first focus tests, it, it, nobody understood. They, and there was no way to make the player understand what was at stake early enough in the game for them not to fuck it up. Yeah. Okay. Without giving it, without giving it away. Right. Unless you right. bring up a, a, you know, a requester box that says, will Boozer live or die? Right. Right. You know? Right. Right. And to me, that just broke the immersion way too much. It's like, okay, I'm playing a video game now and I'm going to be making these, you know, sort of black and white choices all the way through the game. Yeah. And, and, you know, we did, we had, I think we released it in one of our early cinematics where, the, the moment where Deacon is going to shoot Leon in the head and yeah. the requester box came up and said, do you, do you let the freakers kill him or do you, or do you kill him? Uh, that was like one of the first AB choice moments and right. nobody understood what was at stake or what the so right all, thing to so do the, was. Uh, the choices only existed for that boozer relationship though. It wasn't like the story branched off. It was, you're no, basically filling a meter behind the scenes of right. boozer suicidal or boozers happy based on these choices. Yeah. So the, another choice was when you retrieve the drugs yeah. from Leon's stash, yep. you had a choice of where to take it. You could take it to the camps. You, that's still yes. in the game. Yes. But that was, that was one of the ones that worked on its own because it was about the, it was about the points you could earn in either camp. So there was a different, there was a, there was a right. rewards that were separate from because boozer was pissed at you. If you took it to Cup, Tucker's camp because he hates Tucker. Okay. Oh, it's such but a, he, yeah. But he's, but he's okay with Copeland, right? See, so, and again, and there if a, there was a sequel, which we'll get into in a minute, but, you know, if there was a sequel, because that's the kind of stuff that now that you've got the groundwork laid, you could go back for part two and go, okay, how could we well, do this? Could, could I, we, though, I could solve that. Seven. I could solve that for you in five minutes. Here's how you would have done it, right? If, if, if Boozer kills himself at the end, um, you've got, you, I mean, this might be, not be a good idea, but it would solve it. You would have then Deacon telling the story of Boozer. And as he's telling it, he would be able to basically retell the story in a different way. And the player would then go, oh, I've had the emotional impact of fucking up and Boozer. But now as I retell the story and I make changes, it's like, oh, okay, I can change things. But regardless, though, it's a brilliant idea. It's a brilliant. Idea. I'll make I'll make a prediction. I'll yeah. make a prediction that David Jaffe gets to the end of his 50 hour playthrough and finds out 
that he didn't know he was fucking up all the way and that he's been a, that he's now expected to play it again. Oh. The David Jaffe oh, I rage wouldn't. quits and throws his controller across the room. No, because says, fuck you, Garvin. No, I I'm would only play in this again. No, because That's I, but you're not asking me to play it again. You're basically just saying, <laughs> you know, if you want to, there's another outcome. Okay. Let's, I'm, I gotta, I gotta address the, uh, the criticisms because it's really weird because you walk into it and I get it and I love it because I fucking, I don't know how you feel about some of these. I mean, I consider myself a very progressive. I am a very proud social justice warrior. I love so much. I mean, who was against social justice? It's the craziest goddamn thing in the world, but yeah. I mean, some people, but not many. Um, but at the same time though, you did get a little bit of blowback when this game came out from, oh, I got a, a little? Well, I mean, I, I wasn't <laughs> tracking it. It's only in prepping for this interview and oh, playing the I game. I was tracking it, and it was a lot. So, so. Talk, can you just talk it, a little bit about... Well, I'm just... I'm fascinated because, first off, when I play the game so far, and I'm eight or nine hours into it, I haven't experienced... Um, you know, yeah, they're two dudes. They're not two white dudes. I don't think Boozer's a white guy. I think he's a... He seems more like a guy from Mexico, right? Boozer's like yeah, a... I think, I, I think he's a white guy. <laughs> okay, so two white guys. His name guys. is William Boozer Gray, right? So oh, that's okay. a couple of white dudes. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Okay, so, but, I mean, where do you think this um, comes from, this sort of pushback? Because what in the game do you think pushed their... I mean, there was the line about riding, you know, will you ride me as much as you ride your bike or promise to ride me as much as you ride your bike at the wedding, which I thought was a great line. It was funny. Yeah. It's something a husband would say and a wife would say to each other or a romantic couple would say to each other. The only thing I can think of is a lot of these miserable journalists have never sort of been in a relationship that had any heat on it. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's yeah, I, I don't understand it. So can you just speak a little bit about a what you experienced and your take on it? Because I'm maybe there's some racist, awful shit coming up, but I haven't experienced it so far. All right. Well, I'm you know, here's the thing. I think that uh I and, and probably I'm gonna I'm gonna anger maybe some of a lot of your audience because I don't necessarily disagree with some of the criticism. It at the highest possible philosophical level, what we're experiencing in Hollywood right now, not so much in games, but definitely in Hollywood, is this sort of zeitgeist that says, you know, uh Oscar's so white and you know why is right. it that there are no people of color on and, and on and on and on and I believe that it's true and it's like dude it you know so it's like uh, so this book that I just finished on uh, so I do I, I'm doing a bunch of research on all these cartoony books from the 1900s and there was this there was this book published in 1904 called Clevelanders as we see them and it was a book of caricatures 350 drawings not a single woman not a single person of color, not a single person of anything that didn't, that wasn't a middle-class old white businessman with a gray beard. That was everybody in this. And, Cle and that's Cleveland. And that's Cleveland. Right. And, and I looked it up just to do my own research. Dude, there were hundreds of important women in Cleveland at the time. And there were honestly hundreds of, hundreds of uh, businessmen that were all sorts of different races. Okay. None of them were represented. So I think that there is a certain amount of truth to the fact that, you know, I, at the time, I you know, when we were working on Days Gone, it wasn't at the forefront of my mind to say, hey, should this be a black dude or an Asian dude or should it be a woman or, you know, whatever. It's, just, it's like I we start from what's true to the concept, which was bikes. So right. if you're in a biker gang and we want to do the biker gang because it's got, you know, there there's all sorts there's, of reasons it's, to do a biker it's their, gang. They're almost modern day cowboys, right? There's a mythos to that culture. But they have a certain survivability and a yeah. gruffness built into them. Like, you know, they use melee and baseball bats and, and chains yeah. and they and they ride bikes. So they're you know, it felt so it felt like there was a good marriage there between the post apocalypse, this type of person. Yeah. And then it's staying true to that, you know. It's like there, you know, there are not a lot of, of uh post apocalypse there are not a lot of motorcycle gangs that have women in fact there are none that i know of. so th i'm sure somebody can write in and, and prove me wrong what, that, but... what about people of color are there a lot of minorities in motorcycle gangs i mean i don't know much about that culture i at the time that i was writing days gone there were not so okay. i'm sure again that that's changed right um but you know again it's like it's when you're working on a protagonist there was a you know there's and, and again this could do this is why i cop to it it's like i'm an old white dude 
And so right. I, rem- I remember reading some of the reviews saying, well, I owe another gruff white dude. And I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of a white dude myself. So I write what I know. If I were going to try to do something else, you would get, I mean, um, yeah, you would, how would I do it? I well, wouldn't even know how it's interesting because like, uh, I, it, you know, it, it, you can't, you can win, but you can't win. Right. Because there's a part of me, like, I love Jin Sakai. He's one of my favorite new characters. Uh, the, the protagonist of ghost, um, I love Miles Morales, uh, a, a black kid, a Puerto Rican black kid. Um, love that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I love Kratos. Who the fuck knows what Kratos is, right? You know. Um, Dude, I love Ellie. Who you know, uh, yeah. is a lesbian female. So I it's like, love these are, the fact that these... Sony is sitting there greenlighting <laughs> a t- over two hundred million dollar game, and it stars two lesbians. I love it. Absolutely. I mean, because it's like I grew up in Alabama. I hate these fucking racist fucks. I have I, I'm, I'm a very strong LGBT supporter and I'm like, fuck you, motherfucker. This is one of yeah, the best so games ever made. And it is it is it is, you know, so but again, back but, to but yeah, but yeah, back to my back to my critics and in, in the yeah, yeah, but hang on. But hang on. But yeah, I know. I know. Right, I know. Yeah. Enough. Enough. about me. me what, do you, what do you think about me? Um, yeah, I know. But 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 what I'm what I'm wondering, though, is um, so you come along and what I like about days gone is that it is what I said earlier uh, to Jeff is I said, there's something kind of masculine, refreshingly masculine about days gone that you don't even see, at least in my opinion, in God of war 2018 and the last of us. And I don't mean masculine, like dicks and balls. I mean, masculine, like masculine energy. It doesn't have to be associated with someone who is a biological male or a trans male. It's just, it's just, there's, there's a sense of, guy energy about it which i didn't see in a lot of the other sony games but instead i mean you got pushback on that as well though right i mean i would have thought people would have said that's that's compared to ghost and god of war and last of us that's a nice refreshing thing this and it's it's interesting how this ties back into what we were talking about earlier about how long it takes to get into a 50 hour experience and i you know to be honest i think the real issue is that in the first eight hours of days gone you don't meet any any people who have much diversity. They're all white people, most of them, and they are, you know, they're, they're, every important character is a white person, and you don't get to, yeah, because it's a really it's an inclusive game. I mean, I've and I, you know, I don't know if you know this, but every game I've ever written has been that way. So yep. even back in the Siphon days, you know, Leon Jean was, you know, now I look back on her and realize, okay, this is a stereotypical you know, Asian, Asian chick sidekick, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but at the time it felt kind of progressive and Lawrence yeah. Mujari was this, you know, this, this dude from South Africa who had like a, and again, I didn't do it at the time because I was being inclusive. I did it because I needed interesting characters right. that looked different and talked different. We had lesbians, we had lesbians in <laughs> Twisted Metal Black and we had uh, 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 gay men in Jet Moto and nobody, yeah. you know, nobody thought about it. Nobody cared. It was just like, yeah, it's an interesting character. Exactly. Yeah. So Days Gone has, you know, Days Gone has has lesbian relationships and has right. people of color and it has and everybody's allowed to be, you know, fucked up and a villain in some cases and a good guy in some cases. So, you know, it's like to me it was never an issue, but I really believe that some critics didn't get that far. And there was a lot to pick apart in the first in terms of the pacing, again that's right. kind of on me and, you know, just the repetitive repetitiveness of the open world loops we were relying on a lot. Right. You know, I put some of that on Jeff. Um, there was, you know, there was, there was a lot to for. There was a lot of opportunity for a reporter to put the controller down and go fuck this game. What can I pick apart? <laughs> oh, it's misogynistic because Deacon looks at his girlfriend's ass and makes a comment about it, or yeah. it's a, you know, it's racist, or yeah. it's a, you know, I, it's like because it because it doesn't have a person of. You know, that's differentiated at all is the main protagonist. Well, and the only way to win that fight is to acquiesce to something you probably don't believe in, right? Like, I got a guy in the chat right now who's going, Jeff, you're not a social justice warrior. How come Kratos fucks so many women? I'm like, what does one thing have to do with the other? But there yeah, is a group of people out there that basically think in having a healthy animalistic sex drive, even or only and especially with a consenting partner is somehow misogynistic. Yeah, it's- I don't think so. Again, I hear I, I've been following some of the some of some of the stuff going on in your channels. Yeah, and uh, you know the whole discussion around woke and whatever that means. Yeah. And to me, it's like again we're living in a Harvey Weinstein world now, right? And a Bill Cosby world. We're living in a world where some guys are complete assholes and dicks, Absolutely. and they do take advantage of positions of power. Yes, and they do, you know, 
abuse women in ways. And yeah. it's like, dude, uh, just in my personal life, almost every single woman I've ever known was abused by some dude somewhere. In Abs- her life. Absolutely. Yes. And we- that's fucked up. And it's yes. like, to me, that's, to me, that's why, again, I don't, you know, there was a, there was a whole rape scene early in one of the early versions of days gone. And I, you know, I ended up kind of cutting all that stuff out too. And I was just like, I, you know, I just, I don't want there to be, I don't want that to be the story. Right. And, but you, right. You know, it, but you knew it would is what you're saying. By the way, you corrupted my, my, my boys when they were kids. Why? They would, th- because they would play God award just to get to the, the sex replenish scene that happens, you know, the little arcade right. mini game. And I know you're joking, but a lot of people use that verb corrupt. Like what's, I don't, I, I don't have a problem with kids. See, I mean, if they're interested, they're interested. I'd rather them not see a lot of other horrible stuff like, Oh, you know, but, but anyway, okay. Um, yeah. And the other part so, about it too is, that. is uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. They can, they can, they can send me uh, you know, <laughs> thank you notes every year. Um, so t- dear Jaffe just had my first threesome. I knew exactly what to do. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, the other part about it is well, I was bringing up Miles Morales because the guy who directed it, I was talking to him recently and he's a white guy, right? A lot of it is, is that, yeah, you can't win because if you would have tried to make, uh, uh, Boozer, a black guy or Deacon, a black guy, there would have been a potentially justifiable complaint of what is this, you know, in your words, old white dude trying to write, you know, a, a black guy or, but there's not a lot of black people in the industry. We, we have some, and thank God, Sony Santa Monica has done a great job at diversifying um, and, and also bringing in, because a lot of people hear diversification and go, oh, you're not bringing in the best people. No, you're going to tell me Sony Santa Monica doesn't have some of the best motherfuckers on the planet? They do. And some of them are, are white and straight and black and gay and trans and Asian. But they're out there. But our industry maybe just hasn't done the best job of bringing Dude, these I, people. If I in. had it to, if I had it to do over again, I might have made Boozer black. Right. And here's why: because I love Lin Manuel Miranda, who did. Oh yeah, uh, I know who. Oh, Hamilton, yeah. right? Oh yeah. So Hamilton, its approach to casting, because I saw it on Broadway, yep. and I was blown away by, hey, George Washington's a black guy. Right. You know what? And it was okay. Yeah. You know, so so he's taken a lot of criticism for not really seriously addressing slavery which was a real issue during that time period yes you know he yes. kind of he makes he makes offhand remarks to it but i do think that in a in a progressive society a woke society call it whatever the fuck you want right it's it's okay to have diversity in your cast and just ignore it it's just like yeah. cast the person who's the most talented actor who can do the most with the role and don't care what race they are or what or in, dude, I would even say in some cases what gender they are, although that's going to be a much tougher argument, right? Because you're building men and women characters. So right. that's probably going to be with us for a long time. But you're, but yeah, anyway. but you're saying when you were making this, this wasn't at the forefront. So you're saying. No, I never, even, I never gave it that much thought for the main characters. I, I would never, you know, just say, hey, let's, you know, let's avoid criticism of having an all white cast because I've always written diverse casts anyway. And that was just super important to make sure that there was a representation of okay. everybody that might survive in an apocalypse in okay. this world. The very last question I'll ask on it is because it's coming from the chat. And I think it's interesting because I hear this a lot. And you are a guy who is primarily a creator and a writer. And you are a guy who has put out a game that a lot of people love that has gotten attacked for being, I guess, not woke enough. Okay. Okay. Hmm. these guys in the chat or a number of them also online say things like, please keep your politics out of our games, right? My experience with what that means is politics in the games are fine as long as they're my politics. But the minute you put something in that makes me a little uncomfortable, I have a problem. What, what do you think about that when you've got a lot of people saying games aren't for that? Get that shit out of here. I just want to be entertained. I... I agree almost, I almost agree in the sense that if Deacon would never spout something off about Trump or Biden, anything that's literally specifically political, but if they're talking about, you know, hey, uh, people of color are being oppressed and have been for, you know, for generations, and I wanted to have there be some semblance of that in a video game, I, I, I disagree. I think that you, it's hard to separate on a sort of higher human political level, it's hard to make a game about anything worth making if you if you're not addressing larger issues. I mean, that, you you do touch on you it. do touch on the Second Amendment. 
you do touch on uh, sort of cap- capitalism and consumerism. But I don't preach on it. But I don't preach on it. So I, there are, and I follow all of these discussions. So all you right. guys online know that I read every one of these because I find it fascinating. Because I, even if I, as the author, don't agree, that doesn't make them wrong. Because once you right. put it out there, it's out there. And, you know, you can argue any side of it. What I would like to say, though, is that I don't make an argument for the Second Amendment. Copeland does. Right. And Copeland <laughs> so, also. So and I'm also, not going to yeah. have Copeland not make that argument. And, you know, and in many ways, again, because it's in the through the lens of a post-apocalypse. It's a good argument. Kind of, he, yes, he's right. Who right. would not have a gun? In this he, he's also not wrong about <laughs> the the obsession with capitalism and the obsession with consumerism. I mean, these he makes dude, some good right, points. Having said that, as the writer and creator, I do not own a gun. I would yeah. refuse to own a gun. I have ne- I've owned a gun when I was in my twenties and lived in Southern Oregon, and we used to go out and you know and shoot things. Um, I would never own a gun. Do you and, think it's just the critics and of, of not all, but a lot of game critics are just not either trained well enough or intelligent enough to basically look at the work because yeah, you're exactly right. There are characters in movies that spout a bunch of awful things, but they don't label the movie as the awful thing that the character's spouting. But in this case, you're getting all of that lumped in. People have said that it's actually hurt your Metacritic score. Do you think the Metacritic score, which is a thing that is 71 right now was meaningfully hurt by this or it was more, maybe the pacing or the bugs or whatever. Dude, I, I don't, to be honest, I don't know because again, I, and we can talk about Jason if you want. And yeah, we'll get some to that. Other yeah, critics, yeah. But, but dude, it's like even guys, guys who I, you know, I've been friendly with for, you know, for a decade who yeah. I really have a lot of like guy, like game over. Greggy didn't like the game. Right. If you go back and read his review, it was not a great review either. What did he and not so, like about it though? Was it the I game? I don't remember okay. because because at some point I stopped reading these things. Yeah. And I you know it's like oh fuck really he didn't like it. <laughs> it, know, it I thought it, he would. It, let me ask so, you. So okay, it's go not, ahead. Go it's ahead, go not ahead. just it's just it's not just the politically correct woke reporters who you know who, who had an axe to grind and of a course. chip on their shoulder of when course. they came in. It was a lot of people who played the game and didn't get it or didn't like it or whatever. We had we so, had Jeff saying, and then somebody corroborated it, who I think was a uh, uh, reviewer, um, said that you guys sent out review code that had a lot of problems, and there was a day one patch, but the reviews went off without taking into account the day one patch, and that hurt you guys. How did that that PR and Mark? They're usually on top of that. Is that an accurate statement? So again, dude, I, don't, I it, because. I don't. I, I was on the creative end and didn't have a ton okay. to do with the the business. But you know, obviously, I was exposed to it, so I have. You know, I can I can give you my opinions. Yeah, about yeah, that. that's that's what we want. But yeah. here's but here's what I want everybody in your audience to know that you know that I don't think it's stressed enough, is that the achievement to get the game in the state that it was was just based on what we went through was just kind of amazing. I think at the end of the day, um, we felt that the code was playable to the point where you could, because I, I got to be completely honest, I would play the game on a standard P, base PS4 and not have any problems. And we would get focus tests back where, you know, the data seemed really good. And we, you know, so it's like, I, I don't, I can't explain you yeah. again. You'd have to get Reese on here and have him kind of go over the technical uh, hey, issues of what happened. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. but it's totally true that, yeah, we had, we had people who, played the game on hardware that had, you know, I don't know, maybe a, you know, maybe they needed to defragment their hard drive or something. Right. But there were, there were some people who had issues. If you asked your audience now, they could say, I've seen the chats where people are, no, I played it without any hitches at all. And another right. would be like, oh no, I had frame rate. Discs. I, I, I will, I will tell you dropout and so on. I think, you know, a lot of people have, I have a lot of positive things to say about Sony, very few negative things. But one of the negative things I'll say is lately their ability to uh, reliably focus test and gameplay test has been really shitty. Uh, the numbers that came back to us on Drawn to Death were insanely off from the numbers that we got. Like when, higher or lower? Higher. And some of the, yeah. they, they were really high. And we, I mean, we thought, I remember Scott Rohde reached out to me because I was on one of my fuck Donald Trump tirades on Twitter the day the game came out. And he's like, look, PR is asking. We're getting really good word of mouth in this game. Could you please just not talk about Donald Trump for a few weeks and let us ride this out? I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. Right. Sure. Um, and, and, and then, dude, he, so, so in, my, my, exp- my experience is different. So okay. I, I think our, our numbers were pretty accurate. Here's a word that came in very early in our focus testing. Um, and so we kind of knew this was going to happen from the beginning. Polarizing. The game is polarizing How? in a way that got, 
because ha- half the people who played it loved it, half the people who played it hated it. No, but so why? Why is what I mean. What we, po- that, what's we polarizing? Spent, we spent months trying to get it why. So on our on our mock reviews that we had done just before launch, I right. got one of the best reviews I've ever seen in my life. And I mean, the the guy was glowing. He was, you know, talking about me in the same breath as like Neil Druckmann. And, right. You know, it was just it was that glowing. And we got another review that was like, oh, fuck, this is the trashiest, stupidest, dumbest, crappiest game I've ever played. So two, it's like, what do you do with that as a developer? So we had, you know, at the end of the day, what we knew was going to happen is for whatever reason, the game was going to come out and some people were really going to dig it. Some people weren't. And, you know, I think, again, kind of looking at it from Sony's perspective, and again, I'm not with Sony anymore, and Mm -hmm. I never was at that level. um, I would just say that if you're in the business of making really expensive video games, you can't have a polarizing game. Right. Marvel can't afford to come out with a movie that's going to piss off half the people that come to the movie. Right. They, I think they, they just learn. can't afford it. You yeah, know, if you're right. in the business of making popular entertainment, but the, okay. you really need to find properties. You are not that wrong. Are, that are, you know what I mean? That are going to be. Yes. And we're going to get, I want to get to that in just a second, but you don't know why it was polarizing though. End of the day, because I'm playing it and I'm like, I don't know why this would be polarizing. So what was the, did you ever come to a conclusion? I, yeah. I think you just read through the early reviews, dude. It's like, it's, it was, it was in the early reviews. So it was like the gruff white guy protagonist. A lot of people just never accepted that. So it was, the, there were a lot okay. of people that couldn't get past, you know. So again, these were conscious choice. Some of these were choices that I've made were things like uh, the amount of VO in the game and Deacon talking to himself. That put a lot of people off. Okay. Okay. Um, the, uh, you know, just, there was a, we got a, we got a lot of feedback that there's a certain amount of open world burnout happening where, you know, people are just like, Oh, another open world game. Oh dude, the biggest one. So might as well get this out of the way. Yeah. Another zombie game. <laughs> why, why do we need right. another zombie game? Right. So we got that a lot. I have a simple answer to that, by the way, what the fuck else is there? <laughs> so if you're making a shooter, you're either going to be shooting aliens demons zombies other human beings what else is there animals dinosaurs yeah, right right or mo- monsters yeah and the most interesting so we had both we had humans and wolves human enemies wolves and we great. had and some animals yeah but you know it, again it's like what you want in an open world game and i've even heard neil Druckmann say this about the last of us is the reason they went with clickers is because it puts a lot of danger in the world that just humans by themselves would not give you and it gives right. you diversity of gameplay. Um, that's so, right. It's, absolutely. So you're, you know, so when you're when you're going up against clickers who have this move set and they have and they die you know, and they these, explode and oh, they, dude, yeah, it's yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah. So to me, to me, it never occurred to me to ask why did they, why another zombie game because okay. it was fun and it was interesting and it was a good take on it. But we, for whatever reason, we didn't get that same sort of right. You know, we didn't get that that uh, that same you know get out of jail free card. We right. Were like constantly answering the question from the beginning why zombies right okay okay i get it that i appreciate my answer is why not right (laughs) i i guess yeah okay so when you the reviews came out i mean i took my reviews and i i'm just curious if you're the same drawn to death was probably one of the most personal games i ever made believe it or not it's very much uh my heart my soul is in that game for better or for worse uh and it's you know it's painful when it gets shit on um, when you got these reviews, were you just more, cause it sounds like you were very much in days gone. You are very, your soul is in that game, whether you were the, the setting or your mentality of the world. Did, did you, were you just like, eh, them's is the breaks or was it, how did you take that emotionally? Um, I took it hard to yeah. be honest, because you know, it's again, it's like, uh, and this is just the reality of, of Sony Metacritic score is everything. You know, if you're the creative director on a franchise and your game's coming in at a 70, you're not going to be a creative director on that franchise for even, very long. Even if it sells? So you think sales don't trump Metacritic? Um, you know, in some ways, I, I'd be willing to say, and again, dude, this is just my opinion. I know, I, I know. Ha- yeah, yeah. I haven't asked those guys, so yeah. I honestly don't know what they would say. Yeah. Uh, but I think that if you are that if you are Disney, you can't afford to make a shitty movie, even if a bunch of people go to see it. Just because you the, I mean? the long-term there's reputation. A, there's a kind of, yeah, there because there's a brand thing going on there, and you really want the quality bar to be high enough so that they're, so, you know, you're selling hardware. So, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I completely agree that it was on me and Jeff and the guys at Ben's studio and, you know, and on Connie and all of us to create something that would have wider appeal 
that would avoid some of the pitfalls that we, that, you know, we're, that were kind of self-inflicted. And, you know, I'm not saying in any way that, hey, uh, you know, we should have all bought into political correctness and become woke and done all the things that, you know, satisfy social justice warriors. I'm not saying that at all. Okay. I'm saying that as a company making product for millions and millions of people, it's on us to make sure that that is profitable and, you know, makes, a, you know, makes enough money, but also appeals to a wide enough audience to grow the brand. I mean, that's right. It's not like you have full freedom to do whatever the hell you want. No so one does. When you, well, especially with the budgets going. I mean, look, when you yes. when you were there, when you and I were there early, you never had the freedom to do whatever the hell you wanted, but it was very different. The green light pro right. Oh, it was very different. As it yeah. should have been because these things were they didn't cost that much to make. I mean, now you're talking relatively, right? Well, yeah. I mean, twisted metal, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I I hear Days Gone was around 150, 150 million. I don't know if that's accurate. But it, I don't. I honestly don't know. So right. again, I wasn't involved in okay. the budget side of things. So you you put this game out. I know Jeff leaves at the tail end of 2020, when they had kicked around a sequel and they talked about Uncharted Five and they're helping out Naughty Dog with multiplayer and now maybe there's a, a single a, a new IP what have you. But you leave like how soon after Days Gone actually hits retail? When are you out of there? Six days. Okay. So I'm just going to ask you point blank. You can tell me to go fuck myself. Were you fired? It, you know, so when you, when you asked Mumbauer that, I thought he gave a kind of a, an interesting answer. Right? Did I, ask, I, didn't, I didn't ask Mumbauer did that. Ask him did that. I ask Jeff? Yeah, you totally did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, you what did, did not say? ask Jeff that. I don't remember exactly, but, the, but it was basically. Oh, you watched the Mumbauer was, interview as well. I, I, I did, I'll yeah. tell you what. I, I'm on I'm fire. A, I'm a fan. I'm that's, a fan. That's now, right. Uh, no, it's complicated because here's the thing. Whoa. It was a hard, okay, it go. was a hard, long development. Yeah. Six years. And I worked six years of crunch. Okay. And, and here's the thing. I love working crunch. I know yeah. you, you've talked about this before. Yeah. So working crunch for me, I love what I do. So it's not yeah. that big a deal, but yeah. that doesn't mean it's good for me. Of <laughs> you course, know what I mean? Of course. I, so the last two years that I've been away from the studio have actually been a blessing, dude. It's yeah. like, I have been able to like get up and do what I want. Yes. I've written three books and you know, and I'm, you know, I'm able to, it's just, it's a different thing when you're in development, it's a nonstop pressure. It is for yeah. milestones and profitability and, you know, and people management and blah, blah, blah. And dude, to be honest, at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is there were, you know, we had a few heated arguments over the last year or so, and I would end up yelling and saying something like, just get, just give me a package so I can get the fuck out of here. You know, say okay. shit like that. Right. Um, and when it was just Chris and I in a very small studio, that kind of heatedness was fine, but dude, by the time you get to a hundred person studio, you right. can't have one of the directors losing their temper, you know, and I was, you know, I'm just, I'm not a great people person anyway. Yeah. So I'm, you know, so for me, you know, and it, it's not like, you know, like they didn't try, like I was put through training a couple of times, right. like, Hey, here's how you, you know, go out to lunch with people more and, you know, be right. a better director and so right. on. Dude, I just kind of sucked at all that. So. I, did, I, 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 I'm the same. I'm the same. Like I, I was. Yeah. Oh, I've heard. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I wasn't. I, I wasn't. I've a heard dick. the Jaffe story. Well, I, I. Oh, tell me. I want to hear some of them. But I mean, I, it just that I my my best friend when I was making God of War as the game director was the fantasy player in my head. Everything was about pleasing that player, and I didn't care yeah. about going to lunch. I didn't care about making friends. I cared about treating that player well. And, and, and a lot of it is the industry in, in a good way, but it has matured. And I think somebody like me, somebody like you, there are companies I think that still would benefit from our experiences. But when you're talking Probably. at this level, but I do, but I, again, know. getting back, getting back to me. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, so <laughs> Sorry, we, so chat. Let's before, go back to John. Before we uh, got online. What's happening, John? What, the, what's the bothering, what's bothering you today, John? So the uh, so these books that I'm doing, I yeah. you know I the re the reason I love them is I'm doing the writing, yeah. I do the art direction, I do the book layout, I do the book design, I literally do the covers yes. and the and the PR. I I put the package together. I I walk it through the printers. I mean I'm do it's a one man show. Yeah, dude, you can't make games that way anymore. No, and, and no. more to the point, you shouldn't want to because I think that there is a there's a new paradigm for game development that is what it should be, which is collaborative. Get as many bright people as you can. In it's very and different. Give them, yes, give them the chance to prove themselves. And so you and, feel when you were 
And until you correct, I was too close to it. I was too close right. to it. To but see. when you, when Sony came to you and said, this marriage is no longer a good marriage. Looking back now, you understand that you don't, you don't hold. Oh, I understood it the day it happened. I knew okay. it was coming. Okay. In fact, that's the first thing I told them. I'm like, okay, I saw this coming because, you know, right. for lots of reasons. So, you know, it was, it wasn't a surprise, but here, dude, so it's like, you know, the people have asked, okay, why didn't I say anything about it for a year and a half or whatever? It's like, I, it, I, because I knew the kind of story that was going to come out. So let's talk about Jason for a second. Yeah. And I want to say the same thing that Jeff said, by the way, is that I have known Jason. I don't know him well. We're not friends or anything, but I, you know, he did a, I did a lengthy podcast with him a few years ago. Yeah. He's done lengthy interviews. He's always been super professional, super yep. nice, super yep. kind, I, um, very personal. I, I don't like him at all. But I, I, I get that. But I but think, but I you, think he's I, a, he's good at his job for the most part. I think he's a really okay. yeah. I I think Blood and Pixels is a good book. I, I agree. He brings up I, agree. I think he brings up a lot of things that, that that need to be brought up in the industry. Totally agree. I don't have any examples of him lying or, you know, I so I just don't know any of that. I don't know that side of him. Okay, that fair I, enough. You know, okay. and, I, and I'm not going to get into it. But here's what I will say: is he did contact me for that article. Okay. And I and I told him no comment. And so I kind of feel bad about that because the narrative that I think that he was spinning was Garvin left because, you know, the sequel didn't get greenlit. And I, I don't know if no, you noticed, no, but, the, you but, the art, yeah. but the article's been edited. So the Bloomberg article has been edited. My name's no longer in it. And I oh. thought I remembered, I thought I remember reading it a couple of weeks ago when it came out and he, he mentioned Jeff and I by name and that's no longer the case. Okay. So that's interesting. But anyway, no. But yeah, you like, just so, so it, just the, the timing, audience. The audience is clear on the timing. You left well, but you left six days after Days Gone One. So there was yes. a whole year or so yeah, where so that I, team dude, thought they were making Days Gone. 2. I have no knowledge, right. absolutely no knowledge of what what Ben Studio was working on then or anything that might have happened. I just don't know. But here's what right. I do know: yep. is that I wasn't fired because days gone too got didn't get greenlit and so i walked i mean nothing like that happened right it was that more was not the case it was pure coincidence okay okay and so what do you think about the and, and i level this accusation at sony as well and i don't do it in a mean way i think maybe it sounds like we agree which is you know a lot of people say um and jason's article points to he's kind of walked it back a little bit but that the Sony of old that a lot of people came up and are in love with right now, which is great quality titles, of course, from Santa Monica, Naughty Dog, what have you, but also this stable of really creative, different, weird, interesting, uh, you know, Sony Japan shutting down, Ben Studio is not what it was, and there's a whole bunch of people speculating what it is now, whether it's called Naughty Dog North, or whether you guys are, not you guys, but they're making a new game. But, I mean, you would agree, though, that out of necessity, you would agree that Sony has changed and has become a more conservative company in terms of what they greenlight, and you would agree out of necessity. That's... I don't, I don't agree with that. You don't agree? Don't but agree you just that. said that earlier. You just said it earlier. No, I didn't. What I said was... That not not making, politically, not making, politically conservative. No, no, no. I'm saying if you're making $150 million games, they, more, have, to yep. be, they, have, to be, uh, they have to appeal to a wide audience. You're not going right. to be able to make... Dude, they just they just published uh, Kojima-san's game, which is pretty esoteric. Yeah, and, and that, but the know, rumor the rumor is just a rumor that Jim Ryan said no thanks to the next one, and he's negotiating with Microsoft. Maybe I don't know. So but, again, right. but give give them props. I give for giving them, it a chance. I give them tons and of props. I know, and I know Shannon looks at all sorts of small independent games. Not anymore. And I know Sh and I know Scott and Shu are both huge fans. I agree. Shu has championed so many small esoteric games that. You know, yeah, honestly, but a lot of them just never made any sense to me. And these games get made, they get published, yep. they get pushed. In fact, he just released one on Twitter that I had never heard of. I just saw it on his Which feed one? today. I don't remember the name of it. I'd have to go look. But, dude, I disagree. I think that Sony but makes we're, all kinds of Okay, games. but we're talking about very different things, though, right? You're talking about big blockbuster well, games. No, 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 no. Listen, so uh, Shu has been moved to indie, where I think you're absolutely right. That's where he shines. And I think it's great he's in that position. Scott yeah. Rohde sat in his in his office with me and told me one of his favorite games of all times is Sound Shapes, and it infuriates him yes. that it didn't sell better. I'm not I'm not I'm not uh, accusing these guys of not having the bona fides, right? I'm I'm saying that as new leadership has come in, Herman Holtz, Jim Ryan, who I don't have any ill will towards, but because they're sitting there and going, we're not Sean Layden era anymore. We're not you know we're in an era now where these games are 150, certainly more. 
we have to add, we, we have to turn up the dial that says mainstream appeal has to rule the roost when you're spending that much money. And in that, that they have to make more conservative decisions is what I'm saying. I don't think dreams was a conservative decision. Isn't that old though? They're not making that now. Are you telling but, me? Are but you it telling was in me? development all the time the days gone was. Yeah, I mean, but okay, that, but I'm talking since Jim Ryan and Herman Holst have been saying things since. I, dude, so again, I haven't been at Sony since that happened. It's like Herman took over. I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure it oh, happened okay. after I left. Okay, so when you right, left. So I honestly okay. don't know. Okay, that's it, fair. Well, certainly while I was there, that was yeah. not the case. Oh, I agree. If like you're, they, yeah, were, yeah. They, were, they, were willing to, they were willing to roll the dice. My, my, um, my guess, pretty big, yes. Pretty big franchise. My guess is Dreams and Ghost, Death Stranding are probably two of the biggest uh, pieces of evidence those guys used, or at least one of those guys used, to allow themselves to sort of be in the position to say, I know how to do this better. Because the great thing yeah, about I, Shu and the great thing about Rhodey was they would, they would green light. I mean, they green light, drawn to death. It was a disaster. The biggest failure of my career. But they also green lit, um, you know, The Last of Us and Spider-Man. You have to roll those dice. And I think people's fear is with Sony right now is, is you know, they're not going to be able to roll them as freely out of necessity of the, the economic situation. But I mean, we'll see what they do. I just don't know, dude. So yeah, okay. again, my just but responding to it in the context of Schreier's article, uh, you know, his, his narrative is that yes, they're consoli They're getting rid of smaller studios or consolidate on the surface. That may be true. I don't know. You right, know again, right. I, it's like, I, I'm really good friends with Mike Mumbauer, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what happened that whole thing with him happened a year after just I was so you gone. guys know mumbauer was the the vas he was head of VST. VSG. so that was the visual visual arts and services group which right. is you know their team did all of our mocap for days gone and right. and golden abyss and retribution so and, and they've been around forever and so the article was about team. the tension between vasg bend and naughty dog right yeah. So that, so again, I don't, I don't have any inside information on yeah, any of that. Fine. it could yeah. be accurate. It may not be so, but, but, it, but again, it feels like, the narrative Schreier is making is that, you know, Sony's fucking up by getting rid of the creative talent at their independent studios and forcing them all to become, you know, to work on these, on these bigger franchises. I don't know that to be true. Right. Fair enough. And even, and I think even as you and Jeff sort of concluded, if I remember right, um, even if it is true, it's probably not the wrong thing to do. No, <laughs> you know, they've I, got, I, yeah. They've I, got plenty of other studios doing independent work that can yeah. make really creative games that is, you know, they're not risking a hundred million dollars on. Right. I, I, I think the thing people don't know is, is are they, and, and again, this is Sony's fault for being, you know, uh, you know, fucking, you know, submarine radio silent. I mean, they're not saying anything, which is fine. That's their right. Maybe they don't think there's any value to saying anything, but ultimately I think the fear people have is that all we're going to get now is the concert, not conservative politically, but the more safer stuff and the Sony that we came up with that we love is gone. And I would say if I was betting on it, I'd say you're probably right. I don't think they're never going to make something weird and wacky, but I think that DNA is probably better chased at other companies now out of economics necessity. But, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. We don't know that. We don't know that. But, right? I, you know, I, it's not for lack of trying though, right? So again, giving Sony credit, because I've worked on some of these platforms, yeah. you know, a handheld device that could do a game like Golden Abyss mm -hmm. is Which an amazing great. investment right. in, you know, in trying to do something innovative and the same thing with the, the PSVR. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, you know, on the technology side, they've always been yeah. pushing and pushing and pushing and trying to help, you know, developers do, do amazing things for, you know, for gamers. So okay. I, you know, I don't think that's going to change. Right. Okay. Fair enough. You know enough. what I mean? Because they're a hardware company as, as much as they are a, a game company. So I think that I'm actually, you know, and again, I do, I just, you know, it's not just your audience, but it's audiences in general. We live in an era where everybody's got a fucking opinion about everything and they can and share it. Yeah. And they're going to share and they're going to share it loudly. Right. So of course we have a huge, uh, you know, a huge group of gamers who think Sony's fucking up and you know, oh, the good days are gone. Dude, I, I remember, because I'm a huge comic book nerd, and I remember back in the 70s when, you know, when Marvel let Jack Kirby go, and he went to DC, right. and, it, and you know, and again, it was all done, there was no internet, and so it was all done through letters, Letter, pages, yeah, and, they would that's only, right. and they would only publish the ones that they wanted to, but even so, I remember talking to people at Comic-Con and stuff, and, and they'd be like, 
yeah, Marvel's fucking up and is never, never going to do anything good ever again. And it's like these things come in cycles that never end. Right, right. Dude, how about how about the, the reception to the end of uh, Game of Thrones? Those guys couldn't win no matter what they did. No, right? that's right. But, so I mean, the writers of that, it's like no matter what they did with that ending, because I didn't hate the ending, but I know a lot of people did. A lot of people did, uh, yeah. And, what what could they have done? Because there was nothing they could do that would please everyone, and there and you yeah. now have a vocal feedback loop with your audience, right? That gives them somehow. Well, and there's you know the you funny know, part some is saying like, what you're doing. Yeah, the Snyder Cut thing, the the sort of famous trope or story now is that you know yeah they released the Snyder Cut, but only forty three percent of people finished it. It's like you said you wanted it, <laughs> but you didn't really stick around for it. So it, 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 it is, I imagine it is tough. I haven't, I haven't finished it, full disclosure. Yeah, I, I finished it. I liked it. I didn't love it. But um, okay, what do you, I want to talk about real quick, and then I want to get to some questions if you're okay with that. Are you good on time? Well, you said that a half hour ago, but sure. Okay. Because um, you're interesting. Go fuck yourself for being interesting. You have the Sony problem, which is they made all this great goodwill and fans, and then they're like, you know pardon me for being interested in your fucking life. Listen, <laughs> listen, um, I want to talk about ageism. I just turned 50 the other day. You're, yeah. I think what? 59, 60, 61 in that realm. I'll be, I'll be 61 in two weeks. Okay. So, I mean, do you find either a, when, when I was reading next gen magazine and I was probably 25, Steve race, who was the guy, if you remember who kind of did Sony PlayStation America, he had this quote that stuck with me where he was like, you know, this is a making games is a young man's game is what he said. And I was young at the time. So I was like, okay, good. Well, I'm in a good position, but as I've moved through it and, and a lot of it is like you're saying about your books, people say, Jaffe, why aren't you making games? Well, I still might make a game, but I love the control I have. The control I have now is very similar to the control Alan Becker gave me and Scott Rohde gave me and Kelly flock gave me where I don't want to have to, you know, sing for my supper every day where the supper singer person I have to sing to, I don't know what you call them, um, the, is marketing. And then it's PR. And then it's uh, Jim Ryan's roundtable star chamber of executive green light committee. I just, I like that I can wake up and go, hey, can I get Jeff Garvin on? Cool. Here's the thumbnail. Let's fucking go. Right. There's, it, I don't know if that's ageism so much as we just came up with a very different understanding of what it meant to be involved in video games. But do you find as you get older, you don't feel there's a place for you anymore or do you not, you're not feeling that? You know, I am not feeling that. And only because again, I stepped away because I needed to. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, and you know, to be perfectly honest, I've actually reached out to a few people just the last couple of weeks because okay. You know, I finished the Carl Barks book, which was this big, you know, 300 page hardback. that I've Do you have on one you can years. show people? Because I've seen yeah, it. Yeah, let, uh, let me let me grab it. Let real me. Quick. Yeah. So, Jeff, I'll give you the recap. He can correct me if I'm wrong. He, he's editing and writing books. This is his newest book, which is a beautiful hardcover book on the cartoonist uh, Carl Barks. I think his name was who worked at Disney. He left Disney and said, fuck you motherfuckers when Disney was treating their employees shitty. And he went to work on the comics of, uh, the, were they the gold key comics? They became the gold key comics or no? Yeah, they were Dell originally, but then they okay. became gold key. Okay. And, and this was they, uncle Scrooge. He created he, uncle Scrooge. Yep. Right. Okay. So, so, it, so anyway, long story short with my relationship with Carl Barks, he was this famous comic book creator. Um, he worked in comics for 40 years, thousands and thousands of pages all anonymously that's the other thing we haven't talked about so this is this is one of the things i would probably ding sony for is the fact that nobody knows who the fuck i am well <laughs> you know, that's because people because are telling me i was me, never able to put my name right. on the shit that i created people so are I telling always, me i'm calling you jeff so you know i get you guys mixed whatever. up don't you guys always get mixed up jeff and john the no name? because he's prettier than i am okay fair the, enough. uh right. so but but you know i always because kojima san was working on metal gear the same time i was working on siphon Okay. Richard Hamm and I were doing Siphon at the same time. Okay. He was a household name. We were anonymous. Yes. And I remained anonymous throughout my career because it is kind of one of the policies. And so I'm sure there are Sony PR people right now watching this. Oh, yes. Hello. This saying, Hello. Right. And they're like resentful as fuck that I'm on here able to, have, you know, because I'm under NDA. Do I haven't said anything that breaks right. that? But it's, you know, but they want, like you said, it's radio silence. They want complete control. They do not want creators like me right. out there talking about my creation. My understanding is they hated me. They did they, not like me at all, is what I understand. Yeah, but yeah I'm with yeah, you. Well, I'm sure they're not a huge fan of me either, for, yeah. for similar reasons. Fuck, but go fuck yourself. Hey, hey, Sony PR, 
I know you have a hard job. Okay. <laughs> Give me one moment, John. I, J- John, I got to talk to these guys. Sonny PR, I know you have a hard job. I appreciate it. Um, and I know you can't react to every fart in the wind because there are things you respond to. And th- you're right. The best case is when you speak with your work, with your games. Okay. But number one, um, you're, you're, you guys are operating off a 2012, 2013 playbook. Okay. Your fans, they don't expect full disclosure, but you hadn't said anything. And you guys got a big fucking punch in the face for the last couple of weeks and you're not saying shit. So guess what? It's not going to make any difference yet. But eventually, if you guys keep this radio silence bullshit up, they're going to start to wonder and it could eventually hurt you guys. So just kind of wake up. Also, sorry, I caused a pain in the ass when I was there, but what am I going to do? <laughs> All right, John, go. All right. So back to Carl Bark. So yeah. anyway, he uh, I was a fan of his from the time I was 17 years old. So I found this book back in 1977. Barks had retired. And when he retired, he started doing the paintings that I'm, I'm about to show you. But then Disney gave him permission to do disney paintings and that okay. was in 1971 oh, okay. and that's what kind of like made him famous it's like he, he, he was starting to become well known in the comics world um starting in the late 60s but then when he started doing all of these paintings that are now worth literally four or five hundred thousand dollars a piece that he was selling for 150 bucks what were they paintings of from disney donald like, duck donald Uncle Scrooge, okay. the covers of his old comics and so on so when he retired, he, he was still in, Cal- in Southern California, but in the early 80s, he moved to Grants Pass, Oregon, which was 20 minutes from where I lived. Oh, wow. And I, was okay. re- and I was really good friends with the bookstore owner in Grants Pass who called me and said, you never guess who just came into the shop. It's Carl and Gary, because Gary, his wife, read uh, Harlequin Romances. And so they would come in and buy uh, stacks of these novels. Right. So anyway, through them, I managed to meet him. And it was just kind of serendipity. It's like this dude who, because at the time I had been doing Barks, copies of Bark's paintings okay. for five years. And that he's he suddenly he moved, you know, a few miles away. So I Cop- wrote in, copies uh, meaning you'd been just learning to draw like him? What do you mean copies of Bark's paintings? Literally copies. I was a painter. So I was okay. teaching myself to paint in oils and got it. using canvases and so on. So anyway, over the next ten years I got to know him really well. Okay. Blah blah blah. So but I had been interested in him, collecting stuff from him. And then and again, this is kind of I guess one of the perks of, of being a director at Sony is, you know, 10, 20 years ago, I couldn't afford shit, but 10 years ago I could because, you know, you're making enough money and you can buy stuff. And I just ended up getting all this material from when, so when Barks died in 2000, I told you he was 99 years old. Right. He had been working every day of his life for all of that time. Most of it anonymously. Um, But he did all these paintings before he became uh, the Disney painter. And that's what's collected in this book. So, this is to get back to your point about being able to do a thing that is all you. So this book I put together, I wrote it, I directed it, I art directed it, I did the book layout, I did the book design, I worked with the printer on the slipcase, um, which has got this awesome Guelph stamping. I did the uh, I did the dust jacket. That's yeah, beautiful. It's fucking beautiful. Yeah, right. Um, and the book is like you know it's huge, and it's got it collects like literally every painting that Barks did wow. from. 1966 to 1971 and all of his drawings. And I wrote, uh, and this is what I worked on most, the, most of the year after I left Sony, I wrote 30 separate essays. Oh, for wow. For the book. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, just short little essays about important paintings and, you know, the progression of, you know, what he was doing and the work he was doing and, you know, the introduction and just, you know, so it's kind of a, it's a chronicle of how Barks went from, the Disney duck artist working for comic books to becoming a full-time painter. Right. This was a transition period where he was figuring out who he was as an artist. Okay. So anyway, that's this book, but you know, so to me it's important for a couple of reasons. It's because it's a book I've literally been working on for yeah. 20 years, but then I got to spend an entire year doing this thing. And you know, to your point, I didn't have to answer to anybody. It's, yeah. It's a joy. It's a fucking I had a, joy. I had an editor and right. he rewrote me. <laughs> but, right. Uh, but, you know, everybody needs an editor. Right, that's right. But it was just, you know, it, it's like if I had the chance to work for a publisher and I'm part of a team and I'm going to be like, hey, you know, you have to work with a writer. And it's, it's like, nah. In fact, I did that. I did that for the uh, Days Gone art book. I don't know if you've I looked at that it. or no. have it. No, Amazing book. Okay. 
because it's not just concept art. It's also, you know, I put comments and from the design team. Right. And it's a kind of a, it's, it's a, again, it's a running commentary of the development of Days Gone as well as just the art. Okay. So again, I thought that book was really well done, but it was done by committee. So right. I didn't have nearly as much fun doing that as I, as okay, I did. Okay. So, but you're saying you've been reaching out the last few weeks back to game companies. So do you miss it? Do you want to get back into directing games and writing games? Yeah, because yes, because I, Okay, so I, I just finished a novel, so we haven't talked about that yet. Okay. So, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things I could do over the next few years. And there's something, you know, I loved writing this novel. It was, it was uh, you know, a lot of people say they hate writing. I don't hate writing. I, okay. hate, uh, I hate rewriting. I okay. hate having to revise and revise until something's right. right. But that's part of game development, too. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, I don't I do firmly believe that storytelling... Um, storytelling in the medium of games is different and more powerful than it is in novels. Okay. Than it is in film or television. I think that there is a medium there. I'm, I know I'm not going to convince you. I'm, I'm not. I, I think. It, okay, go ahead. I just think it is. I think it's a way. I think that there is a generation of gamers coming up who want to be immersed in a compelling story while they're playing the game. And when I've heard you say this, in fact, I heard you in the early stages when you were developing drawn to death, you were, you were saying like you would never work on a God of War ever again because fuck story driven games and narrative driven games. And I want it to be pure action. I want it to be like a pure arcade game. No. Cause you did another game too, before Drown to Death. It was uh, the car. Calling game. all cars. Calling all cars. Yeah. Maybe it was when you were developing that. What it was, here, what here's it was. what it was. When I finished God of War, my response to it was uh, I didn't feel the medium was capable yet to deliver the same kind of emotional resonance that you got even from a simple emotional cookie commercial. Like there's a cookie yeah. commercial that airs every Christmas and it makes me cry every Christmas. And I'm like, that that's like a, a, a 17 second spot. And we spent millions of dollars and three years of our lives made a 12 hour game. And the emotional resonance of that game isn't as strong as is this over here. So I started going more down the road of saying, if we are to be able to achieve great storytelling in games, it's not gonna come from cutscenes. It's gonna come from somehow figuring out how to marble in uh, that narrative and that resonance of, of philosophy and emotion into the interactive space. And you've touched on it a little bit where you're talking about, you know, uh, the lumberjack with the pancakes. That's there not just to be a visual marker, but it's there to kind of ground you in the world. So when you keep coming back to it over and over, you begin to have a relationship with this place. So I agree with you, it's possible, but I but don't know a, how to do it. But there's a, I don't think that's possible, not on the level that you're talking about. You, there's a word you haven't used yet. And I, and I think it's the most important word when we're talking about narrative in anything. And that word, and by the way, th I learned this very, very late in development. I didn't, okay. it, I was aware of it, but not consciously. Uh, that word is emotion. And you hear it all the time if you do a lot of, you know, I listen to a lot of screenwriting podcasts from some very good writers. And, you know, every game that I played, looking back on it, the ones that have impacted me the most and the ones, and the moments in Days Gone that I think are the most effective are the ones that make the player feel something. And you can't, you know, it's like you can look at a, you know, giant statue of a, of a lumberjack dude and some pancakes and laugh and you can say, oh, that's interesting. But you're not going to fucking cry at that. What takes... To get people to feel emotion, they, they, you have to invest them in the characters, and then you have to put the characters in a situation where you care, and then bad shit has to happen and make you go, oh, uh, and dude, I don't know how to do that without cutscenes. Right, fact, so, then every game, so why not just every keep game writing I've books? Seen, every, game, but every game that I've seen that tries to do it without cutscenes fails. Because you're not, you know, and I'm going all the way back to get, you know, like a what was it? Half-Life that allow you to move the camera and look at whatever the fuck you wanted while, right. the, you know, while the, but that game was mostly about plot. It really wasn't about, about emotion. So, right. you know, when you're looking at, so I think that they're, they're like, here's a good example that the opening of the last of us, I thought was, was pretty, pretty effective in terms of what I think of as, is what good storytelling is all about for video games. It's like, you have a shortcut scene, but then you give control of the character in a limited way so that you can see for yourself how, you know, isolated Sarah was, mm -hmm. And how you know alone, and then the and then again the cutscene though of where her dad shows up, and then the guy breaks through the glass. 
you couldn't do that real time because if you did, the cam the players looking at this thing on the ground over here because players you can't give control right. of the camera but to the you're, player. But you're advocating for a world where it is a you know pastiche or a, a collage of you cut know cutscene action cutscene right. And what I, and what I'm saying is as long as that road keeps being the road keep people travel down you're going to get a disconnect. I literally think, and maybe Sony should fund a study, although they shouldn't because they're making tons of money with your formula, um, <laughs> that the, the, there's different parts of the brain that are, are, are engaged when you're watching a story versus you're playing a game, right? And I played a game recently from a company, I think they were from Taiwan, called uh, Devotion, uh, which was like a four-hour first-person horror game and it was very emotional. And it was it's all about the love a father has for his daughter and all about how him and his wife, who are estranged because she thinks the way the daughter should be brought up and, 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 and dealt with her illness is different. And it's incredibly interesting, the fact that none of it is told through cutscenes. It is all told hmm. through living in that space. And for can me, you send me a link to that? I'd like to check that out. Yes, you can only buy it off there. It's called Red Candle Games. You can only buy it off their website because it was banned in China and then Steam won't sell it. Good old games won't sell it. Consoles huh. won't sell it because the game had a little tiny piece of image, a little JPEG uh, that made fun of uh, the president of China calling him Winnie the Pooh. And so that was enough to make everybody say, oh, yes, Master China, whatever you need, we won't carry the game. But they said, fuck it, we're selling it ourselves. One of the best games. Yes, I will send you a link. Absolutely. No, dude, I totally get you. I mean, I think that if uh, if, if games, you know, because I think AI has a ton of potential. Absolutely. For the ability to do what you're asking, yes. which is create it, create an emotional experience that isn't pre-canned. That's right. Really, is essentially what you're saying. And we need to, so Ken I Levine's if, the only uh, guy I know working happen, on it. That would be amazing. Yes, but I we're not working. That. Why aren't you? Why isn't Neil? Why isn't Corey going? We're going to take our talent and we're going to, you know, lay the bricks of, you know, it's kind of like you talk I about. Don't, I don't think the technology's there yet. Yeah, but at least we can sort of start. The only, you know, we can talk about David Cage with a lot of different uh, modifiers, but Ambitious was Ambitious. a good one. Because <laughs> even though he was doing it pre-canned, he was like, I want to try to make something where the story wraps around me. And in yeah. that, I think that's pretty cool. But okay, I got I got it. I got it. I want to take yeah. some calls. Uh, let's do it. Let's do some calls. Okay, so I'm going to bring these in. Some of these have been screened. Some of these have not. And then I will be moving over to the Super Chats, which I very much appreciate. Um, but yes, I will send you. Dude, so I'm a noob. What is a Super Chat? So it's a, it's a, okay. So if you, if you're watching Are these people that give you money to have you be special to them, no, that's, <laughs> that was my parents. Um, the, uh, no. So what it is, is usually when I do my streams, I do get super chats, which are people pay. So the chat, uh, has a big prominence. So I notice it because you have a lot of people in the chat, but yeah. more, but in, I never only, a lot of people will only answer super chats. I answer everything. But in interviews like this, obviously, if someone's paying to talk to you, I want to Got give it. their, you know, I want to give their, uh, uh, you know, their uh, respect in that way. But let's Got bring it. on some callers. This is, uh, you are on with Brolov. Brolov, you are talking to Johnny Garvin. Maybe. All right. Uh, I, I hear him. You hear him? Well, hang on. I hear him. Well, now I, I hear him. We, we, we did all these tests. You hear Brolov. I do hear Brolov. Motherfucker. How do you hear Brolov? Okay, I got it. I got it. Let me fix this. Motherfucker. We had this all worked out. <laughs> we did a test yesterday. I got it, though. Hang on. Output device probably needs to be... Um, yeah. Let's try default. Okay, bro, bro, say something, Brolov. So he's he's yeah, asking. Yeah, uh, just keep keep going. He's yeah. asking a question about the Karl Marx book, actually. So he's a huge fan of uh, Don Rosa, who, by the way, I am as well. Um, can you hear me, Rolo? Okay, good. Um, so the book is available. You can buy it on Amazon right now, and, and uh, or, or you can buy it from, from my website. website. The, problem the problem with shipping, shipping to Europe is, is um, it, you know, you know because, because I didn't publish it in Europe, Europe, it's very expensive. So you know, the book costs sixty five bucks, and it costs. 
you know, 65 bucks to mail it to, you know, pretty much any country in the EU. So super expensive postage. Sorry about that. There's nothing I can do about it. There is no plans to bring it out in um, from any publisher like Egmont or anybody in Europe currently, but that, that could change. Okay. Yeah, right. I was going to ask if you talk to Egmont, but that's uh, fine to know. I, that. I have then talked to Egmont in important. the past about, about other projects. So, you know, again, if they reach out to me, I'd be more than happy to publish it in Europe. Okay, thank All you. Right, thanks, man. Thank you. I, I got it working. A uh, guy in the chat's like, Jaffe, you're not in the room. I'm like, oh, fuck. And then fuck, <laughs> fuck you, uh, Giselle. He's like, this is so cringe. Go fuck yourself, motherfucker. You try to balance this shit. All right, here we go. This is uh, Merkham. Merkham, you're on with Johnny Garvin. Go. Hello. Yep. Um, you, uh, John made an appearance on the test of season three, episode three, the episode where Ego Raptor got sent home. Yes. Now, a lot of people thought that the reason why he got sent home was a bull BS reason. So was it planned to send him home, send him home the whole time? Can you tell him why he or, got sent home? Because no one, uh, people might not know. He got sent home because there was a contest um, where I, if I remember this right, where you had to take watermelons and put them in a giant sling and you had to like knock some things over with her or whatever. And Eagle yeah. Raptor was one of the first ones to figure out how and instead of staying around and showing the next person on his team how he just immediately took off so uh, dude, it's, it's kind of a mix of both so he ego raptor and again dude this i was there for one episode uh -huh. i don't know any i'm not a huge expert on that show um i was a huge fan of it which is why uh, you know i pressured my producers to get invited on um yeah. but i you know it's like no it's like uh he was he was he was let go for legitimate reasons so and it wasn't planned no, it wasn't planned. But don't forget that also he was so Eagle Raptor. I, if I remember this right, he was a guest on the show because he had he had won a popularity contest online. He's like a famous online. Yeah, he did. Yeah. So he was sleeping on the couch. There wasn't even a real place for him in the tester apartment. So it was kind of he was kind of there on a shoestring anyway. Um, so I don't think anybody was was really sorry to see him leave the show. But it wasn't like prescripted or anything. No. Okay, I got one more question. Is that okay? Yeah, one more. Um, do y'all deliberately leave like the day one patch out the game so y'all can like so the game won't be like re replayable in the future when the servers go off? And why don't y'all yeah, you know, release so the game? What's weird about I've seen this theory online, and I put this up there with conspiracy theories like, "Hey, if I get inoculated, is Bill Gates going to be able to control me?" Dude, it's yeah. just no, it's not true. It's like they, you know, so I I know this for a fact, and even though I'm not on the tech side of things, I absolutely know for a fact they do not patch the game so that you can't resell the disc. I just know that to be true. So that I don't know where these where these conspiracy theories come from, but I don't know where that one came from, but it's absolutely not true. All right. Thanks. Well, why don't y'all release the game in the future like with all the data on the disc? Is that too much to ask or what? The reason why games get patched is because there are issues. So, you know, to be perfectly honest, I and again, I'm not on the tech side. Get priest reason to come on this show. Right. I think that one of the reasons they added data on Days Gone was to improve frame rate. Because as you were streaming the world in, and what happens is you have so many packets that you can get in in a row, one way to fix that is to create a smaller grid of data, and then you can put more, you know, break the data up in a way that streams faster. So yeah. I'm kind of sure that that was part of the reason I, more data was added. But I'm I, not think, I think what sure. he was asking that the last part was, um, why not, after you've done all your patches, release a new disk? But ultimately, that's very expensive. Uh, if, if, if you take a year to get all your patches and the game's officially done, you've burned through your marketing, you've burned through your relationship with Target for that one game. You're not going to, there's it's no possible, though. Yeah. I would argue, I don't know for sure, but I would bet that if when they release the PC version of Days Gone, that that has all the data. Right. I'm right? sure that, you, that there's not going to be a patch that right. adds more data. So, you know, it's just. No, there is there is a suspiciousness that a lot of people have about these companies. Part of it is just you know, the companies bring it upon themselves. Part of it is just sort of companies aren't what they used to be, right? They, you know, loyalty to companies, understandably, all, a lot of people come up watching their parents get laid off from companies that weren't supposed to be, they were supposed to be get pensions and all that shit. So I get, I get why there's suspicion, but yeah, those conspiracies are out there. It's like, I, I hear them all the time. Like they really think there are people in back rooms going, let's fuck the customer. Uh, another one that I hear a lot is Sony is forcing their developers to be, uh, progressive and, and, and sort of social justice warrior, but you didn't get any pressure, did you, from from your game? Absolutely not. No. Yeah. Again, and I, I did an interview um, earlier 
this year um, for a game magazine in uh, Ireland of all places. And they were asking other questions. You know, you brought up ageism and we didn't really kind of finish that discussion, but right. it, you know, it's like, well, did you feel discriminated against because you're, because I am, I was like, when I was at Ben Studio, I was by far the oldest dude there. Right. And I never felt that way ever. So, you know, and I think that, uh, that, you know, Sony is one of the most inclusive companies there is. I, so I agree. I've, I never felt any pressure to be anything other than, what I am. But, you know, to, to be fair, though, I don't think any company embraces people who are dicks. Right. You know, right. or, uh, you know, they wouldn't embrace racism or misogyny or anything like that because yeah. you want everybody to feel comfortable. So, yeah, I think so. I, 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 I complain a lot recently about some of Sony's decisions, but I have always said, you know, what a, you know, a company's just people and, and not all of them. But my God, they, it was such a wonderful company to work with. They're just really good yeah. people, you know, genuinely. Yes, they are. Absolutely. Um, okay. This is, uh, uh, this is Ricardo Estevez. I am bringing in, uh, to talk to you. Wait, maybe in a second I am. Hang on. Uh, there we go. So okay. this is interesting. So you had literally have to drag them in one at a time. And that's how we can talk. Time. I have, I have right. no producer, baby. It's all, it's all Jaffe. It's all Jaffe all day. Um, okay. This actually, let me bring in Bruz first. This is, uh. This is Bruce Wayne. Go, buddy. Bruce Wayne, you're on with Johnny Garvin. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, uh, so I wanted to ask uh, John, um, why Days Gone didn't have like a season pass? Like for other Sony exclusives like Spider-Man and um, Horizon Zero Dawn, there's a season pass with DLC that expands the story somewhat to the original game. So I was wondering if that was like a design de decision or if there was plans for that or something like that you mean why was it why was there no story content why, for days, why, for why days wasn't there like a season pass dlc story thing that expands a game i think um so again dude this is just my opinion and i left sony six days after the game shipped so i wasn't there but i do know for you know i know because i saw the content come out that they supported that game like crazy over that following summer i how many how many different expansion packs came out they had all kinds of but they were all they were all gameplay based which i think was the right call you know because the uh you know because number one i wasn't there so I, you know i don't know how they would have done more story content without me but number two the gameplay was just you know i think they had really honed in on you know some of the bike challenges and some of the combat challenges um and that stuff was all super well received so i can't answer your question about uh, the game pass side of it. I'm not actually honestly sure what that means, but I do know they did release a bunch of content. It was all free, by the way. Um, and they supported the game, you know, for three months after it came out. Okay, did cool, man. Oh, go ahead. Go did, ahead, John. I was just going to ask, did you play any of that stuff or no? Uh, yeah, I played um, a, a lot of it, but like, I was like thinking about like an actual, like, like, maybe six hour long, for example, a campaign, side campaign or something like that. Like, but DLC in Days Gone is like, you know, free cosmetic stuff. So yeah. that's a little different. Well, like, I, you know, I'm sorry, but again, I wasn't there. So I honestly don't know what decision making went into why they didn't do more content like that. Um, I just don't know. Okay, this is um, Death the Rasmanian Devil. <laughs> All right, go, buddy. You're on. With uh, by John. the way, I'm feeling really guilty that my name on here is John Garvin what? instead of <laughs> oh. instead of something crazy. <laughs> oh well, you know, I mean, you know, yeah. Well, mine's Jaffe, I think. What's up, Def? What's going on? You're on with John. All right, so I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, seeing as how both of you have been uh, at you know in house with Sony before, and John more recently. Do you think, because I've heard this online a lot, do you think there is a censorship bias within Sony? What do you mean by censorship bias? Well, to give a more recent example that I can think of, in Devil May Cry 5, they specifically censored Trish during a scene because it showed her ass, right? But then you have The Last of Us 2, which came out around the same time, and there's a full-on sex scene with Abby, and there's no problem with that, no censorship whatsoever. Uh, just real to be clear, I haven't I haven't gotten to that point with Abby. Is there nudity uh, in the Last of Us, or is it just a sex yes. scene? Okay. I, I you know so I no there is as far as I know there's no censorship bias. I never saw that. Um, I had the opportunity. Well, well, early on in Days Gone, there was full nudity in Days Gone, 
there was a scene where uh, where Ricky gets you know gets naked and jumps into the reservoir to repair the dam. There was a scene with you know, again spoiler. Well, no, I'm not going to say this because you haven't played it. Um, you probably haven't gotten to the Ricky scene either, so I shouldn't worry about spoilers. Don't worry I? about for me. No, no. All right. Regardless, um, it was kind of one of those things where you know we weren't told to take nudity out of the game, but we kind of did. And the reason why is it just kind of felt a little gratuitous. It wasn't important to the story. It wasn't, you know, it's like, I don't know. It was our, it was our call and yeah. uh, it was a call we made and I did not feel any pressure from Sony to do that. Um, and, you know, and to be honest, the things that, uh, that I, you know, there was some questions about was the amount of profanity in the game. Oh dude, so many fucking F bombs. Right. It's like at one point there was a drinking game for Geekin and how many times he says, fuck. Nice. And so I, you know, I knew there like was it, a reason I liked this game. But the thing is, we tested it. Yeah. So, you know, so they were completely willing to like, they had some concerns about the amount of profanity, but we tested it and it came back fine. So, right. I mean, we had literally a 20 person test and not a single one of them had an issue with the profanity. Right. So okay. that put that issue to bed. So, but yeah, no, I, I, I would all go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, well, I was I, just going to say, I don't think it's censorship. I think yeah. it's, uh, again, it's about market concerns in the same sense that, you know, you have rating systems for a reason. And, you know, if you go out with a game that's rated adult AO, you, you you might as well kiss that. That's the kiss of death. That game's not going to sell. They're just, they're, they're, they're places that won't sell it. So even, an, you know, if you can get the game down to a PG-13 instead of an M, that's just more people, more hands playing the game. And that's, right. uh, I think you know, Devil no May Cry, down game. I mean, Devil May Cry was probably an M, but I think the thing you have to understand too is that there are different departments. So whoever was making that decision uh, for Devil May Cry, whether that was Sony or Capcom or both or what have you, has nothing to do with Scott Rohde looking at a game and saying, uh, marketing has come to me and this is a problem. They're, they're totally separate. Um, so yeah. I think you would have to ask the sort of the third party relations of Sony, uh, you know, if there is sort of a censorship mentality. But my guess would be just like with money, uh, you know, Sony, the bigger Sony gets, the bigger a target they are and the more people they can sell to if they don't show Trish's ass, unless there is a real reason they can be, uh, uh, they can explain why they're doing it. Like you probably could with the last of us. I, I, I'm not saying I agree with that, but again, I think a lot of fans are having this kind of whiplash as Sony is becoming like video games version of Disney. And that's not what, Sony made their bones being in a lot of ways. And in that, I think there is this kind of like, wait, that's why, you know, that's not Sony. Sony's all this crazy shit. Why can't we see Trish's ass? It's like, well, they're not that anymore. They're more conservative company, not, not thematically, but all right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the call, buddy. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, orbital nomad. You were on with good sir. Johnny go orbital. Speak. Hello, I had two questions. Okay, go. Yeah, yeah. I had two questions. They're industry related. Go. go. So, uh, the biggest challenges that uh, you had working in industry, um, whichever was more accomplishing for you. So, you're asking what was the biggest challenge that had the big, that had the biggest, that felt like the biggest accomplishment? Well, yeah, like which, what was the, like, this is kind of twofold, like which challenges that you incurred while you're working in industry that you found most accomplishing? It's the most accomplishing that I don't quite understand, but let what, me take What are you most proud of that you've done in the industry? Yeah. That was also the most challenging? Sure. Hmm. Super good question. And the kind of question that I really suck at. Um, I think, uh, I, you know, to be... It, I think, let me just put it this way. I think the, uh, the game probably that I, that I'm the most proud of is the original siphon filter. And only because it was done by a team of like 12 guys and, you know, it was built on the Bubsy engine. And, you know, again, for like, we're talking about a video game that was made in the area where, you know, Gabe Logan didn't even have hands. He had boxes. Yeah. Right. And, uh, just the challenge of making that feel right at all. Like Jeff talked about that a little bit on the, on your show with him, but it was just like, you know, we didn't even believe in ourselves a lot in the early stages that like, 
is this cool? Because, you know, Goldeneye had come out, it was a first person shooter and Metal Gear hadn't even come out yet. So there, there wasn't, a, there wasn't anything in that genre yet. And so along with Metal Gear and Goldeneye, I think Siphon is part of that trilogy that kind of invented, you know, the spy action genre. So I think that's that there were so many challenges. Like I told you earlier that I, uh, I work a lot of crunch, always have. Mm-hmm. That was the only crunch that I really resented because we had just moved to Bend oh, and you right. know, I had a young wife and young kids and, and you were never home. You know, they ended up they ended up doing these things we call bunny pillow rides where they would like come to the studio at night so right. I could tuck them in. Yes. <laughs> so yes. I just never saw my family I for understand. like a year. Yeah. So it was, you know, that was tough. It was like that was a crunch that I did not enjoy um, you know, making that game. But, you know, do I regret it? I it's hard to say looking back on it those are that, that's time i probably should have spent with the family and not making siphon filter right but what are you gonna do right right so, okay fair enough fair enough um if i had to do two i would say i love golden abyss it's again that's a golden game abyss that is I, great that's my one of my favorite uncharted it's my second favorite uncharted but, but it's it's just sad we're more uncharted fans haven't been able to play it yeah um you know and again it was kind of one of those games i was super disappointed by because the reviews came out. They were kind of mediocre. We got we got reamed for having, you know, what they called were gimmicks, and it was just us supporting the platform. We were trying to right. make a Vita game and not, you know, a PC game, and so that surprised me and disappointed me. So, you know, some of my beef with the press goes back way further than days gone. Right. I right. poured my heart and soul like everybody else on our team well, into people, that game. Yeah, I people. Was just like, Ugh. People don't understand though when so, and, and it really is kind of shitty. But a lot of times Sony would do these just dumb hardware choices and they've gotten better because I do believe if I remember they brought in developers more on the PS4 and moving forward, but like the dude, bat touch panel or the six dude, okay, axes, this, I'm going to, I'm going to be hundred percent honest with you. Yeah. David. Chris and I were on that development team for PS4. We had all the, no, for Vita, all the developers okay. that, that worked on the Vita had a say in what that hardware was. Okay. So Chris and I were there when it was just some markings up on a whiteboard. And we had, you know, for a year, we were, we talked to the devs from Japan and the hardware guys and, right. you know, Shu and all these guys. And it's like, no, dude, that was a completely dev developed platform. We okay. Well, then I, say. so if you hate the back screen, blame Chris and I, as much as Sony. I, I, because, I don't, I don't dude. hate it. But what I hated was Sony management always saying, okay, now that we've got these features, we need you to use them. Right. Sure. And, 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 but it's like, but it doesn't make any sense to use them. And so in that, I think that's why people felt they felt like gimmicks because, you know, there were e- there are easier ways to communicate with the game than certain things or with the six axis on Warhawk. It's like, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to play yeah. flow by doing this versus this? Right? Dude, but I will I will fight to the death arguing that the that the the gyro controller on the Vita was awesome. Oh, it, was. it made it was. so much better yeah. than than without it. Yeah, some of the stuff might have felt a little gimmicky after the fact, but right. again. Blame that on us, not on the hardware. Okay. You know, because again, it's like I see the narrative out there, which is Sony's fucking up and it's making all these mistakes and forcing devs. It, dude, that's just not the case. At least it was not my experience. It was it's not like, my experience either, but I do think so, that's what it looks like now. I do think that's the case. Part of that's also because Microsoft. wasn't my experience. Mine as well. But Microsoft is also coming on very strong. And I think that maybe is at the heart of a lot of this, which is like people are really emotional about brands which i know marketing loves i know pr loves i think it's incredibly unhealthy i think cooper on radio free oregon would agree with me uh it's incredibly (laughs) dysfunctional but that said though these companies spend insane amounts of money getting you to fall in love with a piece of plastic and and metal and so and that's copeland not cooper well you know what jeff (laughs) listen jeff um, the, 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 the point is, the point is though, uh, is that, you know, I get why if you don't nurture that, uh, relationship that you have spent millions of dollars to build, of course, they're going to start to feel a little bit worried when the competition is making some moves that seem pretty ballsy and scrappy. Okay. This is Abdi is coming on to talk with Johnny, the Garvin Abdi go. What's up, pal? Abdi. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, go. Yep. Hey, um, just want to say Thought Days Gone was super underrated. Incredible game. Uh, good effort. And uh, just a quick question. Actually, a statement. I, I feel like there is a... Um, 
a misunderstanding that uh, gamers who kind of lean right a little bit, I'm not talking far right, I'm not talking racism and sexism and misogyny, but gamers who consider themselves a little far right don't want diversity in games. And I'm kind of on that spectrum. And, uh, you know, I just got to say that I love characters like Ellie. I love characters like Lara Croft. And I, sometimes I feel like... Um, it's kind of one-sided. And then we get a game like Days Gone, which arguably had plenty of diversity. You have, uh, you know, black and Mexican and lesbian and straight and gay and all of it. And then you, you, you start seeing reviews online and it's, oh, another white, you know, I remember reading IGN's review, uh, Deacon St. John, just what we need, another white man. And it's like, you know, just sometimes it just feels a little one-sided. And <clears throat> like I said, I lean right. But I'm not far right. I love diversity in games. I think there's a place for it. And so, you know, I just wanted to get both of your thoughts. Uh, uh, yeah, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we've talked about it a little bit, and I do believe that it has, for Days Gone, I can't speak for the, for the industry as a whole, but for definitely for Days Gone, it was just a question of uh, timing. It was like having, you know, eight hours to get to where the diversity really shows off and having it be a pacing issue where you spend a lot of time with this gruff white dude. And who's, you know, even worse than just a gruff white dude, he's an angry gruff white dude. Um, so I think that there is a, you know, there was a bias on the part of some press, not all, but on some who just didn't give the game enough time, didn't, didn't play it long enough. That would be my argument. My argument for, for press and how to improve the, the press's relationship with developers overall, and it's not all their fault, by the way, because sometimes we give them discs with an, without very much time to play the game the way a normal person would like, you know, press literally has to sit down for eight hours and play the game straight, you know, and you know, if you, I think the a 50 hour experience is more digestible if you're doing it over a week or two weeks rather than trying to get it done in three days. Cause you have a deadline. I know I see you scrunching your face at me, Jaffe, but it just, it feels to me like the, but that, there was that, a way that, to ensure that, that they, that that they sounds, complete the experience. Yeah. But that sounds like a journalist problem, not a developer problem. It's like if your business model is such that you can't deliver a product that's satisfying to your customer because you're basically consuming it too quickly and not the way the end customer will, that's not the guys who make the product's fault. That's Fair the, enough. You but, know. but, okay, that's a stretch. But I would say at the least we have to find a way to ensure that they finish the game. They can't just play part of it and then write the review. So I wish there was a way to ensure that, they, that the publications would find ways to show that their dude... So you really think some of these big sites didn't finish and still made a review? Dude, I have no way of knowing because right. I wasn't okay. there. So I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything libelous or anything, but based on some of the reviews I read, I would argue that, right. that they didn't play the game because they would have known this and this and this right. refutes things that they said that were negatives in the and game. And so, maybe they did, but they had, they liked their narrative better. I mean, they're, in, you know, but I honestly but, don't know. Yeah. My take on it though, just real quick, you were asking both of us. My, my very fast take is that um, I like diversity too. I lean, you know, so far left that my kids say, don't call yourself left. You're progressive. Left doesn't mean what you think it means. But I, I, I am super left and I have no problem with having some white people in fucking games. I like Deacon so far a lot. Uh, I like uh, the fact that Sony has a diverse lineup that you've got their most expensive game is starring women and, the, and lesbians that you've got a game that is starring um, just this kind of white dude that you've got a game that is starring uh, 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 an, a Japanese guy. I mean, they're all, we're all over the fucking place. So I do think it's a little lame for them to push back, but to, I don't know. To be fair though, Days Gone did come out before Ghost and Days Gone did come out before Last of Us 2 and Last of Us 2 did star a white dude with a beard, right? I mean, that was, you played Joel, so, but I, I, I agree. I, I think the diversity is good. This is Random Moose Brains with Johnny Garvin. I'm sorry, no, 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 with Jeff Cooper. Random, you're on. Okay. Hey, John. Just wanted to say thank you. Thank uh, Richard. Thank Jeff for Siphon Filter. You guys rock for that. So I think my question might have been answered a little earlier regarding uh, toning things down. But uh, regarding Siphon Filter Dark Mirror, why was the PSP version rated M and the PS2 version rated T? Was that also a very similar kind of decision? And also, one other little thing. Uh, from your last meeting with Richard, I don't know if you guys knew this, but John Chacon is alive. I do know that, yes. 
and he still has that Gabe Logan sound. I know, right? I think I heard, I heard him on a podcast. They uh, sent me a link to it, and uh, I listened to you. Is that the voice actor? Who is this? So John Chacon was the original voice. So, dude, so the, the issue, I'm just going to touch briefly on John Chacon, on, uh, specifically on your question about Dark Mirror and the differences between the, the PSP and the PS2 version. Dude, I honestly don't remember. I don't... I, I'm going to take your word for it that Dark Mirror was a maturated game. I'm trying to rack my brain saying, why would that have been mature? Probably because of the taser, being able to light dudes on fire, and just the overall level of violence. Headshots, I think, was the thing that got yeah. us into trouble early on with the original Siphon Filter. So maybe it was just that level of violence? Do you remember? Because I don't. there was no nudity in it, and there was I, no uh, there was no language. I know. Uh, the PSP version, if I remember right, has blood and a lot more swearing in it. And the PS2 version has like just ragdoll effects. It's very, I guess you'd yeah, say, so toned pure, down. Purely guesswork. I would, I would, and I'm only guessing because I honestly don't remember. But I would guess that it was because of just trying to reach a wider market. So again, if you have a, you know, you're bringing a PSP game to the PS2 for a reason, and that's just to try to yeah. get, you know, more sales out of the IP. So you've put all this work into it. Reach the widest art, the, the the widest market that you can. I I would say is probably the decision making that went into that, but I honestly don't remember. All right, random. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for everything, bud. Mm -hmm. I will talk to you soon. Um, yeah. So um, also oh, real quick to answer his question about Chacon. Yeah. So dude, Chacon was he was awesome, dude. But he was literally, I don't know if you remember uh, Buzz Burrows and oh, those yeah, guys that were running the Foster City Sound. Yeah, talk this about a, biker was, guys. Buzz, yeah. This was a guy that they brought in off the street. He was a truck driver dude in like in, in the Bay Area, right. if I remember correctly. And he had the perfect voice for it, but you know, but it was really, really hard on his voice right. to get down into that gravelly Gabe Logan register. And it was not an easy it was not his natural voice. He could totally do it. Right. Um, and you know, he wasn't he wasn't sag. So the thing about, you know, why we replaced why we replaced him, honestly, when we moved to to because Sony was transitioning from, you know, guys like uh Darren Yeager, one of my yeah. producers for years, played the voice of one of the pilots on the original Siphon Filter game. Right. We were dragging in people from everywhere to do voice. Yeah. So that changed, though. That I mean, that is, that is a absolute little mirror into what we've been talking about the whole thing, is the more success you get, the less scrappy and the less heart, but that doesn't but mean it be, it's not good. More it, it, yeah, it becomes more professional, right? right? You end up with having like professional actors who sound good because I right. cringe at a lot of the VO in, in Siphon, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, and, there, and there's good with that and bad. There's a guy in the chat, uh, Cyberdyne, says, Jim, widest market Ryan. I mean, some people resent that, but again... You know, Whatever. it's probably, well, I mean, I think as a that's, developer, I want the widest market. I'm I, just going to say that. I, like, I appreciate this is that. not a, this is not an exec thing. This is not a, this is like me as a developer. Yes. Me as a writer. I want to sell the most novels that I can. So I, if I have I a novel that I've written, I get it. I can put, I can choose to put nudity and, and explicit sexuality in my novel, but then it's going to get a tag and it's going to get limited to who can see it on the bookshelves. And that's pure. So it's not. Like every choice you make as a developer or a writer or an artist is going to be about what kind of an audience do you want to reach? That's right. right. And, if, and if you don't care, do do as you will. But I think it's unfair, <laughs> you know, for people online to say, oh, well, you know, why this audience? That's bad. I'm like, nah, it kind of wouldn't exist without that. No, I, I think you're right. I think it's just a communication issue. It's the same thing when you see a band that breaks big. And they're like that they sold out or whatever they you know, it's, it's, it's a real phenomenon, a real psychological phenomenon, but I don't think people understand what's really happening. And so they resent it, but the yeah, success begets a wider audience and Dude, a wider it, audience. But, you get but it, here's the but th they don't get but, it. But if you, but if you have, you know, if you have a, you know, a modern rap band who has an explicit lyric, you know, label on their album, that version is not going to get airplay and they're going right. to, you know, the, the hardcore fans who are going to buy the vinyl, they're going to be able to listen to whatever they have, whatever they want, but they're right. not going to be able to get a wider audience that could experience that. Right. You know, the and they're not, sense and they're not going to get is. a sequel possibly probably to days gone too. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not being silly. I'm saying it, it, that is probably what is happening, which is days gone Two was profitable or days gone. One was profitable. It wasn't profitable enough given the economics of the situation. And so the fans are out there calling for Jim Ryan's head going, what a fucking moron. And I think what you're saying, and I don't disagree with it is it's like, he's not that he's a moron. It's that he's looking at the numbers and going, this is a PS five game now, not a PS four game. It's going to cost more. 
And we, we only got into profitability that was barely satisfactory with Days Gone 1. Don't fucking blame me. I have to keep the lights on, right? You know, dude, the only thing I would say to that is because uh, it's speculation. I don't know. And I was there. I was at Sony for 20 years. Yeah. And, you know, I never had a talk with Tim Ryan about no. finances or profitability. In fact, I, you know, maybe Chris Reese does. I'm pretty sure Chris does. Sure. But it's like, so again, you get him on the show, maybe he'll give you the scoop. But, on Jim, Ryan, really but Jim Ryan has said as much, though. He has said. Okay, but fine. But I don't know. So it's like, I, you know, no, again, we're not, I, we're not I guess, we're talking more about just philosophical ways that art gets uh, like no one came to you and told you with your new book. But you're probably not going to be on the in caps, at least immediately, at uh, Barnes and Noble, right? I mean, because that's not the relationship. Oh, be, a, you inter- be a Debbie, be a Debbie Downer. Dude. I said eventually. I said in, uh, instantly. <laughs> there are those cases like Fifty Shades and stuff that it becomes yeah, that know. thing. But okay, um, pizza deliveries coming in strong for Big Bad, Johnny Garland, Cooper, Fred, Shuhei Yoshida. Go pizza, you're on. Hi, um, I've got a question. If Sony approached you and told you you could work on any previous Sony IP apart from Siphon Filter, what would it be? John, did you hear him? Super, okay. Yeah, no, I heard. I'm sorry. Yeah, super good question. Um, try, like, not one of my IPs, though, right? Just in general? Yeah, so, like, any Sony IP that is, like, not been made for the past, like, five years or so oh dude so you know you're gonna laugh at this but i think uh i think a game that could come out and do really well right now, but there but the but the actually you and jeff talked about this a little bit is socom had such a huge following when it when it yeah. came out it was like always outselling siphon by like two to one i think if i remember right it was just a huge huge thing and you know when seth luisi was running that group and they were you know innovated with the headsets and they had all this cool stuff going on I think a, uh, a, and this is going to make David throw his controller through, a story-driven version of that kind of I game. I like had, story. I like whatever, story. That brought, that instead of having it be focused, the way, the, here's how you compete with Call of Duty, is you don't do the big multiplayer. They've got that covered. Because, you know, Call of Duty's story kind of sucks, in my opinion. And, you know, they've had some, you know, some games that have kind of been pitched or they're going to be coming out that are, you know, like Four Days of Fallujah or whatever. Mm-hmm that are very kind of, I don't know, ultra jingoistic. And I'm, you know, I would like to see a, co- a, a combat game that's based around an individual's experience because there's been some really good movies that have come out. Um, you know, in some ways, even though I don't know, how, I don't know what you thought about uh, Cherry that came out on Netflix not too long ago. Oh, the I Tom think. Holland movie. I didn't see it. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it was, it's, it had its moments, but I think that there's a story to be told about the modern experience of a dude and, you know, who's just on the ground in Afghanistan. He's got, you know, a wife and kids. And I don't know, there's a story to be told there. So to me, there would be, an, you know, there'd be an interesting game that could be set okay. in that sort of high stakes environment. So okay, that's Thank, my answer. Thanks, Pizza. Thanks, okay, buddy. Cool. So uh, I want to speak to that real quick because did you know Six Days in Fallujah was actually in development at Sony Santa Monica for a while? Like we were, we were externally. I public. was at the green light. I was at the green right. light. Meeting. And then they, they moved anytime that game started to really become something that they wanted it to be a real look at war yeah. companies kind of said, yeah, no, thanks, but no thanks. Right. So I don't know what this new one is going to be in terms of, are they going to get there? But, um, the interesting it's a tough one, I mean, because of all the reasons we've been talking, that's about, right. right? You, you, we're, you, in a, yeah. we're in a climate where, man, I just, you're just stepping into a literally landmine, but you're you can make a- it in the indie space for sure. But okay. I want to talk real quick about that guy's caller. So the Sony IP, I mean, do you just think, cause there's so much goodwill out there amongst PlayStation fans for decades of brilliant IP that just is no longer really lucrative. I mean, whether you're talking about twisted metal or whether you're talking about something like to ball number one, these are games that people came up with that meant a lot to them but it doesn't make sense for Jim Ryan to say, here's 180 million, go make a new twist of metal. I get that. But do you just think that's the nature of the beast? Or do you think Sony is being maybe, uh, they could be a lot wiser with how they handle their legacy. Or do you think, what would you have them do? Because they can't green light, you know, $160 million ape escape. I, I don't have the answer to that. I honestly don't know because I do here. I'm, I'm pretty sure they have really smart people that are crunching numbers. Yep. 
and looking at you know social engagement and putting together like viability because it is IP that they own and that it, you know if there was a way to make a profit on it I'm pretty sure they would find a way to exploit it. Yeah. So you know whether you know whether there is I disagree with Jeff by the way because he did say that he didn't think there was anything you could do with Siphon today. Um, I totally disagree with that. I think that the that the spy action genre hasn't been done in a long. It's been a long time since we had a Splinter Cell. And we're probably never going to have another Metal Gear. And the right. you know, and to me, it feels like yeah, no, you totally could do something. Well, with okay, but, technology. but but you know why he said that though? No. Well, you don't. Okay, so the the the, the thing is, we know Kojima is doing a new game. We don't know who he's doing it with. We know it's going to be a spy game, and we know that Jeff is going to work on it. And Kojima likes Jeff better than he likes you. Um, I didn't know that, but I, that would make perfect sense. That's Jeff. Jeff told me he said, "Talk to John and tell John that Kojima likes me more." And I said, "Well, that's true." Oh, is that true? Why does he like yeah, you? Yeah. So Kojima doesn't well, like because you. I, it, it's just a funny story. No, he no, he totally likes me because uh, I, I've talked to him a, a few times. He came up to visit the studio. Okay. Um, but he just, you know, it's like I think he got the wrong-headed notion that Jeff was the Kojima at our studio and not me. Oh, okay, okay. So he kept he's, he he kept calling him my ball-headed friend and. Tell my bald headed friend to come over and see me. <laughs> so, oh, okay, okay, got it. That's what. Yeah, that's I, what. He and thought. I kept trying to have everybody tell him, no, tell him I'm the Kojima at right. Ben Studio, not Jeff. He's like, huh? <laughs> Do you like? Yeah. Now look. Last quick thing on that. Um, uh, uh, SOCOM is interesting because that I always say they should not touch SOCOM because yeah. the fan base is so uh, uh, passionate in all kinds of different ways. You coming in and saying don't even focus on multiplayer, but make SOCOM, some of them are going, that's awesome. And some of them are, are like, are you nuts? That was the best part about it. I think when you have a, a franchise that's been dormant that long, you, it's very rare to yeah. do anything but disappoint. And then you're just Well, kinda, that's probably why I'm no longer at Sony's because I say stupid shit like that. It's not that stupid. It's not players. stupid, but, you know. Um, okay, do you have time? Are you good on time? Can we keep going? I'm good on time. All right, good. So All right. I'm fine for now. Good. I'm going to bring in Parrot. Parrot, go. You're on with John John. Parrot. He just died. Okay, this is um this is Slayer Christ of the uh, Connecticut Slayer Christ. Come on, buddy, where are you? There you go. You're on with John. Slayer, let's go. Hey, what's going on? Not much. John, how's going on, Jack? Hey man. So I just wanted to ask, um, I, I haven't gotten a, play, a uh, chance to play Dan Gone only because I want to play it on the PlayStation 5, as you can see in a second, yada, yada, yada. But, John, after you've done your, you know, your personal project, uh, this, this book it looks absolutely amazing, phenomenal. Do you still have a passion to get back into gaming on some level, whether it be as a consultant or operating your own studio or even a creative uh, direction position? Yeah, I think uh, we were talking a little bit about this earlier. I'm, you know, I've been actually reaching out over just the last couple of weeks just to see, just putting some feelers out there because I have, I am kind of between major projects right now. So um, I do have a novel that I've written that, that may or may not be part of a trilogy. And that's definitely something I could invest the next year in. But, you know, I do miss working in games. I miss having, you know, there's definitely like, uh, like Jaffe, your stream is, I think, a really good example of what's good about the game industry is like, there's a lot of community. There's a lot of fans. It's like, I've got 4,000 people that follow me on Twitter. They ain't following me because of Carl Barks. <laughs> They're following me because the day's gone. Right. So, you know, so there's a, there's a passion there in, um, in the gaming community that I really appreciate. And there's an energy that comes from that, that I really, really miss. So yeah, I, I love working in games, dude, by the way, I still play a ton of games. Like I'm a, what like today, playing? as soon as well, right now I'm playing uh, Path of Exile. I don't know if you've ever played that. It's an action RPG. It's, I know, it's basically, but I've never played it. It's free to play. It's made by this little team, I think, in New Zealand. And uh, they've been work. I was an original beta sponsor of that game back in, like, 2008 or something. Right. And this, they're on their 14th league. They come out with a league every six months. And it's basically a new way to play the game with new mechanics and whatever. Right. And I'll, and I'll sink 170 hours into that nice. because I was a huge Diablo fan. It's a, you know, it's just point and click madness. And it's right. a, it's a, it, you know, it's basically a loot crawl. So a lot of fun. So right. it's like, I love playing games and the, I've never made the kind of, I take that back. I did a game called the uh, Cyberstorm mm -hmm. back in the, in the Chris, late uh, uh, dynamics, right? 
no and dynamics. Yeah. yeah. So that was the first game I wrote and directed, yep. and it was a three. It was an isometric shooter. So I have made that kind of a game before, and you know, I'm, I'm if you could choose would... scope, would you want to go work at a, another big giant mega production like Sony, or if someone came to you and said, work on a double A game for Steam, like do you have a scope desire, or it doesn't matter? No, it doesn't matter. It's it's really more about like is the project interesting. I wouldn't go and work on, and I don't care how much money they offered me. I wouldn't go and work on a sports game. Right. You couldn't right, pay right. me to work on Madden, you know, or, you know, it's like, it, it's gotta be interesting. It's gotta be something that would be interesting to work on, but okay. yeah, no, I would love to get back into games. Johnny, let's get some super chat. Shall we? Let's do it. All right, here we go. Um, some of these. Uh, okay. So here we go. Um, Jaffe, John, Jeff Ross, and Sh- uh, Jason Schreier walk into a bar. That's from Ricardo Estevez. That's all we got. Thank you, pal, for the setup to a joke that I don't have a payoff for. Trown by Fire drops $5. Thank you, buddy. He says, these two need a day, a daytime talk show. No joke. We should have one. We should right? fucking have one. I'll do it. I'm there. Dude, you know who has a really awesome talk show is... Uh, Oprah Winfrey. No. She used and, to. Um, fucking Nolan North. Oh, with uh, hey, you Retro... Have you Retro, Retro Replay. Yeah. Have you, have you ever watched that show? A little bit, yeah. It's, it's pretty good. Those it two is. guys have a really good synergy they and they do a do. lot of different stuff. And yeah, that's a pretty decent show. Very soon. The David Jaffe and uh, Jeff Cooper show is coming to uh, <laughs> screens near you. Okay. Um, Daniel drops super chat. Thank you, buddy. He's uh, from Europe. He says, did you ever feel you could have divided days gone into two games considering it was a tough game to complete? Or was there never a doubt you had to tell, or was there no doubt you had to tell it in one full, rich story game? Dude, that was all on me. And again, this is one of the big dings of the game. And, uh, you know, again, I take full blame for it. Only because we, as a developing, as a team, we didn't know. We didn't know how big the game was until we knew how big it was. So, and we talked a little bit about the structural aspect of writing. And in my opinion, good writing is structurally sound. So you start with a character who's got a flaw and, you know, in a hero's journey type story, at least that character has to, has to learn something about themselves and they have to be put through a trial and then they have to struggle to achieve who they become by the end. And if you cut that in half, there was a focus test we did that cut the game in half. It cut it at when you, when you uh, reach the end of act two, which is, you know, again, spoilers for you. Sorry, dude. When you fight Carlos, who's the leader of the rippers, and that was a big boss fight, and it was a big emotional thing, and it set in and it set in motion the last third of Deacon's journey. There was a there was some thought for a while that we could stop the game there, and you know again, I think the the more the more savvy game players picked up on the fact that Deacon's journey was only half over. So the, the focus test did not go well. What did they did say? Not go well. The, okay. the, they said it, they, they said it felt like you're dropping the ball on me here. What happened next? You know, so it's like again, you for for a, for an experience to feel complete. You uh, have to have that emotional arc be complete. It can't just be, hey, I've gone to enough places and I've killed enough dudes and I've right. interacted with enough buttons. I'm done. Where? It's got to have that emotional thing. No, so, so here's the thing. If you're making a movie, you yeah. know that. You have to say, we got to get to the movie and get to the payoff. we got to have a climax. Um, but when you're making a movie, you know, okay, you got 120 pages. Right. <laughs> you, uh, you don't know in an open world game until you're able to play it how long your story is. So I thought when about the time we were going to go into our first t- testing, I thought maybe it was a 30 hour game, which arguably might've been too long. Even then, dude, there was another whole section of the game that did get cut. So uh, I'm not even going to talk about that because wow. I don't think Sony's ever talked about it, but right. scoping was always going to be a huge issue for, you know, because we'd never done it before. Got it. What about, um, uh, the, hang on, where did that go? Uh, well, hang on. Okay. So, uh, Ola Moko 17 drops super chat. Thank you, buddy. He says, I platinum days gone. It was a bit yes. long, but it was an awesome game. Nice. Thank you. Nice thing. Um, any thoughts says trigger man on adding co-op or multiplayer at first. We know Jeff was talking about maybe that would have been some of the days gone Two stuff, but so was that ever in the mix at the beginning and do studios ever run in early concepts by hardcore gamers before building out the script, the design, the game? Excellent questions. To be honest, I don't I don't remember from my perspective those elements ever being important to to the development. We had just finished. Uh, we've always done single player games, by the way, so that's always been our focus. Even though we have had multiplayer components, 
Um, but we've always been a story driven, narrative driven, single player shooter. That's kind of what we've done. So from my perspective, that was what I remember, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't some early pitches that said, Hey, could we, you know, we could do a four player co-op or whatever. I just, I, I don't remember that. It wasn't where, what your focus was. Okay. No. And then did you guys ever run concepts by, uh, not that I'm aware of. So it's entirely possible that we would do a green light deck and, you know, marketing might take that and run right. it through a focus troop. That's possible. But again, I don't know. Yeah. We, we did, never did it internally. We did some of those at Santa Monica. We would send out like, did a, you? we did like surveys. Like I was really jonesing to make a civil war first person shooter for a while. Um, I was like, I think there's a lot of interesting weapons and like the first submarines. And there's just a lot of interesting stuff that we could tell politically um, and so Sony was just kind of like, really, that's interesting. I don't, there's like, there was like hot air balloon combat. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> um, and so we put out a package of like six ideas and that was one of them. And we had people rate them. It rated in the middle. It rated okay. But yeah, we, we, we have done stuff like that uh, in the past, at least when I was there. Um, okay. This is uh, Lee. Thank you so much. Lee says, Jaffe and John did the idea of making a Days Gone prequel about the outbreak that was actually a siphon filter sequel ever come up? No, never came up. Okay. But it is in the world of siphon filter. That is correct. I mean, Jeff confirmed that. Would you agree? No, really? No. Okay. Again, it, this is, but, it, but, but my answer isn't any more valid than Jeff's. It's like, at the end of the day, I worked with the design team that right. put in the collectibles and the, and the Easter eggs for siphon filter. So I can't deny that I did that. But so why but, did you, did you fight them? Did you say, no, this is dumb or what was the, what was the experience of that? I don't want to get into that, but what I will say is Why? On every every game that I've ever worked on, I have tried to fight cross pollinization. I've never liked it. Of I brands. find it I find, of anything. I find it I find it breaks immersion. I don't like it when you know that and I again I approved this in Days Gone too. I don't like it when devs put their names in the game. I don't like it when you know, anything that sort of like is a player, if I'm going through the world and I'm like, now I'm so instead of instead of focusing on Deacon's story and Deacon's journey, I'm wondering what happened to Gabe Logan in this story. I don't think that's productive to a franchise. Personally. People got mad at me when I was first playing Last of Us 2 and you can find a PlayStation 3 and you can find the Jack and Daxter game in there. And I was like, this, I, I was I don't like that. I don't like it either. And people were like, you're an idiot. I'm like, well, it's you know what I do like, though, if it's the same franchise. So it's like when, uh, you know, when the Naughty Dog guys put a reference to Chase, who was the main character that I created for Golden Abyss, they put a reference to oh, her. Because she's in the world. In Drake's at it. Right? right. So there was a box. He's like, I got to get this to Chase. Right. right. And it was about Quivera. Um, I love that. In fact, right. I didn't even know they were going to do that. But right. that makes perfect sense to right. me. So. You know, people who are in that universe, they know that Drake interacted with her and they know what that story is and they see this box. That's amazing. Right. Okay. But, you know, had they put, you know, had they put a box up there with Gabe Logan's name on it, even though that makes no sense, I would not have been a fan of that. I would have been like, what? what? Why is that there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a leaf. Oh, from IGN uh, drops through chat. I was the reviewer of Days Gone. Um, do you think your issues with cross pollinization were born out of your racist views about black and white people being able to marry and be in a relationship. Yeah, I guess I don't understand that question. I just I just made that up. Okay, Good. this is uh, this is uh, this is Lee. I, was like, what the? I know. I just you know, this is Lee Washbrook. He says, "Hey, Jeffy and John." Uh, uh, oh, we already did that one. This is Dirt Grid Giddy. He says, um, "Days Gone was an amazing game. It was a little too long, but a great game." I, I maybe he's did that one twice. Daniel says many gamers assume days gone is just an open world zombie horde hunting game. Do you think you properly communicated how rich it is in terms of story? Excellent question. And again, I, you know, it's like, I, maybe the answer is no, since I, since I get questions like this, right. um, I think, uh, I, I, I do remember, that we had a really tough time with messaging at the start because to be honest, none of us were expecting the blowback that we got from the reveal, right? So there was there was negative stuff coming out at the reveal for Christ's sake. It's of like, like oh. too many zombie things or what? No, it was, I think it kind of started with, to be honest, it started with them wanting a different game. They thought it was going to be the reveal for the next Red Dead, if I remember correctly. Okay. And they were like, oh, we're disappointed that, you know, because they, and they had split us in two, right? So we had the story trailer, that had, you know, Sam Whitworth's voiceover of like all the post-apocalyptic scenery, but there were no 
creatures that nobody knew what it was. So that may have been a mistake because then it's like, oh, well, what is this? What is this? And then right. when the when the Horde demo came up that Jeff played live, that was two, you know, an hour later. Right, so it, right. And, it, you know, and when the, in that slot, people were like, oh, this is going to be Red Dead. So I think there was a certain amount of right. disappointment when it turned out to be Days Gone Part 2. Oh, and it's zombies? You know, so I don't know. It feels like... Uh, Maybe we could have done a better job. I, I will tell you the messaging from the beginning. And yeah, you know, I, but, I, I, all they pushed for me as an outsider, but I was, you know, intimately involved with Sony. I was like, Oh, that's the game with all the zombies. And I assumed there was a story, but it never occurred to me that they, it was, that was, it's, it was, it was that deep. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm assuming you would have probably preferred they pushed that a little more than they did. You know, I don't know because, and again, I'm the wrong person to ask because you know, even though I was a creative director, there were so many other people that have that were responsible for helping with that messaging. There are PR people and marketing people and producers and so on. And I don't know that any of us had a really, I think the thinking behind that E3 reveal was, hey, we're going to do this sort of emotional, Sam Whitworth did a great job on the voiceover. That obviously set a tone that had nothing to do with zombies, right? It had everything right. to do with a kind of melancholy. And, you know, we're looking back at this world and you're seeing all the visuals and it's, you know, it's about loss. Um, you know, the same thing we did with the with the wedding trailer that was released like a year later, a year later, which was all about, right. you know, flashbacks to Deacon and Sarah's marriage and then the horrible violence of the current world. So we we definitely knew that we had to communicate that this was not just a Horde game. But on the other hand, dude, the Horde is fucking awesome. It is it's very like, awesome. It's, it's like, it's, you know, <laughs> it's like. 2020 hindsight you could have made a game that was just about the horde and had it yeah. be way more arcadey and had well, it's it like state of emergency but for or something yeah, right yeah. and so there so that could have been a road to go down that would have been because that was the tech the tech really was we had a dude who had has been with sony since since siphon one and he's an engineer who's worked on all of our tech for our platforms and that get, you know he had the horde working very early right so the one of the first paintings that don yutomi did we did this thing where it's like, you know, Deacon standing on the sawmill roof mm -hmm. and the horde coming at him. And that was, that became our first playable. It's like, nobody knew in the, you know, this is two years before we got there that we were actually going to be able to achieve that. So if the horde had become the message and people were buying it because of the horde, that wouldn't be a bad thing. No, no. I think it's when, Dude, I remember it, a focus when you tester, first have them, when you first experience my, it, it blows your mind. One of my favorite focus testers, uh, one of his comments was, this is one of the early tests. He's like, I came here to play a zombie game and you made me play a love story. <laughs> oh, was that a negative? I, for him, it was a positive. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because he was getting way more than he thought he was. Nice. Getting. Okay, good. What was your, but, was there a, was there when you started this, was there, cause whenever I start a game, I always have like a, a feeling or kind of like a North star of like all of this crazy that's going to happen the next couple of years is about, me giving the player with the team this was there something that you hung on to throughout development which is like this is why i want to make this game like what was the reason you know you know here's what it was and again this was a and this is why jeff has always been so awesome as a partner for working with um for development is because he wasn't just game design he was also i talked about this a little bit earlier the the feels it's like we talked about this this uh, this very early animatic we put together, and I, you've probably made a bunch of those, right? Where you take clips from TV shows yep. and and whatever. So this 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 animatic was what we were trying to do with Days Gone, and the animatic consisted of The Walking Dead, dudes, you know, walking around with shotguns and blowing right. zombies away, and Sons of Anarchy. Mm -hmm. So a crew of bikers riding down the road. But it had you know the it had this awesome soundtrack. It was one of the tracks we ended up shipping in the game. And it had some scenes from a show that I'm sure you have never seen. It, look it up on YouTube. It's on. It's uh, from Australia. It's called Bikey Wars. Never heard of it. Yeah. In Australia, they're they're not called bikers. They're called bikies. Okay. Um, but there was this awesome scene where you know this hot chick, his his old lady, is on the back of a bike, you know, and she's hugging him, and she's got her, you know, she she's she's safe as they're riding down the highway. And okay. that that moment with you know with this sort of emotional soundtrack playing is literally the heart of Days Gone. Okay. And that's you know, and that's kind of one of those things. It's literally about the relationship between these two people right. with all this other stuff and going he, on and, and, him, the and him getting of the back to that, that. Right. I mean Yeah, that... because at the end of the day, the biker tropes don't matter, the zombie tropes don't matter. If you can't make the player feel for Deacon and Sarah, then the game doesn't have a heart. And it's like 
you know, or Deacon and Boozer, because it's kind of a, it's kind of a, not a love triangle, but it's definitely a, a you know, three part relationship. So yeah. anyway, I don't know. I guess that's what I, what I thought was the, the thing we hung it on from the beginning was this isn't just a zombie game. It's not just a bite game. It's, you know, and I think uh, that's maybe one of the things that kind of hurt us is well, that we were a lot of different things. Would you once. go back? I'm curious because some of the stuff I think a lot of people liked, like, I mean, I like so far what I've experienced the relationship between Deacon and Sarah. I think it's cool. But obviously you guys got dinged for that. If you could go back, would you change that line? Would you change that shot with the looking at her butt? Or is it like, dude, that's the relationship and there's nothing wrong with it. Or do you think that hurt you? Oh, it definitely hurt me with some critics. Um, I would not change a thing. Okay, good, good. I, I, I like that answer. I, I wouldn't either. I, I really like it. I mean, I thought it was a cool character. Um, okay. Um, Joseph, hello, Joseph, says, I played this game a few months before I was diagnosed with anxiety, depression, and panic attacks. This game saved me forever in my heart. Thank you, John. Nice. That's something. That's something. That's very nice, Joseph. Uh, RJ just gave us a super chat. Thank you, buddy. Daniel dropped super chat, says, did you leave behind at Bend a draft with a vision that extends beyond the events and days gone that could serve as a foundation to the future, or is there no such thing? I can't comment on that. Okay. Um, do you, can you speak to why Days Gone 2 was kind of put on the back burner? Like I said, it wasn't while I was there. So that's uh, all information I don't have access to. Okay. Wiley Coyote drops Super Chat. Thank you, buddy. He says, I know you're enjoying life focusing on personal projects, painting, writing, publishing, etc. But has Microsoft ever contacted you? Thanks. No. No. Okay. Wiley again, more cash coming from him. John, why do you think Siphon Filter hasn't had a new game? Um, again, I don't know a hundred percent of all the, there's a lot of ways to answer that. I can just tell you from my own personal perspective is I had done seven of them and I was done. So, you know, it's like, I, there was just, you know, there's only so much that you could do on with those characters. And, uh, I, I personally was done working on it, but now you're saying you're right. You could go back now. You think there's more. Uh, I said, so calm. I didn't say siphon. Oh, you didn't say siphon. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were saying, you I disagree- never said I would go back and work. on. Okay. But now. okay. But you do I said, disagree, but I disagree with, with Jeff. With Jeff. Okay. I disagreed with him that there is a, I think that there is a modern day spy action game that could be made. I don't know if I would call it siphon filter. I honest. see. Okay. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Fair. Um, okay. Mr. Righteous fish drops super chat. Thank you, buddy. He says, I just want to show support. I'm a black veteran that lives in the PNW. Do you know what that is? Pacific Northwest, uh, yes. and rides a motorcycle. LOL. I love days gone. Good show. Nice. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, game over HD says, I love the world of days gone. I loved it so much. I platinumed it. Thank you and your X team for making it. I mean, this is, there's so much love that is coming out for this game. I have a question for you, and I know you don't know, but it's fascinating to me that this is a game because we're living in the age of $60, $70 games, 71 Metacritic, obviously hurt you guys with that metric. Um, but now it's on PlayStation Plus uh, uh, game collection. And it seems, I mean, more and more people are getting to discover it. Um, and more and more people are getting to talk about it. I know there's no way of knowing, but have you heard, like Jeff was on and Jeff said he was only there a little bit of the time, but he was under the impression that they are seeing a pretty meaningful uptick in engagement with that game on uh, 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 what's it called PlayStation plus game collection. Do you have any insider thoughts about that? I, you know, I don't, and because again, I wasn't there, but here's here, because I do have an opinion on something that, that your audience might find of interest. Okay. And it might piss some of them off. If you love a game, buy it at fucking full price. I can't tell you how many times I've seen gamers say, yeah, I got that on sale. But how do you know PS you love a game until you've played it? I'm just saying you don't, but don't complain if a game doesn't get a sequel if it wasn't supported at launch, it's like God of War got, you know, whatever number of millions of sales at launch and, you know, Days Gone didn't. So it's like, right. for whatever reason, it's like, it, you know, for, just speaking for me personally as a developer, I don't work for Sony. Yeah. I don't know what the numbers are. I can tell you that when we were doing, God, which was it? It was uh, one of the early, or Dark Mirror, I think. 
we got so fucked on Dark Mirror because piracy was a thing and Sony really wasn't kind of caught up on what right. piracy was doing to sales. And we would show them torrents. A torrent site had 200,000 copies of Dark Mirror being downloaded. I, if I remember the right, I could, my numbers could be wrong. But right. regardless, it was a lot. Kind of those things I was, I was pissed about it then. I was like, this is money out of my pocket. It's right. like, so I think the uptick in engagement with the game is not as important as, did you buy the game at full price? Because if you did, Right. then that's supporting the developers directly. Well, it's not as important then, but now that you've got, whether it's Game Pass or PS Plus Collection, I'm just, because you've seen this happen in movies, right? You've seen a movie, I remember the one that, the, the great uh, uh, example is like Austin Powers. Austin Powers came out in the 90s and it was a middling hit in theaters. People liked it. I saw it in the theater with my wife, we thought it was hilarious. But it didn't set the world on fire. Pitch Perfect's another one. It comes out on video, comes out on DVD, and it explodes. And then suddenly the movie studio is like, holy shit, there's something here. And then it becomes this big franchise. Austin Powers 2 has Beyonce opens with crazy money. I just wonder if let's just say that. Ha Let me ask you a question. I know the answer. I know your answer is going to be diplomatic. But if that happened with Days Gone and let's cross our fingers, let's hope it does. Let's hope the great Cinderella story of Days Gone is when people were able to play it without the, the annoying Metacritic, without the annoying, you know, messaging from some certain critics, they actually realize, holy shit, this is really fucking good. Okay. Yeah. And they say, let's make another one. It's like, well, one of the reasons it's really fucking good is, you know, John Garvin. If they came back to you and said, we're sorry, we were wrong. Would you go back? Well, it you have a you starting with a flawed premise though as i said right. earlier i didn't leave because days gone 2 didn't get made i was gone oh, before that was okay. ever a decision no 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 but i'm not starting with a flawed premise let's put it this way your premise or the the me reading the tea leaves or sorry me reading between the lines would suggest that you were fired from ben because you were a disruptive personality and that worked with a smaller team and a medium sized team but as the budgets and the stakes got higher and the number of people that had to work on the team got bigger that personality, at least according to that company, was no longer the right fit. Would you agree with that? Definitely. Okay, so my premise is accurate because would you also agree with the fact that as long as you're making Sony a lot of money or any company a lot of money, that barometer for how much of a pain in the ass you get to be, that, 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 that where you land on the spectrum can be very different. I'm almost certain, I don't think Neil Druckmann's an asshole. I don't know him. But if Neil Druckmann's an asshole, I think the tolerance for Neil Druckmann being an asshole versus you being an asshole right now is probably higher. Would you agree with that? Dude, I, it's all speculation. Of so course, me, but that's fun. <laughs> we're not, we're not, yeah, we're not, we're I, not politicians. Well, then we'd be lying, but we're just talking. I, all I'm going to say is I definitely think that, I mean, again, because there's a there's an underlying premise to what you're saying, which is that, you know, HR being an asshole, that shit doesn't matter if you make them a lot of money. And I just don't think that's true. I think that you have to have, a, you have to have a work environment that allows people to be the best that they can be without having, without having issues. So that, that, you, you you know, have that, to, that's all I have to say. Okay. And that's, that's, that's disturbingly. Here's, what, here's whatever. What I would say is, <laughs> what I would say is I, I do like the premise of what you're saying about about Austin Powers, I wasn't actually aware of that. So that is a, you know, as a paradigm, that's totally legit. It's like, yes. okay, look, if, you know, if the game only sold this much, but then over the next two years, it sold way more because, or it got, you know, the frame yeah. rate got improved or whatever, different yeah. platform or two platforms. And then, you know, now suddenly it looks like, hey, that might be a viable sequel. Right. I think that that would be, uh, that would be awesome for them to be able to do that. Yeah. So okay. doesn't mean it has anything to do with me, I know. but it would be I awesome know. if they could make the franchise. I, I got it. I got to I have to see what this package is. You signed with Sony when you left, like, what are they giving you? Is it like Bradley uh, Cooper in limitless where it's like, we're not giving you the pill, Johnny. If you say anything bad, you ain't getting the pill, bitch. That's what I think is happening. And I respect that. I would want the pill too. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I do the same goddamn thing. You also, so dude, I don't, I, I don't, I, I hope I'm not coming off as like, oh, you're I'm not, not saying the truth. Because, no, you're coming off a as package. a normal human being, which is like, look, man, I want to keep working. Of course, I know where some bodies are buried, but it's really not my place to share that. And some of it's speculation, some of it's private, and some of it, yeah, I could give you some salacious shit for your stream, Jaffe, but end of the day, I have to live with the consequences. I, I, I think that's fair. If I had, if it was truthful, I would yeah. give it to you. Where are you going?
Highlands. That's awesome. I know. That's a great outfit. My kids got the best fucking style in the world. Good job, champ. Okay. Can I see your card? Yes. I uh, go bring me my wallet. I'll give you my card. My kid wants my credit card. Okay. Go ahead, John. Sorry, I apologize. Go ahead. No. Um, yeah, dude. All I was saying is, I, I, you know, I maybe not. I don't have the same reputation you do for calling shit as you see it. Yeah. Um, but I pretty much do call things as I see them. Yeah, you have that reputation. I get, I get in trouble. I get in trouble all the time. Yeah. Um. So you know. So not. But the thing is, I honestly don't have an opinion on that. It's like, I guess what I heard you asking was if Days Gone was going to make a bunch of money and they offered you to come back because, you know, and overlook, you know, why you left in the first place. Right. I don't have an opinion on that. I'm like, well, I don't think that's going to happen because I don't see Sony the same way you do. And I don't think it was as, you know, as easy as Garvin's an asshole. Let's get rid of him. I think it was way more complex than that. And I don't know that. That, that making a lot of money doing a sequel would be enough to have either of us agree to, you know, do something together again in the future. I just okay. don't, I don't, I don't see it that way. Fair enough. But it's not, but I'm not answering it just because I, yes. because you think I would break an NDA or something. No, no, I understand. I understand. Will you answer why it was a lot more complex than that? Sure. Yeah. Like I said, it was, it was mutual until it wasn't. And then it was a blessing after it was. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. It does. Um, okay. Uh, in my opinion, says Joseph, thank you for the chat. The game is amazingly written, and a huge part of why is because John was creating characters with pure intentions to progress the story. Just a statement, but that's a nice thing to hear. I, I agree. I, one thing I'll say, I don't know why people... Jeff was even saying Deacon starts off the game kind of an asshole and kind of selfish. I haven't... I like him so far. Maybe it's subtle, like where he goes becomes much more uh, uh, giving and generous. But I think he's a fun character to start off with. But yeah. yeah, I like the characters in this game. Brian King, thank you, buddy. He says, the quality and love you guys put into the game shine through. You have my admiration and appreciation for all you have given us as a creator. You thank have you. a lot of love out there for a lot of the shit you've done. But you're saying, like the subject of your last book you've been living kind of in the shadows for a long time. I mean, is that, is that, I mean, now you're not, which is nice, but would, would you have, what would you, would you have pushed more for a social media presence? I mean, cause it, did you resent that or you're okay with it? If I were still at Sony, we would not be having this discussion right now. It's as simple as that. Same thing with Jeff. It's like, everything has to go through PR. I mean, that's just a reality. So, right. you know, it's like there are, there are dudes online who have, you know, or on Twitter who have, who still are at the studio and they have a presence, but they're, but you know, you're not allowed to have opinions. Right. You're not allowed to have, and you, you know, and you're certainly not allowed to have opinions about, about the company, the comp well, not the company per se, but you know, just the IP because it's literally about controlling the messaging. They really want to have a hundred percent control over, you know, what Ben Studio is going to do next? It's like even if I did know, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Because, that's right. That's right. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of one of those things where, yes, do I wish that it was as free and open as you know, say, comic book creators who can come online and come on to talk shows and talk about shit? Um, yes, I do wish that. As that, a guy who or who has lived under that regime philosophy longer than I did, because uh, I didn't really experience it all that much. Um, do you feel people like Jason Schreier are doing a service in a good way where they're letting people know, Hey, there was a days gone too. Hey, there was an uncharted five. Now they're doing this thing with naughty dog. Or do you think as a developer, do you kind of resent that? Are you like, dude, that's not your place to share. You can share if someone is, if, if bend Oregon is a toxic sexist environment, if, if people are being abused, that's noble. But why would you, you don't, it's not, why do you need to be sharing their inner workings of cr the creative process? Like, what do you think about that? Well, again, I don't, I haven't talked to Jason about that stuff and I don't know where his head's at just based on the Bloomberg story. Yeah. It feels like the narrative he was, was, was putting out there was that small creative teams are being, you know, sort of vacuumed up by these bigger teams and yeah. it's stifling creativity. So, you know, so for, as part of that story, if he's putting it out there that Days Gone 2 got canceled, then that makes total sense. If he has inside information, I don't have that information. Um, if he's got somebody who's on, you know, obviously nobody's on a record, right? For good reason. Right. Because, you know, why, because you get fired. So, I, you know, I guess I do resent the story in general only because he knows more than I know. <laughs> so right. I, so in that sense, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, 
I guess I have mixed feelings. I, I don't regret reporters reporting. They, they're, that's their job is to dig out information and and try to put together a storyline and publish it. So you, kind of their job. Yeah, but, it, but okay, sure. And I'm not saying legally it shouldn't be. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I, I believe very much in a free press and all that. But yeah. um, if you were still making Days Gone 1 and this guy, Schreier, you know, there was a guy who was pissed at you um, and they leaked the ending and Schreier ran with it just because he could and it's part of their business model. And, and, you know, I don't like John Garvin. He's an asshole. And part of that story is, when I was sitting with him working on the ending, I wanted the ending where, um, you know, Boozer ended up running off with Sarah and, and uh, Deacon killed himself. And John wanted this ending. Well, would you resent that or would you go, well, he's a reporter. That's, that's his job. Well, obviously I would resent that. I mean, that's a different kind of thing, though, It's right? not. He's revealing creative decisions that aren't really relevant to the bigger picture. He could say that, yes, Ben was working on a really big game uh, that, you know, was canceled, but did he have to say it? I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a side in this. I'm just wondering because you were living it. It seems oh, to me there's I a think balance. If you're a re- again, as a developer, yes, I resent the fuck out of that. If as a reporter, I can find out a scoop because if I can find out that any major franchise got canceled, that's a story, dude, it is. It's a story whether, whether we like it or not. So it, you know, it's like if you're a reporter and you have news to me, it's like, that's, that's kind of like, here on the spectrum of of what's morally correct if you have the if you're revealing the end of a of a story so that it's spoiling it for players who haven't experienced it yet that's down here in the mud somewhere that's like oh okay you're doing that we can't stop you from doing it but it's wrong you shouldn't do that where are you morally reprehensible where are you on that garvin scale if you are reporting on the business workings and the work conditions, but you choose not to give away information about the products. Is it higher if the story can still be told as well? Dude, I don't, you're asking great questions and I'm sorry that I don't have better answers. Or not a bad, they're opinions. not a bad answer. I'm just curious. Um, I, I, to me, it just feels like, you know, like for, for Schreier in particular, I've read, I haven't read all of his stuff. So yeah. yeah. You know, I've read the book that he's done and I've read, you know, the Bloomberg article and, a, and you know, a few of the podcasts. He's I've done. read his book. His book's good. Yeah. So to me, it just feels like that's kind of what a reporter does. So with the Bloomberg stuff, you know, he if he got a scoop or he found out some inside information on um, Mumbauer Studio or Bend or Santa Monica and, you know, and Naughty Dog, it just it feels like what would you tell him to do not publish it because it's not his know. place i'm not i'm not a journalist uh but i can tell you i can tell you i know what uncharted 5 was about i know who it was starring i know all kinds but you're of things not, but you're not but you're not a journalist no but i would even have more incentive to share it i'd get more hits more people subscribing more people coming to my show but yeah it's not good form it's not my news to share um, but I, but that's just a difference of opinion. I, no, I, I get it. I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. But I feel like if you were a reporter, that you might. If, if I you, had to be yeah. that, I wouldn't be a reporter. If I, if I had to be Jason Schreier reporting on sexual harassment at Riot, but, okay, I would hold throw this my motherfucking head up high and go, I'm doing the Lord's work and I don't even believe in the Lord. Just because we are doing the David and John show right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw this back at you because I do believe that there's a difference between you and Schreier. You got this information because of relationships you have with people who trust you. What information? Whatever. Like, if you know what Uncharted 5 was going to be about, you didn't get that because you wouldn't talk to people who wouldn't talk on the record. You know people. So, That's you know, right. So if I, if I know anything, it's through relationships I have, and I would not betray those relationships. Okay. That's the difference. It's like Jason doesn't have relationships with any of those people. So That's not, it's, not, it, it's not that. I, the people, I think it is. I'll tell you. Well, you don't because I'm going to tell you why you don't in the John, okay. in the, in the, in the John and David show. It's better John and Jaffe or Jaffe and John. It's better with the J's, with the alliteration. Excelsior! Yeah. Listen, um, it, uh, uh, it, it's not that, though. And as a writer, I think you actually know what it is, right? It, it's because it's, my sources, and they're multiple, like the whole Uncharted thing, I got from three people who are currently working at the company at three different, totally different studios, right? So it's not like a relationship. It's the fact that as somebody who has created stuff, I want to know if... Um, you know, there's crazy sexual harassment going on at Sony Santa Monica. That's Mm. important. But as a creator, I don't want to spoil the ending. I don't want to tell you that Luke is the son of Darth Vader. That's, that's, 
that's not reporting. That's just that's that's getting clicks because you have the skinny and totally it's kind of shitty. Mm -hmm. So I, it's not yeah, relationships. No, totally it's hurting the pro, it's hurting the art form, in my opinion. So it's not the relationships. I wouldn't want to hurt no, those but it, either. But, but you're, again, you're talking about a spoiler though. But if on the other hand you had a relationship with George Lucas and you and you and he told you that there wasn't going to be another Star Wars trilogy because he was going to sell it to Disney, right? That's a scoop. We do that's information. You may not share that because you have a relationship with him and he told you that in confidence. I would share that if I was but a journalist. Well, well, wait, well, wait a minute, out. wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I w if I was a reporter and he told me that off the record, I wouldn't share that. If I was a reporter and I dug that dirt and I discovered it and I had enough sources to corroborate it, I would share that. But if yes. I knew the plot to yes. Force Awakens, I would not right. share that. I would say there are people yeah, leaking I the plot. Totally I know what it is. But I'm not I telling 100%. you that. Right. Okay. Um, this is. Um, it is fun to talk to you. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Do, were all your interviews like this? I want you to tell me how special I am, John. Tell me this interview is better than any other interview you've done. This interview's done going really well, in my opinion. I don't Goddamn know what your right. audience thinks, but dude, we've been doing it for you know three fucking hours now. You know that. Right? Are you time to wrap? Can no, I, I'm good. Let's go, baby. Uh, let's go. Let's get some super I chats. I don't have a I don't have a job currently. I don't either. This is it, and I love it. Here we go. Um, okay, Ricardo says there. Those were the Andrew. Okay, he's he's going back uh, talking when you're talking about dreams when you were talking about Death Stranding. He's saying those were Andy House, Sean Layden days, not Jim Ryan. Just letting you know. That's what he's saying. Okay. Trown by fire drops super chat. He says you can't say people didn't want the Snyder cut. We hardcore DC fans watched it. The casual fans didn't finish it. Oh, fucking well. Games are for kids, right? I don't know what the fuck he's talking about, John, but yeah, that's that trail no by fire. Yeah. Uh, casual, he, he gives us more money. He says casuals were not the ones asking for the Snyder Cut. He's in the weeds with the Snyder Cut. Axel drops Super Chat. He says, what about Sam's robot toy that is in Ellie's room in The Last of Us 2? The game doesn't make you see that on the shelf. You discover it yourself. It activated an emotional response. Yes, that's gameplay. Um, when I was going back through uh, Joel's house in The Last of Us 2, and um, I think he's talking about the same thing. No, it's uh, Ellie goes back to Joel's house after Joel dies, and she picks up a picture of Joel, uh, uh, of Joel and Sam on the mantle or what have you. I loved that because I, I knew... That was, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. When you can tell it in the game, and I don't think you disagree. You're just saying, how do we do that? We're not there yet, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, a, we, we are, but we're not there yet in, in as much as we need to be. John says, AJC, hey, appreciate your games. Thanks for your time and putting up with our beloved Jaffe. Let me tell you something, you fucker. Okay, I am, <laughs> I am an acquired taste, but once you get the taste, you never want to eat anything else. Thank you, AJ. Uh, MZ Addis says, days gone with a twisted metal twist, customizable, customizable vehicles make it happen. Can you imagine... Let's go to Jim Ryan and say, you know the two games that you don't think can be profitable for $150 million? Let's put them together, right? right? I don't think so, but I appreciate it. Hey, before you get to another question, I want to tell yep. the story before I forget. So yep. another Jaffe story. So this is way, way early before we had even met. You were at a Greenlight meeting um, when God of War was called something else. I don't even remember Dark what it was Odyssey. Time. Dark Odyssey. That's what it was. And you were doing this big real-time presentation. And yes. this is one of the things that impressed me about Jaffe way back in the day. He's up, he's in a, and I think this is, this may have been in the Phil days, but there were like 300 people. I it mean, was, in, it was had, San Diego, I think it was. At, yeah, uh, we Hilton. had tons and tons of people yep. and he's doing a live playthrough of the game, fucking crashes. Yep. <laughs> and so I was impressed by the tech of that engine, by the way, because yep. you had to cheat to get back to where you were. Yeah. And it was all one continuous world. Well, it was, it was streaming, like, but I knew where the stream hallways were, so I could kind of fly. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. So, but that was super impressive that, A, you could stop in the middle of it and, you know, just sort of like get back to it and then continue like nothing had gone wrong. Right. So that's one of the skills as a creative director you kind of had to have back in the day, and even now, I, I think, yeah. is the ability to do a live demo. I remember when Neil's broke, when they were, or Bruce Straley's broke, when they were doing that uh, Uncharted 3, 4 demo? Uncharted 3, Uncharted 3, way back in the day at E3. Yeah. So it's just that, you know, having that, that, that unflappable presence of being able to, like in your case right now, being able to like get assholes that ask you stupid questions and, you know, use the N word or whatever. And just like, Hey, all right, enough of that. Let's move on. Right. right. It's just not, it, not getting flustered. Being a salesman being able to, is part of it. I mean, you're selling, totally. you know, you're selling it, man. 
Um, okay. But in real time. That's in real time. It's, it's got to be in real time. And I'm not even joking. I, I've been diagnosed with ADD five, six, seven years ago. I take medicine for it. Um, medicine saved my life. Didn't really, but it's been brilliant. But it, my brain enjoys that because it's always something interesting and different. Whereas if it was just the same thing every day, I, I couldn't do it. Um, okay. Um, an uh, acid drop says originally days gone had a choice system that was removed. Do you think the initial system hurt the game due to the change of scope? You kind of already talked about that, right? I, I mean, did talk about this. Yeah. It wasn't I mean, really I wanna, a scope but I issue. Be very clear. We, it, Jeff and I, and the team removed this, removed the choice system. So right. it made the game better, it made the game flow better. It made it feel better. It made it more understandable. It made it more fun. Right. Um, so these were all, these were all, that was a good change. I think the idea of it was great that you were pitching about the whole, where does, where does, uh, uh, the character end up? But yeah, do pineapples belong on pizza says a, uh, triangle zero square, <laughs> uh, yes or no? No. There you go. Um, Flaffy drops super chat. You, so that's to do it on my Twitter channel. That's one of, so I bake pizza. I'm a, I'm a cook. So oh, I also do. Okay. So we have like this sort of inner group of guys who are and gals who are always talking about different pizza recipes and stuff. And so that's kind of an in joke. Where gotcha. Like, you know, where I made the mistake once of saying, no, pizza's do, you know, pineapple has no, pl and it becomes this big debate. It's I like, know. And I don't, I don't, you know, <laughs> at, p any pizza is good pizza. Flaffy says, uh, what the fuck is a day one patch got to do with anything? I think he was getting on that guy. Merkin, I think, uh, yeah. Desert tech. Uh, thank you though. Flappy Flaffy desert tech. MDR says, John, what happened to the Glock 34 in the game? It's an excellent pistol choice. Whoever picked it knew what they were doing. Why is it only on tables and art? Um, Excellent question. I have no idea. That's a again. If you want to, if you're scouting around for more guests, try to get Ron Allen on the show. So what, he was you know, a he's, designer. He's combat? the he's the he was on Days Gone. He was like uh, the gameplay lead. He was uh he's still at Ben Studio, so obviously he probably won't be able to say shit. But he was the guy who was responsible for all the weapon system. Him and his team. Right. Um. I don't have a clue. Okay. Um. Uh, okay. Game over HD siphon filter was amazing for its time. Hashtag sequel. Nice. Dick Jones uh, says, I love the siphon filter series. Thanks for the great childhood memories. Also days gone is a fantastic game and I enjoyed getting the platinum. Nice. Uh, Four eight shark says John is like a cooler, older Jaffe. Uh, fuck off. He might be older. <laughs> I'm cooler. Yeah, you're probably right. You're pro Could you ride a bike? You ride a bike. <laughs> Are you a bike? No, or? you know, so it's interesting. So Jeff started riding during Days Gone. Right. Dude, I rode a bike from the time I was uh, 17 until I was uh, 22, 23, something like that, for right. five, six years when I was a kid. Um, I almost talked, you know, we're talking about our quantum lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I almost, I was on a trip to Tacoma, Washington, and I was on the inside lane on a, on a six, six lane freeway, and my chain broke because I was driving a Honda 750. Uh, roadster so you know and i've been riding it forever and broken chain no joke it's like uh you, you immediately go from 65 miles an hour down to 10 cars number one cause of die because i have been knocked off my bike before when my gas tank ran out and i was reaching down to switch to the alternate tank the dude came up behind me and hit me knocked me off the bike that was on a separate incident okay uh, but anyway i bear it because my bike riding buddy managed to like wave traffic and get me off the freeway but Two, two or three incidents like that, and I'm done riding the bike. It's like, can, that's I all it imagine. takes. Yeah, I can So imagine. I used to ride. Um, I don't have the sort of authenticity chops of a Jeff Ross today because I don't, gotcha. have, a, I don't have a Harley. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Cooper, hello, Cooper. Major spoilers. Hope my name doesn't confuse you more, Jaffe. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Why does Sarah react so cold when reuniting with Deacon? She seems oh, unhappy spoiler. to see him. She sees, um, seems unhappy to see him all 100% deliberate. So again, as a writer, I think the key to keeping an audience engaged is to surprise them, to have them always be, you know, looking at what's happening and have it not be what they were expecting. So, you know, to have Deacon and Sarah have a big emotional heartfelt reunion, I think fall, you know, flies in the face of everything the story was building up to. It's what the audience wants, right? You want them to fall, to fall instantly in love. And, you know, again, spoiler for you, dude. That's but, okay. The entire last third of the game is Deacon and Sarah trying to fall in love again. So it's like, in, in my experience, that's the way relationships work. It's like, 
you know, if something traumatic happens and there's a huge breakup or whatever, it's like people don't just instantly fall into, into each other's arms again. It takes time to build relationships. So again, that was a very deliberate moment and tested that way, by the way. It's like reactions from players have been all over the place. Some people, and I've watched all, so just so you guys know, I watch all your live streams. So if you're playing Days Gone, I will see it on YouTube just to fast forward to these emotional moments because right. I want, especially if your face is, if I can't see your face on the stream, I'm not going to watch it. Right, but you want to see I'll the response. Honest. I want to see the response. That's what I'm there so for. What so what has the general response been to that? It's all over the map. It's all, all over the map. So some people start crying. Some people get pissed. I've seen people like, you know, just be so mad at Sarah. But again, these are all valid responses. I love them all. And it's because by the end of the game, I hope, by the credit roll, right. where you see where they finally end up, if, you, if you're not on board with their relationship at that point, then I have failed. Okay. But if you're angry or feeling something, here's the thing, you're feeling something at that reunion, whether it's, you know, good, bad, emotional, angry, whatever it is, you're feeling something. And that means I'm doing my job. Gotcha. That's cool. That's good. That's a great answer. I love that. Um, caveman. What was it like moving from writing game scripts to a novel? Did you struggle to get in the flow of writing in a very different format? Excellent question. And the answer is yes. So here's the thing. So days gone, most people don't know this, but the, like, so your average movie is 120 pages. Days gone was like 1200 pages. It was the equivalent of, I think Sam and I, Sam Whitwer, the, you know, who played Deacon. I think we, we did a word count at one point. He, he, he did something like uh, 16,000 words for Days Gone, you know, counting wow. all the cutscenes wow. and the VO and all the procedural stuff. Um, it's just a lot of content. So, right. so in some ways, Days Gone prepared me to write this novel because, you know, it's a YA novel, which means it's about, you know, 300 pages, mm -hmm. you know, 150,000 words, something like that. So it's actually, I, there were way more words, just words um, in in the in video game writing in general right, right there's right. very few words so it's you know so i i think the biggest thing is writing one sort of prepares you to do the other only in the sense that dialogue obviously so hopefully you know i know how to write dialogue so the right. characters sound believable so so the things that i learned writing video games for over many many years i can take with me and say my goals are kind of the same it's like i want to create feelings i want to make sure that the player or the reader is surprised i want to have them not have their expectations met I want them to have an emotional journey. I want it to be about something that's bigger than just the plot. I want right. it to have, you know, so all, and it's in my novel, by the way, is set in Oregon, believe it or not. Is so, it, is it genre or is it straight? It's genre, yeah. Dude, okay. I would never write straight. It's a genre. So it's, okay. a, it's a young adult, um, non-Christian view of the afterworld. Oh, interesting. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, what's interesting, I, I dabbled a little bit in prose writing and what I did, what I did like about it, although I wasn't very good at it, was it's a relief from writing games because in games you have to, you know, in, in a book, like the girl gets up in, in her cabin and then she goes down to the wharf. Well, in a novel, she goes down to the wharf. It's like could be buried within a sentence if you even say that. She's just at the wharf. In a game, She's then just, you got to yeah. build out all that gameplay from the cabin to the wharf. And it's like, oh, I just want to tell the story. So that had to have been yeah. at least refreshing. You didn't have to worry about you know, where this is going to branch and, oh, it's kind of boring to walk from her. Dude, you know what the, you know what the biggest difference was? The no. biggest and the hardest, the hardest transition was writing action. Oh, okay. You know, because here's the thing in video game writing, action is always gameplay, right? At least that's one of my rules. So yeah. it's like, you write the dialogue, you write the emotional stuff, you write the character beats, but goddamn, if you're going to be fighting a fucking zombie, do that in gameplay. Right. Don't do that in a cutscene. So, you know, writing the action parts of the story was always kind of taken care of for me because of right. the player doing it. Right. So that was honestly the biggest, I had never written action before and that How, was tough. Did you enjoy it though? I can't honestly say that I enjoyed it because it's a lot of work and yeah. I was new at it and it took a long time to get proficient at it to the point where I felt like I was, you know, doing something professional. Got it. So I had a, uh, a young adult author, horror author, Adam Caesar uh, on a couple of months ago who wrote a horror novel for young adults called clown in the cornfield. And it is insanely delightfully, deliciously gory. And it was really fun to hear him talk about writing slasher porn. I mean, it's not a porn book, but it's it's so gory in parts that I'm like, talk, you know, what is that process like? And it was, it's just really neat to hear 
that as a writer, yeah, you've got to sit there and really put yourself in that world. And it's almost like you're a guerrilla filmmaker watching what is going on in these action yeah. sequences. And then just, you're just transcribing it. It's really dude. You know, so what's, what's funny about that. Cause I, I find that fascinating. Is, yeah. that, is that posted online? I'd like to watch it. Uh, I'm episode. editing it right now. So it'll okay. be online in about a week. Dude, send me an email. I want to watch I it. I will. Uh, but but some of the things we were talking about earlier sort of tie into this because, again, there's creatures in my book and, you know, monsters, call them whatever you will. And it's, it's the, again, the challenge of coming up with something new, you know, because there are sequences with gore and sequences where horrible things are happening that, you know, I'm, to, right. I'm trying to find a way to describe it in a way that I haven't seen before. But just coming up with all that stuff and have it be something the reader has an experience a very similar process to what I would have done in a video game. I listen, I, I don't read a lot of horror. I love horror. I love games, movies, all that, but it's, I'd never, I never read a lot of horror prose. And the really interesting part that I discovered is, you know, you have a much part of his thing is sort of based on like teen slashers and in a slasher movie, it's, you know, what I, what blew my mind was it's fun to watch. Oh, there's the jock getting killed. Ha ha ha. That was a fun kill by Freddie or Jason or whatever. But when you've had the inner monologue of the jock for a couple of chapters and then he gets his head popped open like a watermelon, it's a very different <laughs> experience because you're like, but I know this guy, you know, it's it's I'll, yeah. I'll, it's a good interview. I'll send it to you. It's good stuff. Um, OK. Um, RJ says, what did Deacon see in Sarah? They have so little in common. Ricky is a better fit for him. Good game regardless, John good again good comment so what I, another thing i love about uh fans of days gone is that they're smart and they're perceptive and they yeah. ask good questions so uh yeah that again that was entirely intentional so in some ways it's kind of a trope to be honest it's like you know the love affair from you know the the two people who live on opposite sides of the tracks that's not a new idea right so you know it was kind of just building on that i wanted to have it be like their meet cute at the very beginning right when, you know, he comes across her and, you know, and she's stranded. That's all legit. I mean, I could see that happening in real life. So to me, it was just kind of keeping it real. And the feedback I got from, you know, from some of the early people who were responding to the game, um, women and men, was that it felt believable because, hey, you know, she's she's cool. She's got tats, right? She's got two sleeves. Right. She's got a little bit of attitude. She's not afraid. She's not afraid to climb on that bike. These are all things that would have attracted Deacon to her. So, um, I don't disagree that Ricky would have been a good match as well, because there was obviously you haven't gotten there yet, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of sexual tension between those two. Right. And that was kind of meant. In fact, I did get some pushback on that earlier because people were afraid that I was going to end up, you know, putting Deacon and Ricky together, that it was cheating somehow. And I kept having to remind everybody that he thinks she's dead. It's not cheating. if She's right. dead. And he doesn't know, you know, so yeah, there's t that tension was deliberate. I wanted players to fear and I, I guess I wasn't expecting as many players to sort of like wish that he had ended up with Ricky. Right. So but I, I, know, I'm still, so you saw a life of its own. The only spoiler for me is I, I was kind of fantasizing he would end up with uh, Tucker, but um, you know, whatever. She's dude. a fucking firecracker. You see how fast she drives. Also, that, by the way, how many you times see you how see... fast she drives that golf cart? Also, she's older than I am. I love that. I love that. That in a video. That's exactly so right. That, we don't. We don't talk about that. Anymore. No, it's I was very. Me, it's I not was about race. It's about age. I was very surprised in a good way when I saw her, and I'm like, "That's the leader of the other camp. She's awesome. <laughs> yes. She's very yes. cool. Yeah, and that must suck that you didn't get any kudos for that. It's like, nah, dude, I get. I get so little kudos except from fans. That's not. Well, that's <laughs> I all got, that I got. You know, I love them because they have. They see what's good in the game. Yeah, but I, dude, I. As a you know, as a developer, dude, over my entire career, I got very little kudos from from the press. Fuck them. I'm not I'm not Kojima. No, but you know what? You, you're 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 the meat and potatoes Kojima. Well, Jeff Jeff is Kojima, but you're uh, the meat, and that's good. I mean, it should, the funny thing is, is I love that about, and I don't know if you can say this about a lot of other publishers, game companies, but Sony's games. I I don't know you that well, but I just from this conversation. I can see you in Days Gone. I can see me in my games. I can absolutely see Corey in 2018. I only know Neil Druckmann through the press, but I get that that, I'm not saying the team doesn't add massive amounts and contribute their own souls, but that's a pretty cool fucking thing. So the press may not love you, but the fact that you've got a bunch of fans that connect with your, I mean, because they're connecting with you as a human, because yeah. you're, you are all over that game. I think that's a, it's kind of, 
disturbingly beautiful. Um, That's cool. Yeah. Clifton says, John, being that you create and play games for a living, do you feel kind of burned out on games in general or do you still enjoy them? Well, no, like I said, I'm gonna as soon as I get off the, the phone here, I'm gonna be firing up the uh, the new download for um, three point one four Path of Exile, and I'm gonna spend probably four or five hours playing that tonight. Nice. So I still love games. I abs I have found myself loving games again more now that I'm not making them. Like I have fallen so hard for the medium again. But when I was making them, I was I'm so competitive that it was very hard for me to look at other people's games that were better or doing something better than our game was and appreciate it as a gamer. I was more like those motherfuckers got there first. How can I, you know, that's where my head went. So I'm, I'm loving just being a fan. It's, it's a, a wonderful thing. Um, yeah, that's true. John says, Matthew, I wanted to say, I love your writing. Gabe Logan is my childhood hero. I love Mara Aramov. Romer's stronghold scared the crap out of me. Nice. I love you. That's him. Not me. I love you too, but I would say thank it you, with more thank you, sir. romance. Blue Eyes says, uh, when did he decide to add the O'Brien, O'Brien or O'Brien ending? O'Brien. O'Brien ending. When did you decide to add that? Uh, from the very beginning. So again, this is like, as a writer, one of the things that I know, um, it, it, and not everybody writes this way, um, is that you, you always want to know all of your endings really early in the process because you've got to work towards them and build towards them got it and so it you know so it's like what i had done was put together a sort of backbone of the entire experience which you know we're you know getting back to our earlier discussion about dev it's like it, it in some ways that's what kind of hurt the the process of building the game because it had this awesome backbone in fact in a lot of areas in a lot of ways we had shot a lot of it already and we'd had you know the story was structurally really sound at one point before the game was close to being there right and uh it was just hard to cut things because, you know, you couldn't cut this without affecting this, and this, and you of couldn't course, cut that. Right, so, right. so anyway, yeah, the O'Brien storyline. Um, and again, this is, what, dude, this is one of the things I love about games that you can't, I'll, I'll give you another one. Yep. Why games are better than movies or miniseries or whatever is you can have more story threads. They, I have a storyline for O'Brien that takes you into some missions. So again, not, not everybody was a fan of the, uh, of the Nero missions because they were a lot of stealth and sneaking around and listening and stuff. So I get that. But at least it was a different activity yep. than when you're, you know, going to a, you know, to a marauder camp and taking down all the marauders. So the, the point is, is that there were something like 20 main characters in Days Gone. Every single one of them has their own story arc. Every one of them. Goodness gracious. And they all, and they all have, they all relate to, in an important way, to Deacon. They all say something about who Deacon is. Deacon learns something from them, or the player can reflect on what does this mean when he does this with Iron Mike versus Schizo versus you know, Carlos. So it's like, so you're, okay. so the story, the complexity of the story is possible because you're in an interactive environment where you're switching back and forth with things way easier to do that in a, in an open world game than you could ever do in a novel. It's just too much to keep track of. So since I've started doing Unless you're George R. R. Martin, that's true. Well, he, he <laughs> cracked up at the end. The man can't even finish a fucking book. Um, okay. Since I started doing a lot of these conversations with developers and I don't know why I never really talked shop as much as I do now than I did when I was making games. But I have been incredibly impressed by on the on the on the lore and the narrative by a number of these guys I talk with and ladies, how much thought goes into it. Whether yes. you're talking about every character that's that, that that at least has a little meat on the bone is meant as a way to also not be entertaining, but also reflect some aspect of Deacon. Right. Yes. The f I had a conversation literally one of my favorite games last year that the critics savaged was called uh, Fast and Furious Crossroads. Right. Which was was a total B title, D title, but it was so much fun. But anyway, I was fascinated in talking to the director of it to learn that he literally designed the tracks uh, of that racing mission game, whatever, to reflect where the characters were in their arcs. So. The character's confidence, the character's <laughs> knowledge, all of that came into play because it was a story game. It's not like a multiplayer racing game. <clears throat> there is that component, but it's primarily a story game. And so what I, what I want to ask you is um, so many other mediums, <clears throat> excuse me, I was an English major. So, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I've sat in classes where we have just taken apart Clockwork Orange or, or whatever, right? So many other mediums or every other artistic medium seems to have that kind of discourse, right? Where it's like, 
Let's talk about why the track design is the way it is. Let's talk about all 20 characters. When you actually look at them together, you get this image of, of Deacon, right? And whether or yes. not that's through gameplay, when I will send you this link to, to Devoted, or whether it's through cutscenes, why is it, is it a... Is it that the critics are dropping the ball? Is it the medium isn't advanced enough to sustain a person to sort of understand that they can have those kind of conversations? Like, why do you think that is? I think it's because it's still a very, very young industry. Okay. Dude, when I started in 1990, um, and FYI, I also have a degree in English. So I was working on my, believe it or not, I was working on my doctorate in Shakespeare. Okay. When I was in Eugene, Oregon in 19, you know, I'd been there from 1986 to 89. Okay. And uh, there was this little company there called Dynamics. So I, you know, so I jumped ship from my doctoral program. Right. Um, but all the same stuff you're talking about, I sort of ingrained through 10 years of academia. So yes, there's a, for me at least, there was a, there was a very deliberate approach to how to interweave character and theme and story and place and, and make it greater than the sum of its parts. So to me, the best, like the, one of my favorite authors is Flannery O'Connor, who mm -hmm. um, wrote, a, you know, just some amazing short stories. And I don't know if she's still in vogue, but man, when I was teaching um, short story back in the mid eighties, I loved her stuff because there was just so much to talk about. It's like characters were never throwaway and actions always had meaning. And there was always a sense and a purpose to things. Um, and I feel like the only reason there's, well, there's two reasons. Not a lot of games do that. I think uh, the, the how do you the know that? How do you do... know that? I would never have known Fast and the Furious Crossroads had tracks designed to reflect the arcs of the character unless the director have told me. Yeah, well, that's a problem, right? That's what I'm, yeah. It's got to be. It's got to be inherent in the text. If the if the if the text itself, whether it's the game or the world or the writing or the cutscene or whatever, you've got to be able to discern it. You can't you can't go based at least. I, in fact, even when I was uh, when I was doing this for a living back as a student. If you if you try to make an argument that you know this text means this and it's based on anything outside of the text, you better damn well be able to prove it. You bet, you know, hey, uh, no, Shakespeare was actually reflecting, you know, Victorian norms when he wrote. And I'm like, no, that's not possible because you know he was 400 years before that. So, you, you, it's got to be visible. It's got to be okay. something you can experience. Okay. So then, why is it then? You're saying why don't why doesn't it get talked about when it's in there? Because nobody's trained to do it. Whose job is it? Is it a journalist job? Is it a critic job? A, it's, a, it's an academia job. Okay. So when I was a when I was in school, there were, there may be now, but there were no courses being taught in in um, gaming. You know, gaming, yeah. yeah. So looking at games, you know, examining games, nothing like that. And uh, you know, it's kind of like the like the the other books I'm working on right now are about the sort of examining how cartooning was taught in the early 1900s, because there's nothing about that either. It's like, there are no books, there's no websites, there's nothing other than some anecdotal stuff, but it was so important to, you know, generations, but there's nothing there. So, you know, and while I was in college, I was super into comic books and I was, I had written papers on Karl Barks and they allowed that. And I had, because his stuff is exactly what we're talking about. It's like, he has now this huge scholarship that has been written about his, you know, his work. And it's because there is all this deeper stuff that's embedded there. And in Bark's case, I'm 100% convinced it was unintentional. He was unaware and it's just part of who he was. Right. So, you know, but I'm sure that there are plenty of games out there that could be, that would lend themselves to critical analysis and critical theory. Who, who's gonna do it? Right. Because you gotta have the academic background. You also have to be a gamer and, you know, I would show, you know, like, you know, I would, um, to, to be honest, I think Jason Schreier could do it. He's got the, he's got the background and he's got the chops and he could, you know, and he's a gamer. So right. it's like, he could do that kind of thing. So I want, maybe there's just no money in it. I mean, maybe he's like, I'd rather, there's definitely I, no money. I'd, in ra it. I'd rather, I'd rather <laughs> spoil what Bind is working on is what he said. There's so. a reason I got out of academia because right. I was making more money as a lead artist within a year than any of my professors were making. Okay. I can't believe I'm saying this, but please don't send me any more super chats or if you do, I won't be able to get to them. I'm going to, I'm going to race through the final ones. Thank you guys so much for those super chats. I will get the ones that have been into John, but please don't spend your money because we we're, we're, we're killing the guy and you we're know, wrapping this we're up, wrapping it up and we're going to, we're going to get the live callers briefly, but let me, let me get these real quick. Um, Spartan ghost. I appreciate you giving that, but I'm not going to say that online. He's pitching an idea. I don't read ideas and I don't think John wants to hear your ideas. 
It's just legal. I couldn't do anything with them. So, yeah. You so, know, yeah just... But thank you for the super chat. Caveman says, in an open world game, what struggles did you have integrating the narrative with the gameplay and keeping Deacon's arc intact? So, again, I think this is something that uh, all open world games struggle with. You, you know, you, you have to you can't keep the player away from the controller for very long. So one of the things that I learned in all the games that I've written is that uh, if you look at my script, you'll find that most most scenes are one minute or less. It's like one page, a page right. and a half. So you get in, you get out. And so that, that kind of helps. We talked a little bit about the walk and talks yep. and the ride and talks. You know, it's awfully hard to have the player. It's awfully hard to deliver exposition when the player's on a bike and he's trying to like, you know, deal with stuff. So, you know, so Jeff and the team were really good about making sure that you couldn't get shot or attacked while you're in a mission. Right. Right. Because we have specific goals that we're trying to do. So I guess the, the, the short answer to that is just keeping the player engaged and trying to get them to listen to the story while there's other things going on. That's always a challenge. Interesting. OK, John R. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate it. Mr. Bill says, were there any plans for story DLC? You already kind of answered that. You, there were, if there were, not I, while you were there. I, well, and, it, it, and if there were, I couldn't comment on it. Because again, that's one of the things that, like we were just talking about, that's not my business anymore. That's right. Sony Ben's business. So I'm not right. going to comment on that. Fair enough. Okay, let's wrap these last callers. You good for that, John? Yep. All right, here we go. These guys have been waiting. Thank you guys very, very much. This is, uh, I forget how to say their name. They're an artist. They're in the game business. They're a concept artist. I'll just call you uh, Attack. We've talked before, but I don't know how to say your name. Go. You are on with John, John, John Garvin. Jeff hello? Cooper. Oh, oh. Uh, hello, uh, John. Yeah. Uh, um, hi. Um, I just wanted to say I'm a big fan of Days Gone and, and, and the story of the game, despite what the critics have to say about the game. But um, I would like to know, as a creative person and a concept artist myself, do you think there's still room to reintroduce and revitalize some of the some of Sony's legacy IPs like Siphon Filter, Mark of Cree, Sly Cooper, or even Siren in a modern way <clears throat> to their current and new audience and make these IPs still relevant today. Cool. Thank it's you, man. A, Thank a you, buddy. Part question. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I, again, this is just my own personal opinion. I really have no idea how viable they are in terms of the economics of it but certainly in terms of like i played mark of Cree, and again at, for at the time i thought it had a beautiful art style um you know and, and i think that there's a there's a there's there's lots of opportunity for sony to go in and you know revisit these things and make them you know new again or make them make them bigger and better for as, as, ga as game okay as games because i was gonna say even twisted metal twisted metal no one's as far as i know talking about a game but they are talking about a tv show Right. So I think the, there, there could be chances for them with uh, Assad's new group, the PlayStation production guys to maybe go, OK, we're not going to make a full game on this, but we could do something uh, with this intellectual property. I do. Uh, to be honest, I think there's a twisted metal game that could be made. I know you told Jeff that you didn't think there was, but not for the there, budget. If, but well, I don't know if the budget would have to be that high because your game was pretty procedural. And it didn't have a ton of story. And, you know, if you stuck with that and it right. just was about making the physics and the size and the scope of the stunts and the set pieces be spectacular, you know, that could be, number one, it could be a lot of fun. And it doesn't mean you necessarily have to reinvent the Ferris wheel. Right. I think the danger, though, is always that, uh, like, if you look at something like Destruction All-Stars, Destruction All-Stars, I think, is really fun, incredibly well-made, great. You know, the physics aren't great, but they're good enough. Great destruction. And it's kind of already, I think it's fair to say, kind of a dead game. I think yeah. there's there's a there's a demand among multiplayer. You know, you either got to get in just really lucky or you've got to not have enough meat on the bone. I worry that Twisted wouldn't, but you might be right. Okay, this is The Hunter talking to John Athengar Van. Go, Hunter. Oh, hey, how's it going? Hey, man. Uh, just want to say I fucking love Days Gone. I planned on PS4. And um, I had a question. If you had, as a writer, if you had a chance to revive any game series that has been like dead for the last few years, which one would it be and why? Thanks, bud. Thank you, man. Super good question. 
man, I don't know about revised because if it didn't have a really good story, good characters, I probably didn't play it, you know, but I, here's what I will say. I, man, when I got to, when I got to play with uh, Amy Hennig and in the uncharted universe, that was so much fun. Yeah. It was like, you know, so it wasn't mine, but I got to create a couple of characters and, you know, just playing in that playground um, and, and working with those creative people. That was, to me, that was a really good experience. And you have know, you talked to Amy in a while? I haven't, you know, so I saw her at dice a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure, honestly, what she's doing now, but she's, I have so much respect for her. I do too. She is at, um, I want to say it's sky dance or something. She's at a company in LA and she's trying to do my understanding is she's trying to do more mainstream interactive storytelling. The thing that they always cite is like Bandersnatch on Netflix sort of choose your own adventure. Although I think hmm. obviously she wants to go further than that. So my la last I heard, she's at that company trying to kind of get that. Cause I think her take is not incorrect, which is a lot more people would probably like games if there was a bit more accessibility. Um, sure. You know, so but I dude, think, Bandersnatch was not it. No, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> I at, hated at, that at, experience. At a structure, so like, uh. at a structure <laughs> though. Yeah, I hear you. This is AP99. Go AP. What's up, pal? Oh, my fault. AP, go. You're on. Hey, uh, I'm uh, wondering, uh, I'm, I believe that you wrote the whole game by yourself, John. Is that true? That is true. Yeah, um, that's impressive as hell because that's a long game, lots of dialogue and stuff. Nonetheless, uh, since you're no, no longer at the studio, do you believe that one of these younger, lazy millennials, as Jeff Ross put it, would be able to write, like, like do something like that? Because you're kind of like a visionary in that sense that you did the whole thing with just you. Do you think anyone can fill your shoes? Um, thanks, I, I would put, thanks for that question. I would put it differently. I would say that if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have done it by myself. Um, there's a reason why really, really good shows. So like Vince Gilligan is a brilliant creator and writer. He's a guy who did Breaking Bad and Vince Gilligan, uh, learned his chops on X files. And then when he, you know, he's, he worked on some other things, but you know, what he did with Breaking Bad is he hired a fucking writer's room. And the reason you do that is because, you know, you get more 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 minds working on it you can spread the work around i wouldn't have had to work as hard right so if i had it to do over again i wouldn't do it by myself and that's kind of you know something i sort of hinted at earlier it's like yeah i came from a generation where i can do it myself that doesn't mean that i should right you know so i i think that there are plenty of young writers out there who can fill my shoes There's no did question. you do you agree with jeff's assessment of millennials I don't honestly remember him saying, did he say something like he, really he, controversial? Well, it was just, in, it was, it was very, uh, not in a bad way or a good way, just surprising where he said, you know, one of the interesting things about Ben towards the end was there was a very different culture because you had a lot of millennials coming into the industry. And I want, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but if I remember correctly, the gist of it was there's sort of an entitled sense of, I want to be sitting in the captain's chair. I want to be Picard right away. Okay. No, I remember that now. Right. You know, so, you know, again, I know I've known Jeff for a long time. Right. I think he, there was a little bit of snark in that response, okay. to be honest. I think, you know, cause Jeff, I think, I don't know that he, that he really believes that. I don't think it's a generational thing at all. I think it's, as I told you before, I work a lot of crunch. I've always worked a lot of crunch. Right. And by the way, I know a ton of guys and gals in the industry who've always worked a lot of crunch and it's because we love what we do. That doesn't make somebody who's in the industry because, you know, they want to have a job and they enjoy what they do, but they want to have their life and their family. They're not bad people. You know what I mean? So they're not, so to me, no. it's not, it, but, but I've known people like that at, at dynamics. I've known people like that at Idetic. I've known people like that at Sony. It's like, they're, they're not bad people because they want to have a life and they're, and they resent having to put in long hours. So I don't think it's a, it's an entitlement thing based on the millennial generation. No, I disagree with that. I think it's basically how hard do you want to work? How much investment right. are you going to put into your career? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice? And, you know, again, I think I told you earlier, I, you know, I have, I sec, I second, I doubt myself from when I was in my thirties and was willing to sacrifice a lot. Right. And, right. And maybe more than I should have. Well, what do you, okay. So forget the, forget the generation part, but 
you know, my answer to crunch is always, I mean, within, within reason, there's obviously, like you said, there's bad management. There's stuff like that that does get in the way. Sure. But if you want to be the best, right, it's going to take an extraordinary, almost by definition of what it means to be the best, effort on the part yes. of the people creating. And so there, I agree, you're not a bad person if you want a nine to five or a 10 to six or whatever, but you may not be in the right business if you want to work on games that are trying or anything that's trying to be the very best. I mean, when you agree with that? I definitely think it's true that the difference between games and, and film or television is that they're, they've been doing it a lot longer and they don't have the, that pesky little interactivity, find the, find right. the, find, find the, the fun, thing, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, so you can read a script for a movie and have a pretty clear idea of whether that movie's going to be shit or not. At right. least I can. And the, I can't read the script for a game and know whether it's going to be a good game or not. And right. that's the thing. So I definitely agree that if, you know, if, if you want to be the top of, of the field, it's going to take more hours and more effort and more time than if you're willing to be mediocre. Right. 100% agree. Okay, fair enough. Okay, uh, this is uh, Rob the Mod, who mods our stream. Robert says, well, I'll let Robert say. Robert, go. Hey. Oh, okay. I was just screening calls of it all. I actually have a question for uh, Orbital Nomad, who was he had to leave for work, but he, he asked, uh, what was the biggest piece of advice for computer science game development college majors? All right. Thanks, Rob. Um, well, it, interesting question. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a degree in computer science. So, um, you know, oh, so here's a fun story. So actually my experience with computers goes way back before I worked at Dynamics. I actually owned an Atari 800 mm -hmm. and we're talking, you know, I bought it to play uh, Star Raiders right? back in the, oh, yeah. in the late 70s, 79, 80. And so I started programming immediately. My first game that I programmed was in basic on Atari 800. It was an uh, Ultima Club. Okay. So it was ASCII graphics and you're moving this little dude around and you're exploring and stuff. So, you know, I, that's my experience with uh, engineering. So right. it, I know my, uh, my oldest son got a, a degree in computer science and he's now got a really good job. So, but he's not working in the game industry mostly because he saw what I went through. <laughs> um, really? So okay. Wait, well, that's, that's true. Yeah. I because mean... he saw the hours and he saw the, the amount of, you know, just the amount of effort and sweat and blood and tears that goes into this industry. So my advice is do what you love, because no matter, you know, no matter what your degree is, if, you know, you'll find a way to be happy and to make money at it. If you're doing what you like, it's like if you, you know, if you end up getting a computer science degree because you think that's where the money is and you hate it, you're, you know, right. you hate math or you hate, you know, programming. That's not a good way to live your life, dude. It's like I am. I am very interested, though, in your son saying I'm not doing that because I saw what dad went through. I mean, because I have yeah. this, I have this assumption that, and that's where I do, you know, put a lot of credit with someone like Jason Schreier, where the more stories come out about simply how fucking hard this is, especially if you want to play at a level, whether you're making an indie game or a triple A quadruple A game, uh, if you want to play at a level of best of the best, it, it is all encompassing. Uh, yes. of your time and your soul and your life. And you do the best you can with the other stuff that hopefully your life doesn't fall apart while you're doing it. And more and more people discover that. I don't, I wonder if these companies are going to have a harder time attracting talent because it's always been that there were always enough people willing that were young to come in and take care of the burnout. But so dude, here's okay. So th this is something I want to throw out there because I think it's super interesting. Yeah. And in case Jason Schreier is listening to, to your show yeah um there's never been a study it's like yeah his book covered how horrible overtime is and whatever i don't know because we're just talking about anecdotal data like yeah. my story your story yeah what we know whatever there's no there's no study out there that shows a correlation between the highest rated games the highest paid developers the highest rated uh, metacritic scores and the amount of hours and overtime and effort in years of development that it took to get there there's no study so it feels like there should be because that's data that's out there. That's data that's mineable. I I, so I think why not I, have somebody why not have somebody mine that data and I, put together a real study? I, I I don't think you're wrong, but I think you can look at Naughty Dog, Santa Monica, sure. um, uh, even you guys because you guys crunched on Days Gone. Uh, you know, you, you can look. The, the the one thing I'll say is where you get into a little bit of interesting area 
is it seems the companies that crunch the most in games are the ones like Sony or that have a higher propensity to crunch are the ones like Sony that have production value as one of the key pillars, right? True. Like if you look at Hades that came out, um, I know that they probably worked hard in crunch, but it wasn't a death march because that's a gameplay game and, a, and it's beautifully written as well, but it's not about blowing your mind out with amazing graphics and technology. And so I have to imagine there is a correlation there, but you're right. I don't think the guys who made the first version of Among Us probably crunched too much, or if they did, it wasn't that long, right? And that's a huge right. success. So I, it's interesting. It is, I think I, I agree with you. All right, uh, let me get the last two Super Chats, uh, not Super Chats, uh, calls. This is Zim. He's been waiting a long time. Zim, go. What's up, buddy? Oh, yo. Hey. What's up, John? Hey. So, yeah, um, the secret engine today is gone, too. Kind of ends on a cliffhanger. You know, super strong uh, freakers that maintain the future. And, you know, the guys in the black helicopter and all of that. Yes. You might you might not have a chance to write Days Gone to if they even make it. So what would be your idea? Where would you take that franchise in the sequel? Thanks, man. Great question. Hey, sorry, sorry you had to wait so long to, to ask that because I can't answer it. So, dude, here's the thing. Is, of course, I have opinions about that, but... It's kind of one of those NDA things. It's like, you know, I don't know what Ben Studio is working on. For all I know, they could be working on a sequel. And, you know, whether they use my ideas or not, I don't have a, I don't have a clue. So to me, that's just, you know, that's kind of, that's their property. They they, they have to be the ones to talk about it. If you have anything, an... and in fact, I, I said this all during development. And even in the last two years that I haven't been at the studio, every my point has always been, I will, I'm willing to talk about anything that is actually in the game. You know what I mean? I very seldom talk about things that are not in the game. Like even our discussion about the about the uh, you know the split cutscenes and you know the morale choice system. The only reason I'm talking about that today is because we were given the okay to talk about that during our I you know our oh. our, uh, our our interviews with the uh, with the uh, what what you call it way back in the day. So if it's if the information is out there, I'll talk about. it. But I won't talk about things that are in the future or you know things that would be disclosing information. Do you um think? talking about black helicopters and all the all the uh what, what are the scientists nova no no nero nero are you a conspiracy guy do i believe in conspiracies like no. are you okay you don't believe in anything that's a conspiracy i mean what do you no. mean by okay so 9 11 was as the story that you 9 11 were... was some terrorists from saudi arabia flying some airplanes into buildings okay that's what 9 11 was gotcha okay all right um this Wait, is, you're not implying that you do believe in them. I don't believe in a lot of things. I have certainly seen evidence as of late with a couple of documentaries that I keep looking on the internet to have debunked because I'm inclined to believe most conspiracy theories are shit and stupid and the, uh, the you know, but some are true. Some are true. Interesting. Um, and, and I saw this documentary and I was just like, that's interesting, right? That's fascinating. So, you know, what's so here's something that maybe most of your audience doesn't know. None of this is new. It's like I told you that my mom was was the secretary founding member of the National Association mm -hmm. of Keeping Bear Arms. Yep. They were heavy into conspiracy theories. Yes. They were con they were convinced that the federal government was was trying to do away with the Second Amendment and they were going to come in a truck and confiscate your guns so that they could start the First World Order, which was run by a secret Jewish cabal. I know. Dude, I grew up with these stories. And right. This is like, this is not new. This These conspiracy theories yeah. have been around for a long time. What is new is the internet. So right. you have the ability with Facebook and Twitter to just, you know, have people, and YouTube especially, and just have like the most convincing people People say the stupidest yeah, shit and, and, and people and take you, it seriously. Well, and you don't know what's real, right? That's why I'm always like, okay, that's pretty compelling. I need to go do some research because if that's accurate, that's kind of crazy. Doesn't and, it always come down to Occam's razor? Dude, it's the simplest possible answer. What happened on 9-11? Some terrorists threw some, flew some buildings. Yeah, okay, but some okay, into buildings. I'm going to get to these last calls, but I will tell you that this documentary is called Seven. It's about World Trade Center Seven that collapsed, right? And the and it does go to Occam's Razor, because you've literally got about eight clips, and they were broadcast, and they're in the documentary, where the news media and other people, well before that building collapse, said that building's going to be brought down. The news reported it like five minutes before it happened. That's the first part. The second part 
is all of the engineers that they put together and said, explain to us how a building with steel beams like this collapses. They said before 9-11, it never happened. It happened with one building. It happened with two buildings. And now it's happening with three buildings. And they said yeah. the only way mathematically that building could collapse is if you took out the center structure and then the exterior structure afterwards. And they did all, and they said they went through the government NIST report and they said, all of this doesn't make sense scientifically. And the NIST people got back to them at a PR level and said, oh, it makes sense. But no engineer would sign their name to the NIST report. I'm not saying, yeah. it, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying that that makes me go, I need to go do some research because no, I get it. that's bizarre. But that's, but that's why, that's why, that's kind of why the country's where it's at right now. Because everything you just said sounds really reasonable, but it's also all bullshit. I, and it's like, I, I'm, not saying it's like it's, I'm not saying it's not, but how do you know it's all bullshit? Because you're because I'm going to get offline and I'm before I go into the path of exile and I'm going to go to Snopes and I'm going to look it up and they're going to say right. no this was refuted this was refuted this yes refuted. I do the same so it's just like it's like oh the moon landings were all fake because you can tell because of all, and they have a very convincing it's, it's documentary. dumb it's dumb I've seen a convincing documentary for why the Earth is flat. No. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like no my you know my my take on it is no conspiracy is real it's all bullshit convince me otherwise. And that's okay, my tag. last question I got to ask. Just got to ask you real quick. Maybe you should come. I'm, I'm debating this this Sunday with somebody. Um, do you believe that the military in the 60s tried to kick off a false flag operation, killing Americans, the mil U.S. military, and blaming it on Cuba as a reason to attack Cuba? I have no knowledge of that whatsoever. So okay, that exists. John F, John F. Kennedy shot it down. That that was declassified about three sure. years ago. And it's like, you're telling I, me the government. I was just going to say, no, I was just going to say that I know the CIA and was involved in some sh shenanigans, right? right? So I know that they were responsible for bringing down governments and, yeah. you know, the Shah of Iran and blah, blah, blah. So it, th I yeah. that would not have surprised me. I'm very skeptical of all this, but I'm also very interested. Okay, last question. He's been waiting a long time. Anthony, buddy, you made it. You are on with Big Bad Johnny Garvin. No, you're not. Come back, bud. You Come put him back. in the wrong room, I dude. I put him in the wrong room. You're on with Big Bad Johnny Garvin. Go. What's up, Anthony? Hey. Hey. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. Hey, bear with me while I try to explain my uh, my question. Okay. Um, why do you think Sony fails to realize the potential in all of these epic RPG studios like Final Fantasy, Bethesda with Elder Scrolls Fallout, um, all these games that you can build off the lore for the next 50 to 60 years, why is it that for the last 12 to 15 years they just focus on action-adventure titles? I mean, I have a theory, but you go uh, with yours. I, I, well, okay, so Thanks, again, this is, just, this is just my personal opinion, and take it for what it's worth. I think from my experience that Sony has always been the sum of its developers. Mm -hmm. If they had a passionate developer who loved RPGs, you can better believe they would be making an RPG somewhere. So that's kind of my theory. That's it's my like, that's my answer as well. I heard Gorilla might be making kind of an open world RPG. I don't know, but it, that's exactly right. If you can convince Sony there's money in the hills and you're the right people to do it, I don't think they have a... Uh, 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 there's no rule against it, no, right? No, I never, no. not when I was there, not not at all. I, yeah. got, I got two more. Can you do two more? Yeah. All right, dude, here I'm, we go. I'm good. All right, Ricardo Estevez is coming in all the way from Conspiracy Theory, Nevada. What's up, pal? Hi. I, can you hear me? Yep, we can yes. all hear you. Go. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, John. Yes. Um, have you been to Portugal before? I'm sorry, have well, you been to where? Portugal. To Portugal. 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 No, I've never been to Portugal. Because I'm sure I've, I've done an interview with you before. It's possible. Uh, so anyway. I did, <laughs> I did the big I did the big Sony tour just after or just before Days Gone shipped, right? So I was in Spain, I was in Madrid, I was in Berlin. Did you go to any of those conferences? No, no. Hmm. Maybe uh, uh, some other time. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, um I know who you are. Uh I know who Jeffy are, I know who who who, who most people are are in the industry. But I think uh unlike uh movies um most people don't know who who are the people behind the games yes that's true and i'm wondering why why is that i know part of the reason perhaps is on me and my my colleagues the press 
but I don't think that's the only uh, issue. Uh, why don't we see? Why don't we see more uh, Ken Levine's, more Hideo Kojima's, like games, almost outer games, uh, made by outers? Uh, why don't you see that I think, more often? Okay, so we, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but I, I think just to sort of... I'm sorry, I had to miss a bit of the, the stream. If, so sorry no, if, no, no, if no. you talked about no, this before. Ricardo, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it as always. Thank you, sir. Yeah, sure. All right, man. Talk to you soon. All right, go. What do you think, John? Right, so I just wanted to clarify some things that I said earlier because I, I didn't want to come off as saying like PR you know, or marketing refuses to allow us to have a presence in the public eye. It's more a case of, you know, like in, even in my case, it's like I, I to this day feel some guilt if I say I instead of we. Oh, sure. That's of just that's just the, because it's a team effort and it's that's a right. team thing. And the last thing you want, something they could no one could ever accuse me of being is a prima donna. Like, oh, he's got, you know, he's a glory hound. He's out there saying he did everything, blah, blah, blah. I was never that guy, that yeah. guy. Right. So it's like I'm always trying to figure out a way to get credit where it's due, you know, pump people up and, you know, make sure people are aware of that. This is, this takes a huge team, yep. you know, it's not just me. So, you know, like on the last question or a qu couple of questions ago, when the guy's like, you wrote the whole thing. Yes, I did write the whole thing. That's just a fact, but you know, that's not trying to say, Hey, do I think I should be as famous as Kojima? You know, if the game had sold 20 million units and blah, 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 then maybe, but it, it just feels like, it's a team. It's a team industry it, more so it, than it, other industries. At so. least at that scope, I, I I think a lot of too is if you remember uh, back in the uh, you know maybe back when I was still at Sony as an employee and stuff, there was a time when the industry, the the journalist industry, did seem to focus on personalities. I was one of them. Cliff was one of them. Ken Levine was one of them. American McGee. Amer right. And ultimately <laughs> though, what you find is even with Kojima, um, it is, it is about so many different people. And one of the reasons I think Sony has been so successful is Sony does a brilliant job. Like I hate the term masterclass because it has become so overused that it's cringy but i do think it applies here which is they have done they, they if to watch them work at a management of creative level it's a master class because th the roadies of the world the shannons of the world the connies of the world um they don't get the kudos as much at least from developers but we know you know, people have said to me, why, why did you do drawn to death with Sony? You had two other offers. It's like, I had two other offers, which were better offers, but I knew with Sony, I was going to have the best chance of not only just shipping a game, but having the best game possible because they understand. And like you said, they gave you guys time to figure out that the layout of the first, uh, world map of days gone wasn't fun. And Rody knows right. enough as a gamer to know, I know what the consequences are. I don't necessarily know if executives and other publishers know, hey, it looks fine, it's beautiful, go, just go, just go. And you end up with things that aren't as good as Sony's games. So I, I, I think a lot of it, uh, you know, is that the press eventually realized that that's not just one guy. That's a group of people with a vision to make something great that they all have to be contributing. So... That would be that would be my gut answer. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay. Last question is from Hunter. Hunter, you are on with Jonathan yes, Derby the third. Go. Hunter. Oh, uh, oh, I was gonna ask. Uh, do you think everyone's gonna be somewhere like in the universe where uh, Days Gone and Last of Us can somehow go through with each other? Okay. Thanks, bud. Thank you. I think your answer is no, right? Because you don't like the cross pollination. On that level, it's no, yes. And also on the level of, I don't know, I don't have anything to do with either franchise. So, right. okay. just on a purely speculation level, um, I you... would say no because it seems like the stories behind Clickers and Freakers is pretty different. So, well, did you guys get pushback? I mean, Last of Us Two was 2014. You guys were 2019. You obviously knew Last of Us Two was going. Was there a sense of, Ugh, I don't know, guys, Naughty Dog is already making a, a similar post-apocalyptic zombie game, even though they're not zombies, whatever, they're zombies. Um, was, that a, was that a problem? It was not a problem. And, you know, in 2020 hindsight, from the perspective of, 
you know, the, the, the public, you know, I can see, oh, yeah, maybe that should have been a problem. Um, no, I, it wasn't at the time because, dude, the games are so different. It's like, yeah. you know, in, in one game, you're mostly on foot and you're mostly doing, you know, elaborate traversal puzzles and you're, you know, doing stealth combat in enclosed areas and beautiful graphics, but it's all very confined. Whereas Days Gone is open world motorcycle horde. So yeah. it's like, to me, if you're looking at two green light pitches with <laughs> bullet points, they are so different. You know, what's interesting about that is, and that's all the calls, guys. Thank you very much. What's interesting, seriously, thank you guys for waiting. I'm not being dismissive. I'm like, thank, seriously, thank you guys for adding to the show. Great comments, great questions. Uh, thanks for being so patient. I appreciate it. Um, you know, a lot of people give sh Sony shit right now because it is becoming a bit more, a lot more, depending on who you asked, corporatized. You know, it's becoming a lot more straight laced. I mean, I literally for, you know, Alan Becker, right? I, yeah, I know Alan. Really yeah, well. I literally hired two strippers to come into Sony Foster City's office for his 30th or 40th birthday. And sure. my boss who ran the place was like, sure, whatever. I mean, that it's it's a different company. Things change. Right. But yeah. one of the things I think now, which is good is that probably marketing or, or Jim Ryan or whoever would look at days gone and they would look at last of us and go, you have to, ha one of you guys has to, has to blink because like you said, one of those guys that weren't, that didn't have a seat at the table before would now say, that's not good for market. G give me days yeah. gone, but set it in space. Give me days gone, but do that. You know, right. you know, you can do a biker game in space would have been fucking cool, but still, you know, I think there's value yeah, there. Totally. Um, okay. I have one more question for you. I have a few more. Well, questions. real quick. Yeah. Let, so here, dude, here's what I would say. Cause I, again, this is a narrative that I don't entirely agree with. Yes. I can see where on the surface people might think Sony's heading in that direction. But on the other hand, I, you know, just from what I've read in the news, yeah. um, I know Sony Ben's working on something. Nobody knows what that is. It could be really cool. It could be really esoteric. It could be really out there. Who knows? You know? So I, it's like, I think there's so much opportunity for creativity and for doing things. You know, do, do I think the days of hiring strippers for going away parties or birthday parties are gone? Oh, yes, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I'm not. Yeah, I, I, I hope nobody <laughs> thinks I'm saying that should come back. I'm, I'm not saying that. Right. Dude, I um, went to a Christmas party in London. Yeah. A Sony Christmas party because we were there for a green light and they had and they do this thing called Turks and Vickers. Do you know what that is? No. All the waiters and waitresses were dressed up as priests and hookers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and that was at a Sony corporate event. So, but it's a thing, right? So in England, yeah. Tarts and Vickers is not offensive, or at least it wasn't right. 10 years ago or whenever I was there. So, but I, you know, I do think it's, it's not a bad thing to have, you know, everybody be a little more woke and a little more aware and I, a I'm, little more inclusive. And Sure. I, I think that's true. I think the fear is not that I'm, I'm all for woke. I think the fear is that the creativity, because if you ask Jason Schreier, he would tell you, he knows what's happening at Bend. And he would say, I think, and Jason, if you're watching or if you're you know, going to paraphrase, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. If I remember your article, you were suggesting that part of Bend, which is called Naughty Dog North by a number of people at Naughty Dog, they are doing support on a multiplayer game for Naughty Dog, which I assume is going to be Factions for Last of Us. And they are also noodling around with a new IP that may or may not be greenlit. That's what he thinks is happening up there. But I think the concern, though, is that people are looking in and just having a very normal reaction to the fact that Sony is looking more and more uh, uh, safe and they don't like that as much. And I think we've discussed this. We know why they're looking safe, because when you're spending that kind of money, you know, take, you know, but hopefully they'll still do the small stuff. You know, just like Disney is doing the crazy big Dude, stuff. I think here's the thing, though. It's like, again, I, I don't agree because uh, The Last of Us 2, whether you liked it or not, was anything but safe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but you have It's to, like, yeah. oh, my God, that was not a safe thing to do. And it I was agree. not a safe approach. And it was not safe in terms of marketing or approach to storytelling or anything. So right. kudos to them for putting out something that was daring I, I, and bold in terms of its narrative and its approach to gameplay. And, you know, right. it I, gives us something to talk about. I agree. I, I love that game. One of my favorite games. And I didn't like it at first because yeah. I hated the first one, but I love the second one. I'm talking more, though, about, you know, the optics right now is not... Last of Us 2 is old generation for a lot of people. They're looking at it now and they're saying... Okay. 
Yeah. You know, what is happening under Jim Ryan and Herman Holst? And, and again, Sony doesn't have to say shit. Sony can wait till summer and everybody all is forgiven. But right yeah. now there's a vacuum of information and we have things that we're seeing and we're hearing that Kojima is talking to Xbox. We're seeing MLB coming to Game Pass day one. We're seeing all these things that if you love Sony like a lot of us do, you feel like Sony's getting like Rocky Balboa in the corner, just having his hands up and getting punched. And we're in the audience screaming, hit, hit back, you know, and it's not to say you're wrong that Sony's not, but when they don't say anything, you leave a window to speculate. And in that maybe yeah. Sony's like, so what speculate all day, motherfucker. We're over here making the next big thing. And they might be, I, you know, so I, again, I haven't been following that, uh, that chatter very closely. So, right. but I, but I can tell you this, and I was gone before, before Herman was, was put in charge and yeah. she moved over to independence. Here's what I will tell you yeah. is that I worked with Herman, you know, sort of con- tangentially, they were working on kill zone. We were doing siphon. Yep. And so on. So that dude is a genius as far as I'm concerned. If you're worried about where Sony's going because of, of the games they want to make or whatever, I, you don't have to be worried about that because they went from doing Kill Zone to doing, you know, Horizon, which is to me yeah, that's a, a big very jump. innovative game. And not just in terms of, you know, the, the main protagonist, but, you know, I thought the gameplay loops were all pretty solid and, and the environment was was interesting and the concept was interesting. It was it was a very, very sort of team driven yeah. game. And I think it was very successful. So, you know, a lot dude, of to it... me, to me, Herman is the right dude to, to step up and, and take Sony and wherever, whatever direction they're going to go in. That's cool. I'm not worried about that. It's okay. like, to me, they're, they've always made good games and I think they're going to continue to. Oh, I don't think the game quality is going to go down at all. Um, but I mean, good in, sen- in the sense of innovative and new and something you haven't seen before. And it feels like some of the chatter you're describing is worried that it's going to become milk toast. And, yes. You know, yes. And very sort of corporate cleaned or whatever. And I don't know that that's going to be a problem. I think you are wrong, but we will see. I, I, I think you're right about the people. I think you're right about the but quality. The, but the business is always the people. Well, it's always the people. Yeah. But these people now have a, and I don't, I'm not saying Shu or Sean or Phil or Kelly flock would have handled it any different. But now when you're dealing with the risk, the financial risk, I think the logical move is to turtle up a little bit. The fact that Days Gone 2 is on the back burner at best, canceled for all time at worst, and was profitable. If that's true, because you don't know that to be true. I do know that to be true. No, I don't. No, I don't. I know. <laughs> I was going to th- say, you don't know. I, okay, here's true. what I know. I know. Here's what I know to be true. From three different people I talked to, they're all telling me it made its budget back, but it underperformed in terms of the expectations. That mm. I don't know if that's true. There's only a handful of people in the world that would know if that's true, and I'm not one yeah. of them. But I'm telling you that these three people, maybe they know. Okay, but you're right. If it didn't make its money back, sure. Then, 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 then my point is moot. But assuming it exactly, made, that's yeah. kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, but if it made its money back, what what I'm saying is. We are in a world now where a game can be as loved as Days Gone and potentially profitable as Days Gone. Not crazy profitable, but profitable enough that they didn't lose their shirt. Sure. And, and they're still not greenlighting a sequel. I'm just saying that, yes, the people make the difference in the company, but these are people who are dealing with an industry. You've never seen this scope before. You've never seen these budgets before. The way one responds I'm, to dude, that. All I'm, all I'm saying is that but you, the thrust of your argument is that this is because of Jim Ryan and, you know, some some corporate direction. And I'm like, no, it could just be because the guys at Ben Studio don't want to do another one. Could be that. I mean, it's like, hey, open world games are a lot of work. They're huge. They they take a ton of yeah. technology. And, man, it's content. A lot. Of, it's right. entirely possible yes. those guys have a different thing they want to work on. That's possible. It is possible. I don't know because I'm not there. So, you know, and I don't know who you talk to. Yeah. But it just seems like, again, the narrative out in the Twitter sphere is – is based on, you know, people make assumptions and then they jump to conclusions and that suddenly becomes fact. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know that that's fact. No, that's true. And that's another reason Sony might want to say something if they care. But what, I mean... I totally agree with you on that. They should should end the black hole and make some announcements or whatever. My guess is they have have something planned, right? They're going to have an event or something. Um, Yeah, I mean, I can... I I interrupted you, dude. You said you had another question for me. Yeah, I I just... It's so hard, but I'm not going to because I know certain things and just like you do. And we're not going to say certain things. Like, oh, I'd love to just fucking say, yeah, Jim, but what about this? And you're, yeah, well, you know. 
Um, <laughs> what was I going to ask? Oh, I know. Yeah. So the last thing I'll say about that is that um, a lot of the people who have the complaints, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but you game on PC as well, right? Yes. I think if you are in the console space exclusively, it mm. is easy to begin to look at the output of studios and go, where did the creativity go? But there's a lot of creativity happening in the industry. It's just that the real fringe weird shit that you used to get on PS1, PS2, more and more of that you're going to see on on uh, on PC, I think, just because it's cheaper. It's, I totally agree. Yeah. And I, and I, but I think that's, a, that's an arc that's been happening since I was in the industry, right? So yeah. it's like it was always... You know, you could get first generation PS1 games that were pretty strange and esoteric and I didn't understand. Right. You know, and then you could, you know, you, but all, those games have been migrating to smaller platforms or to, you know, like Steam. You can do an yeah. indie Steam game or an, or an iPhone game, you know, for a lot less than you can do. Oh, know, fuck yeah. Game. Oh, God. God. Yeah. Absolutely. So that, that makes total sense to me that that okay. would happen. My last question Game Pass, subscription services. I'm a big fan. I'm on board. I think they're going to be good for the business good for game design. A lot of people think I'm a fucking moron. What do you think about Game Pass, PS Now, that whole thing? Not streaming, but subscription services. I think that I I see a... Dis, all right, so I'll, I'm going to give you a long answer. Good. And take, take from it what you will. Okay. I hate the fact that most of my applications and tools that I need to make a living have moved to subscription. Like you can't just buy a copy of fucking Word. You got to you got to pay Microsoft. Photoshop's you know, 40, the same, right? Forty bucks a year. Yeah. Same thing with Photoshop and the suites and all. I'm not a fan of that. That's just a money grab on their part, in my opinion. So you know, I've been using the same copy of Photoshop for you know ten years or something, just because right. I fucking own it. Right. And it's like you know, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of subscriptions when it's just the corporation trying to make more money off of products that it can't get you to to upgrade every year because you don't need to upgrade it every year. So I'm not a fan of that. Okay. I'm also not a fan of all the streaming that we see going on right now. So now I have to have CBS and NBC and HBO Max and, you know, fucking ESPN Plus And, you know, I'm not a fan of that either. It's like, okay. dude, I grew up in an era where there were three channels, ABC, well, CBS. Well, sure. NBC. And, and PBS, right? Right. It, but it, to me, it's like, it's going to fail. There's no way it's sustainable. And I don't know if, it, if the same thing is going to be true in games, but, you know, it's like, can you afford your PlayStation subscription and your Xbox subscription and your Steam subscriptions and your Epic subscriptions? Maybe, but, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not. So it, to me, it's just going to be about how many dollars are you asking the consumer to, to shell out to, to subscribe to your products, your product line. So I Netflix, when it was the only game in town, even though it made them a lot of money, I thought it was a pretty good deal. It's like, all right. right. Now all the Disney content's been yanked and I have to pay for Disney plus to get that same content, you know? So, and the same thing with the Marvel content. So it's like they, they, the content is getting spread across too many subscription bases. Um, you're not going to get consumers to buy them all. Dude, it's what happened to MMOs. So in the, in the early 2000s, dude, I played every MMO from EverQuest right. all the way through Conan and everything. In oh between. yeah. Yeah. And, uh, at the end of the day, they started failing because people couldn't invest the time. It's like, I love your MMO, but dude, I don't have the time. I can't spend, right? You know, ten hours in World of Warcraft and then get offline and spend ten hours in. But I mean, is, know, isn't that just the normal capitalist grind? I mean, every product that's successful, you're going to have, you know, for every Coke, there's a Pepsi, and then yes, there, and then there's a couple. But there's of, only Coke and Pepsi. Well, and then there's and then there's the th like you could say there's Netflix. Nope, there's or Coke and Pe no, nope, there's sure they're, of the Coke flavored products. Coke and Pepsi are it. Yes, there's, you can have uh, what are the other ones? Uh, RC Cola. Even, you can have RC sure. Cola. It's a has been. It's a it's an also run. Well, okay, but that's like saying that you can have um, Netflix and Disney and HBO Max, but you can't have Shutter. Shutter's doing a great business. They're just doing it at a smaller scope, right? Never heard of them, so they're that's, not doing a great business. Well, they are. They're, <laughs> it's exclusive horror. It's just horror uh, content. Oh, you know what? I do have a subscription to that. Now that I that you mentioned it, yeah, dude. Here's why. Here's why I couldn't have told you because I bought it through an app okay. on a Blu-ray that no longer works. Right. On a Blu-ray player, and it was only like something ridiculous, like a dollar ninety nine a year. But it's great, so, right? It's gr Shutter's awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So my point though is that I I do think there's not going to be room for all of them, but that's when you release anything. When you release anything that's successful. There's only so many people who rush in. There's only so many battle royales 
before the, the, the bottom drops out. But fundamentally, you don't like the subscription service for I still games, think sustainable. though. I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think it's sustainable. There's, because there's too many people to just coming more, in. There's, there's too, there's going to be, yeah, there's going to be too many people who can't afford to play, to pay for multiple subscriptions at once. Do you think it's weird? Maybe the real money to be made is in, and I know there's an app that does this, but it hasn't caught on yet. I always find it fascinating that you pay, say, $15 a month for HBO Max and then just kill it when you're not using it that month. It's like, oh, nothing's right. here I want to watch this month. I mean, that's, but, dude, that's exactly what I do. So why is it not sustainable? If most people do that, what's the problem? It's a pain in the ass. Right. So maybe the money is in the app. <laughs> it's like, hey, yeah. here's, you know, it's the start of the month. Which it's ones pain. do you want? That, 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 hit the button, you're done. There's money there, I think. Yeah, I'd subscribe no, totally. to that. Johnny Garvin, we did it. What do you think? It was epic, dude. It was uh, a good? really good interview. Your show's really good. You have, uh, I didn't get any of the calls that Jeff got, but maybe that's just because I'm a better guest and Well, and Jeff. we had some good mods. We had Rod in there going, and you are, yeah, you know, well, he's got the beard, like you said, but you're better looking. Um, but, but you had a good time? It was fun. It was fun. Good. Dude, I've been sitting here for four hours and I never once felt the need to get up and stretch or whatever. So okay. it's been fun. It's been engaging. And, uh, you know, I think hopefully your audience liked it. That's I hope really so. Counts, yeah. Right. Oh, well, so yeah. I had fun. Good. Good. Jason I Schreier. I could have done this without an audience. And it Me too. Been just as Me fun. too. Jason Schreier's article accurate or not from what you know. Um, I honestly do not know. Everything he's talking about is completely outside of my. I, you know, I know Michael Mumbauer, like I said, but I have no idea what those guys are doing. Okay. If if his if his reporting is accurate, I didn't even know that they were working on their own game. So, right, I, dude, I don't know. It's like so. I have no idea if his if his story is accurate or not. I do know, as I mentioned at the at the start, that I think the story's been edited since the first time I read right. it. I think that my name has been taken out of it. And I do, do you the, know what they were working on? I do. Do you know what they were working on at I Bend when 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 Jeff left? I do not. You have no idea? No, I was gone for a year by then. You don't talk to these people? Not about work. Dude, that, again, that's a, that may seem strange, but that's why I was kind of anxious to know how you know things because, dude, we, we just don't. It's like there's a sort of a, I don't know, code of honor. It's like we just don't – we don't talk business. Like okay. I know better than to ask them what they're working on that's because it's fair. putting them in an unfair position. And you know, I don't want to put somebody in a position of saying, oh, man, you know I can't tell you that. Right. You okay. know, that's like – it's right. like – Ask him how his wife's doing. You know? Okay, yeah, that's true. Well, everybody's divorced because of crunch, because of Sony. You know, it's a death march. There's a lot of truth to that. There's dude. a lot of truth to that. Um, okay, I'm going to send you a link to this game, uh, Devotion. Please do. I would yeah, love like to, to hear your feet. It's only four hours, three hours. I would love to hear, as a designer, as a gamer, as a writer, uh, what you think. We'll do it. All right, thank you, sir. I very much appreciate it, and I will dude, hope to talk to you fun. soon. Yes, Absolutely. I think so too. All right. I'm, oh, and I'm going to send Thanks you a lot, link man. to the uh, the author, the young adult author. I'll send you yes, as well. Yes, I want to see that when you're when you get it up. Let me know. Okay, excellent. See ya. All right, it's been fun. All right, bye guys. Bye everybody. All right, fellas. Well, that is Johnny Garvin going off into the night on his motorcycle. Um, do you guys? Um, oh shit, John! If you're still watching, I will let him know. There's a guy who's been saying, Jaffe, tell John. Days Gone has much love in the Middle East. I will let them, I will let him know that absolutely. Uh, do we want to keep talking? Do you want to keep doing calls or are we done? If we want to keep doing calls, I need a Diet Coke. If we're done, we're done. I got no problem being done. We've been going for a while. Rob the Mod, you make the decision. I'm bringing Rob the Mod into the chat. Rob, do we keep talking and take calls or are we done for the day? I uh, think uh, we're done with the calls. <laughs> we're done. We are done. All right, Rob. I think, thank, I think we're finished with it. Thank this. you for modding, Rob. Thank you very much, buddy. I appreciate it. And no problem. Man. All right, fellas. Um, I will be back. Uh, I think we're doing some gameplay this weekend. Uh, there'll be some streams and videos and all that this weekend. Uh, if I don't talk to you then, I'll talk to you soon. Be safe. Have fun. Play some games. Blah 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 blah. See ya. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Robert. No problem. All right. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. <sighs> Now I just got to figure out how to hang screen it up. How do I hang screen it Screen calls was interesting. You're still on. You're still on. Wait, you're still on. Tell me about screen, screen calls. Go. That was fun. What <laughs> that was, uh, you know, you just, the same people come through. You know who, who you're kicking out already. So you, you, there were some. They rape. don't, they don't change their names. Oh, Jesus.
Jeez. Yeah, they they're not. I guess they're not smart enough trolls to change their name. So uh, I was able to just get them out pretty fast. Good for you. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate it. You know I do. It was, it was better. I mean, it's really hard um, to get. You know, that's why I always kind of put the calls at the end because you never really fucking know um, if the calls are going to be good or not. It depends on what they're asking. So. Um, yeah, but I appreciate you. Appreciate you doing that. All right, Rob, I'm, I'm fried. I'll talk to you soon, bud. I'm fried. Too. I'll catch you later. All right, man. Let me kill that. How do I hang up from that? Um, I know I'm still live. Hang on, fellas. Uh, how do I drop out of that room, though? Ah, there we go. Okay. That's it. We did it. I'm done. I'm going to bed.